This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Jakeway. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 52 Toxicology. It was really the Count of Monte Cristo who had just arrived at Madame de Villefort's for the purpose of returning the procurer's visit. And at his name, as may be easily imagined, the whole house was in confusion. Madame de Villefort, who was alone in her drawing-room when the Count was announced, desired that her son might be brought thither instantly to renew his thanks to the Count, and Edward, who heard this great personage talked of for two whole days, made all possible haste to come to him, not from obedience to his mother or out of any feeling of gratitude to the Count, but from sheer curiosity and that some chance remark might give him the opportunity for making one of the impertinent speeches which made his mother say, Oh, that naughty child, but I can't be severe with him, he is really so bright. After the usual civilities, the Count inquired after Monsieur de Villefort. My husband dines with a Chancellor, replied the young lady. He has just gone, and I am sure he'll be exceedingly sorry not to have had the pleasure of seeing you before he went. Two visitors who were there when the Count arrived, having gazed at him with all their eyes, retired after that reasonable delay which politeness admits and curiosity requires. "'What is your sister Valentine doing?' inquired Madame de Villefort of Edward. "'Tell someone to bid her come here, that I may have the honor of introducing her to the Count.' "'You have a daughter, then, Madame?' inquired the Count. "'Very young, I presume?' The daughter of Monsieur de Villefort by his first marriage, replied the young wife, a fine, well-grown girl. But melancholy, interrupted Master Edward, snatching the feathers out of the tail of a splendid parquet that was screaming on its gilded perch, in order to make a plume for his hat. Madame de Villefort merely cried, Be still, Edward. She then added, This young madcap is, however, very nearly right, and merely re-echoes what he has heard me say with pain a hundred times for Mademoiselle de Villefort is, in spite of all we can do to rouse her, of a melancholy disposition and taciturn habit, which frequently injure the effect of her beauty. But what detains her? Go, Edward, and see. Because they are looking for her where she is not to be found. And where are they looking for her? With Grandpapa Nortier. And do you think she is not there? No, 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 she is not there, replied Edward, singing his words. And where is she, then? If you know, why don't you tell? She is under the big chestnut tree, replied the spoiled brat, as he gave, in spite of his mother's commands, live flies to the parrot, which seemed keenly to relish such fare. Madame de Villefort stretched out her hand to ring, intending to direct her waiting-maid to the spot where she would find Valentine, when the young lady herself entered the apartment. She appeared much dejected, and any person who considered her attentively might have observed the traces of recent tears in her eyes. Valentine, whom we have in the rapid march of our narrative presented to our readers without formally introducing her, was a tall and graceful girl of nineteen, with bright chestnut hair, deep blue eyes, and that reposeful air of quiet distinction which characterized her mother. Her white and slender fingers, her pearly neck, her cheeks tinted with varying hues reminded one of the lovely English women who have been so poetically compared in their manner to the gracefulness of a swan. She entered the apartment, and seeing near her stepmother the stranger of whom she had already heard so much, saluted him without any girlish awkwardness, or even lowering her eyes, and with an elegance that redoubled the Count's attention. He rose to return the salutation. Mademoiselle de Villefort, my daughter-in-law, said Madame de Villefort to Monte Cristo, leaning back on her sofa and motioning toward Valentine with her hand. And Monsieur de Monte Cristo, King of China, Emperor of Cochin China, said the young imp, looking slyly towards his sister. Madame de Villefort at this really did turn pale, and was very nearly angry with this household plague who answered to the name of Edward. But the Count, on the contrary, smiled and appeared to look at the boy complacently, which caused the maternal heart to bound again with joy and enthusiasm. "'But, madame,' replied the Count, continuing the conversation and looking by turns at Madame de Villefort and Valentine, "'have I not already had the honor of meeting yourself and Mademoiselle before? I could not help thinking so just now. The idea came over my mind, 
and as Mademoiselle entered, the sight of her was an additional ray of light, thrown on a confused remembrance, excuse the remark. I do not think it likely, sir. Mademoiselle de Villefort is not very fond of society, and we very seldom go out, said the young lady. Then it was not in society that I met with Mademoiselle or yourself, madame, or this charming little merry boy. Besides, the Parisian world is entirely unknown to me, for, as I believe I told you, I have been in Paris but very few days. No, but perhaps you will permit me to call to mind. Stay. The Count placed his hand on his brow as if to collect his thoughts. No, it was somewhere away from here. It was... I do not know. But it appears that this recollection is connected with a lovely sky and some religious fate. Mademoiselle was holding flowers in her hand. The interesting boy was chasing a beautiful peacock in a garden. And you, madame, were under the trellis of some arbor. Pray come to my aid, madame. Do not these circumstances appeal to your memory? No, indeed, replied madame de Villefort. And yet it appears to me, sir, that if I had met you anywhere, the recollection of you must have been imprinted on my memory. Perhaps the Count saw us in Italy, said Valentine timidly. "'Yes, in Italy. It was in Italy, most probably,' replied Monte Cristo. "'You have travelled then in Italy, mademoiselle?' "'Yes, madame and I were there two years ago. "'The doctors, anxious for my lungs, had prescribed the air of Naples. "'We went by Bologna, Perugia, and Rome.' "'Ah, yes, true, mademoiselle,' exclaimed Monte Cristo, "'as if this simple explanation was sufficient to revive the recollection he sought.' It was at Perugia, on Corpus Christi Day, in the garden of the Hotel des Postes, when chance brought us together. You, Madame de Villefort, and her son, I now remember having had the honor of meeting you. I perfectly well remember Perugia, sir, and the Hotel des Postes, and the festival of which you speak, said Madame de Villefort. But in vain do I tax my memory, of whose treachery I am ashamed, for I really do not recall to mind that I ever had the pleasure of seeing you before. It is strange, but neither do I recollect meeting with you, observed Valentine, raising her beautiful eyes to the Count. But I remember it perfectly, interposed the darling Edward. I will assist your memory, madame, continued the Count. The day had been burning hot. You were waiting for horses which were delayed in consequence of the festival. Mademoiselle was walking in the shade of the garden, and your son disappeared in pursuit of the peacock. And I caught it, mamma, don't you remember? interposed Edward and I pulled three such beautiful feathers out of his tail. You, madame, remained under the arbor. Do you not remember that while you were seated on a stone bench, and while, as I told you, Mademoiselle de Villefort and your young son were absent, you conversed for a considerable time with somebody? Yes, in truth, yes, answered the young lady, turning very red. I do remember conversing with a person wrapped in a long woolen mantle. He was a medical man, I think. Precisely so, madame. This man was myself. For a fortnight I had been at that hotel, during which period I had cured my valet de chambre of a fever, and my landlord, the jaundice, so that I really acquired a reputation as a skillful physician. We discoursed a long time, madame, on the different subjects, of Perugino, of Raphael, of manners, customs, of the famous Aquatifana, of which they had told you, I think you said, that certain individuals in Perugia had preserved the secret. Yes, true, replied Madame de Villefort, somewhat uneasily. I remember now. I do not recollect now all the various subjects of which we discoursed, Madame, continued the Count with perfect calmness. But I perfectly remember that, falling into the error which others had entertained respecting me, you consulted me as to the health of Mademoiselle de Villefort. Yes, really, sir, you were in fact a medical man, said Madame de Villefort, since you had cured the sick. Moliere or Beaumarchais would reply to you, madame, that it was precisely because I was not that I had cured my patients. For myself, I am content to say to you that I have studied chemistry and the natural sciences somewhat deeply, but still only as an amateur, you understand. At this moment the clock struck six. It is six o'clock, said madame de Villefort, evidently agitated. Valentine, will you not go and see if your grandpapa will have his dinner? Valentine rose, and, saluting the Count, left the apartment without speaking. "'Oh, madame,' said the Count, when Valentine had left the room, "'was it on my account that you sent Mademoiselle de Villefort away?' "'By no means,' replied the young lady quickly. "'But this is the hour when we usually give Monsieur Nortier the unwelcome meal that sustains his pitiful existence. "'You are aware, sir, of the deplorable condition of my husband's father?' 
Yes, madame, Monsieur de Villefort spoke of it to me. A paralysis, I think. Alas, yes, the poor old gentleman is entirely helpless. The mind alone is still active in this human machine, and that is faint and flickering, like the light of a lamp about to expire. But excuse me, sir, for talking of our domestic misfortunes. I interrupted you at the moment when you were telling me that you were a skillful chemist. No, madame, I did not say as much as that, replied the count with a smile. Quite the contrary. I have studied chemistry because, having determined to live in eastern climates, I have been desirous of following the example of King Mithridates. Mithridates Rex Ponticus, said the young scamp as he tore some beautiful portraits out of a splendid album. The individual who took cream in his cup of poison every morning at breakfast. Edward, you naughty boy, exclaimed Madame de Villefort, snatching the mutilated book from the urchin's grasp. You are positively past bearing. You really disturb the conversation. Go, leave us, and join your sister Valentine in dear Grandpapa Nortier's room. The album, said Edward sulkily. What do you mean, the album? I want the album. How dare you tear out the drawings? Oh, it amuses me. Go, go at once. I won't go unless you give me the album, said the boy, seating himself doggedly in an armchair, according to his habit of never giving way. Take it, then, and pray disturb us no longer, said Madame de Villefort, giving the album to Edward, who then went towards the door, led by his mother. The Count followed her with his eyes. Let us see if she shuts the door after him, he muttered. Madame de Villefort closed the door carefully after the child, the Count appearing not to notice her. Then, casting a scrutinizing glance around the chamber, the young wife returned to her chair, in which she seated herself. "'Allow me to observe, madame,' said the Count, with that kind tone he could assume so well. "'You are really very severe with that dear, clever child.' "'Oh, sometimes severity is quite necessary,' replied madame de Villefort, with all a mother's real firmness. It was his Cornelius Nepos that Master Edward was repeating, when he referred to King Mithridates, continued the Count, and you interrupted him in a quotation which proves that his tutor has by no means neglected him, for your son is really advanced for his years. The fact is, Count, answered the mother, agreeably flattered, he has great aptitude and learns all that is set before him. He has but one fault, he is somewhat willful. But really, on referring for the moment to what he said, do you truly believe that Mithridates used these precautions, and that these precautions were efficacious? I think so, madame, because I myself have made use of them, that I might not be poisoned at Naples, at Palermo, and at Smyrna, that is to say, on three several occasions when, but for these precautions, I must have lost my life. And your precautions were successful? Completely so. Yes, I remember now you're mentioning to me at Perugia something of this sort. Indeed, said the Count, with an air of surprise, remarkably well counterfeited, I really did not remember. I inquired of you if poisons acted equally and with the same effect on men of the North as on men of the South, and you answered me that the cold and sluggish habits of the North did not present the same aptitude as the rich and energetic temperaments of the natives of the South. And that is the case, observed Monte Cristo. I have seen Russians devour, without being visibly inconvenienced, vegetable substances which would infallibly have killed a Neapolitan or an Arab. And you really believe the result would be still more sure with us than in the East? And in the midst of our fogs and rains a man would habituate himself more easily than in a warm latitude to this progressive absorption of poison? Certainly, it being at the same time perfectly understood that he should have been duly fortified against the poison to which he had not been accustomed. Yes, I understand that, and how would you habituate yourself, for instance, or rather, how did you habituate yourself to it? Oh, very easily. Suppose you knew beforehand the poison that would be made use of against you. Suppose the poison was, for instance, brucine. Brucine is extracted from the false agnostura, is it not? inquired Madame de Villefort. Precisely, Madame, replied Monte Cristo. But I perceive I have not much to teach you. Allow me to compliment you on your knowledge. Such learning is very rare among ladies. Oh, I am aware of that, said Madame de Villefort, but I have a passion for the occult sciences, which speak to the imagination like poetry, and are reducible to figures like an algebraic equation. But go on, I beg of you. What you say interests me to the greatest degree. Well, replied Monte Cristo, suppose, then, that this poison was brucine, and you were to take a milligram the first day, two milligrams the second day, and so on. Well, at the end of ten days you would have taken a centigram. 
At the end of 20 days, increasing another milligram, you would have taken 300 centigrams. That is to say, a dose which you would support without inconvenience, and which would be very dangerous for any other person who had not taken the same precautions as yourself. Well then, at the end of a month, when drinking water from the same carafe, you would kill the person who drank with you, without your perceiving, otherwise than from slight inconvenience, that there was any poisonous substance mingled with this water. Do you know any other counterpoisons? I do not. I have often read and read again the history of Mithridates, said Madame de Villefort in a tone of reflection, and had always considered it a fable. No, madame, contrary to most history, it is true. But what you tell me, madame, what you inquire of me, is not the result of a chance query. For two years ago you asked me the same questions, and said then that for a very long time this history of Mithridates had occupied your mind. True, sir, the two favorite studies of my youth were botany and mineralogy, and subsequently, when I learned that the use of simples frequently explained the whole history of a people, and the entire life of individuals in the East, as flowers betoken and symbolize a love affair, I have regretted that I was not a man, that I might have been a flamel, a fontana, or a cabanas. And the more, madame, said Monte Cristo, as the Orientals do not confine themselves, as did Mithridates, to make a cuirass of his poisons, but they also made them a dagger. Science becomes in their hands not only a defensive weapon, but still more frequently an offensive one. The one serves against all their physical sufferings, the other against all their enemies. With opium, belladonna, brucea, snakewood, and the cherry laurel, they put to sleep all who stand in their way. There is not one of these women, Egyptian, Turkish, or Greek, whom here you call good women, who do not know how, by means of chemistry, to stupefy a doctor, and in psychology to amaze a confessor. Really, said Madame de Villefort, whose eyes sparkled with strange fire at this conversation. Oh, yes, indeed, Madame, continued Monte Cristo. The secret dramas of the East begin with a love filter and end with a death potion. Begin with paradise and end with hell. There are as many elixirs of every kind as there are caprices and peculiarities in the physical and moral nature of humanity. And I will say further, the art of these chemists is capable with the utmost precision to accommodate and proportion the remedy and the bane to yearnings for love or desires for vengeance. But, sir, remarked the young woman, these eastern societies, in the midst of which you have passed a portion of your existence, are as fantastic as the tales that come from their strange land. A man can easily be put out of the way there, then. It is indeed the Baghdad and Bassora of the Thousand and One Nights. The sultans and viziers who rule over society there, and who constitute what in France we call the government, are really Harun al-Rashid's and Jafar's, who not only pardon a prisoner, but even make him a prime minister if his crime has been an ingenious one, and who, under such circumstances, have the whole story written in letters of gold, to divert their hours of idleness and ennui. By no means, madame. The fanciful exists no longer in the East. There, disguised under other names, and concealed under other costumes, are police agents, magistrates, attorneys general, and bailiffs. They hang, behead, and impale their criminals in the most agreeable possible manner. But some of these, like clever rogues, have contrived to escape human justice, and succeed in their fraudulent enterprises by cunning stratagems. Amongst us a simpleton, possessed by the demon of hate or cupidity, who has an enemy to destroy or some near relation to dispose of, goes straight to the grocers or druggists, gives a false name which leads more easily to his detection than his real one, and under the pretext that the rats prevent him from sleeping, purchases five or six grams of arsenic. If he is really a cunning fellow, he goes to five or six different druggists or grocers, and thereby becomes only five or six times more easily traced. Then, when he has acquired his specific, he administers duly to his enemy, or near kinsman, a dose of arsenic which would make a mammoth or mastodon burst, and which, without rhyme or reason, makes his victim utter groans which alarm the entire neighborhood. Then arrive a crowd of policemen and constables. They fetch a doctor who opens the dead body, and collects from the entrails and stomach a quantity of arsenic in a spoon. Next day a hundred newspapers relate the fact with the names of the victim and the murderer. The same evening the grocer or grocers, druggist or druggists, come and say, It was I who sold the arsenic to the gentleman, and rather than not recognize the guilty purchaser, they will recognize twenty. 
Then the foolish criminal is taken, imprisoned, interrogated, confronted, confounded, condemned, and cut off by hemp or steel. Or if she be a woman of any consideration, they lock her up for life. This is the way in which you northerns understand chemistry, madam. Desruz was, however, I must confess, more skillful. What would you have, sir, said the lady, laughing? We do what we can. All the world has not the secret of the Medicis or the Borgias. Now, replied the Count, shrugging his shoulders, shall I tell you the cause of all these stupidities? It is because, at your theatres, by what at least I could judge by reading the pieces they play, they see persons swallow the contents of a phial, or suck the bottom of a ring, and fall dead instantly. Five minutes afterwards the curtain falls and the spectators depart. They are ignorant of the consequences of the murder. They see neither the police commissary with his badge of office, nor the corporal with his four men and so the poor fools believe that the whole thing is as easy as lying. But go a little way from France, go either to Aleppo or Cairo, or only to Naples or Rome, and you will see people passing by you in the streets, people erect, smiling, and fresh-colored, of whom Asmodeus, if you were holding on by the skirt of his mantle, would say, That man was poisoned three weeks ago. He will be a dead man in a month. Then, remarked Madame de Villefort, they have again discovered the secret of the famous Aquatifana that they said was lost at Perugia. Ah, but Madame, does mankind ever lose anything? The arts change about and make a tour of the world. Things take a different name and the vulgar do not follow them, that is all. But there is always the same result. Poisons act particularly on some organ or another, one on the stomach, another on the brain, another on the intestines. Well, the poison brings on a cough, the cough an inflammation of the lungs, or some other complaint catalogued in the book of science, which, however, by no means precludes it from being decidedly mortal, and if it were not, would be sure to become so, thanks to the remedies applied by foolish doctors, who are generally bad chemists, and which will act in favor of or against the malady as you please. And then there is a human being killed according to all the rules of art and skill, and of whom justice learns nothing as was said by a terrible chemist of my acquaintance, the worthy Abbe Adelmont of Taormina in Sicily, who has studied these national phenomena very profoundly. It is quite frightful, but deeply interesting, said the young lady, motionless with attention. I thought I must confess that these tales were inventions of the Middle Ages. Yes, no doubt, but improved upon by ours. What is the use of time, rewards of merit, medals, crosses, Monthian prizes, if they do not lead society towards more complete perfection? Yet man will never be perfect until he learns to create and destroy. He does know how to destroy, and that is half the battle. So, added Madame de Villefort, constantly returning to her object, the poisons of the Borgias, the Medicis, the Rennes, the Rougieres, and later probably that of Baron de Tranc, whose story has been so misused by modern drama and romance, were objects of art, madame, and nothing more, replied the Count. Do you suppose that the real savant addresses himself stupidly to the mere individual? By no means. Science loves eccentricities, leaps and bounds, trials of strength, fancies, if I may be allowed so to term them. Thus, for instance, the excellent Abbe Adelmont, of whom I spoke just now, made in this way some marvelous experiments. Really? Yes, I will mention one to you. He had a remarkably fine garden, full of vegetables, flowers, and fruit. From amongst these vegetables he selected the most simple, a cabbage, for instance. For three days he watered this cabbage with a distillation of arsenic. On the third the cabbage began to droop and turn yellow. At that moment he cut it. In the eyes of everybody it seemed fit for table and preserved its wholesome appearance. It was only poison to the Abbey Adelmont. He then took the cabbage to a room where he had rabbits, for the Abbey Adelmont had a collection of rabbits, cats, and guinea pigs, fully as fine as his collection of vegetables, flowers, and fruit. Well, the Abbey Adelmont took a rabbit and made it eat a leaf of the cabbage. The rabbit died. What magistrate would find or even venture to insinuate anything against this? What procurer has ever ventured to draw up an accusation against Monsieur Magindy or Monsieur Florin? in consequence of the rabbits, cats, and guinea pigs they have killed. Not one. So then, the rabbit dies, and justice takes no notice. This rabbit dead, the Abbey Adelmont has its entrails taken out by his cook and thrown on the dunghill. 
On this dunghill is a hen who, pecking these intestines, is in her turn taken ill and dies next day. At the moment when she is struggling in the convulsions of death, a vulture is flying by. There are a good many vultures in Adamant's country. This bird darts on the dead fowl and carries it away to a rock, where it dines off its prey. Three days afterwards, this poor vulture, which has been very much indisposed since that dinner, suddenly feels very giddy while flying aloft in the clouds and falls heavily into a fish pond. The pikes, eels, and carp eat greedily always, as everybody knows. Well, they feast on the vulture. Now suppose that next day one of these eels or pike or carp, poisoned at the fourth remove, is served up at your table. Well, then, your guest will be poisoned at the fifth remove, and die at the end of eight or ten days of pains in the intestines, sickness, or abscess of the pylorus. The doctors open the body and say with an air of profound learning, the subject has died of a tumor on the liver, or of typhoid fever. But, remarked Madame de Villefort, all these circumstances which you link thus to one another may be broken by the least accident. The vulture may not see the fowl, or may fall a hundred yards from the fish pond. Ah, that is where the art comes in. To be a great chemist in the East, one must direct chance. And this is to be achieved. Madame de Villefort was in deep thought, yet listened attentively. But, she exclaimed suddenly, arsenic is indelible, indestructible. In whatsoever way it is absorbed, it will be found again in the body of the victim, from the moment when it has been taken in sufficient quantity to cause death. Precisely so, cried Monte Cristo, precisely so. And this is what I said to my worthy Adelmont. He reflected, smiled, and replied to me by a Sicilian proverb, which I believe is also a French proverb. My son, the world was not made in a day, but in seven. Return on Sunday. On the Sunday following I did return to him. Instead of having watered his cabbage with arsenic, he had watered it this time with a solution of salts, having their basis in strychnine, strychnos colubrina, as the learned term it. Now the cabbage had not the slightest appearance of disease in the world, and the rabbit had not the smallest distrust, yet five minutes afterwards the rabbit was dead. The fowl pecked at the rabbit, and the next day was a dead hen. This time we were the vultures, so we opened the bird, and this time all special symptoms had disappeared. There were only general symptoms. There was no peculiar indication in any organ, an excitement of the nervous system, that was it. A case of cerebral congestion, nothing more. The fowl had not been poisoned. She had died of apoplexy. Apoplexy is a rare disease among fowls, I believe, but very common among men. Madame de Villefort appeared more and more thoughtful. It is very fortunate, she observed, that such substances could only be prepared by chemists. Otherwise, all the world would be poisoning each other. By chemists and persons who have a taste for chemistry, said Monte Cristo carelessly. And then, said Madame de Villefort, endeavoring by a struggle and with effort to get away from her thoughts, however skillfully it is prepared, crime is always crime, and if it avoid human scrutiny, it does not escape the eye of God. The Orientals are stronger than we are in cases of conscience, and very prudently have no hell. That is the point. Really, Madame, this is a scruple which naturally must occur to a pure mind like yours, but which would easily yield before sound reasoning. The bad side of human thought will always be defined by the paradox of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You remember, the Mandarin who is killed five hundred leagues off by raising the tip of the finger? Man's whole life passes in doing these things, and his intellect is exhausted by reflecting on them. You will find very few persons who will go and brutally thrust a knife in the heart of a fellow creature, or will administer to him in order to remove him from the surface of the globe on which we move with life and animation that quantity of arsenic of which we just now talked. Such a thing is really out of rule, eccentric or stupid. To attain such a point, the blood must be heated to 36 degrees, the pulse be at least at 90, and the feelings excited beyond the ordinary limit. But suppose one pass, as is permissible in philology, from the word itself to its softened synonym. Then, instead of committing an ignoble assassination, you make an elimination. You merely and simply remove from your path the individual who is in your way, and that without shock or violence, without the display of sufferings which, in the case of becoming a punishment, make a martyr of the victim and a butcher, in every sense of the word, of him who inflicts them. Then there will be no blood, no groans, no convulsions, and above all, no consciousness of that horrid and compromising moment of accomplishing the act. 
Then one escapes the clutch of the human law, which says, do not disturb society. This is the mode in which they manage these things, and succeed in eastern climes, where there are grave and phlegmatic persons who care very little for the questions of time and conjunctures of importance. Yet conscience remains, remarked Madame de Villefort in an agitated voice, and with a stifled sigh. Yes, entered Monte Cristo, happily, yes, conscience does remain, and if it did not, how wretched we should be. After every action requiring exertion, it is conscience that saves us, for it supplies us with a thousand good excuses, of which we alone are judges, and these reasons, howsoever excellent in producing sleep, would avail us but very little before a tribunal, when we were tried for our lives. Thus Richard the Third, for instance, was marvelously served by his conscience after the putting away of the two children of Edward the Fourth. In fact, he could say, these two children of a cruel and persecuting king, who have inherited the vices of their father, which I alone could perceive in their juvenile propensities, these two children are impediments in my way of promoting the happiness of the English people, whose unhappiness they, the children, would infallibly have caused. Thus was Lady Macbeth served by her conscience, when she sought to give her son, and not her husband, whatever Shakespeare may say, a throne. Ah, maternal love is a great virtue, a powerful motive, so powerful that it excuses a multitude of things, even if, after Duncan's death, Lady Macbeth had been at all pricked by her conscience. Madame de Villefort listened with avidity to these appalling maxims and horrible paradoxes, delivered by the Count with that ironical simplicity which was peculiar to him. After a moment's silence, the lady inquired, Do you know, my dear Count, she said, that you are a very terrible reasoner? and that you look at the world through a somewhat distempered medium? Have you really measured the world by scrutinies, or through alembics and crucibles? For you must indeed be a great chemist, and the elixir you administered to my son, which recalled him to life almost instantaneously. Oh, do not place any reliance on that, madame. One drop of that elixir sufficed to recall life to a dying child, but three drops would have impelled the blood into his lungs in such a way as to have produced most violent palpitations. Six would have suspended his respiration, and caused syncope more serious than that in which he was. Ten would have destroyed him. You know, madame, how suddenly I snatched him from those vials at which he so imprudently touched. Is it then so terrible a poison? Oh, no. In the first place, let us agree that the word poison does not exist, because in medicine use is made of the most violent poisons which become, according as they are employed, most salutary remedies. What then is it? A skillful preparation of my friends, the worthy Abbe Adelmont, who taught me the use of it. Oh, observed Madame de Villefort, it must be an admirable antispasmodic. Perfect, Madame, as you have seen, replied the Count, and I frequently make use of it, with all possible prudence, though, be it observed, he added with a smile of intelligence. Most assuredly, responded Madame de Villefort, in the same tone. As for me, so nervous and so subject to fainting fits, I should require a Dr. Adelmont to invent for me some means of breathing freely and tranquilizing my mind, in the fear I have of dying some fine day of suffocation. In the meanwhile, as the thing is difficult to find in France, and your abbey is not probably disposed to make a journey to Paris on my account, I must continue to use Monsieur Planche's antispasmodics, and mint and Hoffman's drops are among my favorite remedies. Here are some lozenges which I have made up on purpose. They are compounded doubly strong. Monte Cristo opened the tortoise-shell box which the lady presented to him, and inhaled the odor of the lozenges with the air of an amateur who thoroughly appreciated their composition. They are indeed exquisite, he said, but as they are necessarily submitted to the process of deglutition, a function which it is frequently impossible for a fainting person to accomplish, I prefer my own specific. Undoubtedly, and so should I prefer it after the effects I have seen produced, but of course it is a secret, and I am not so indiscreet as to ask it of you. But I, said Monte Cristo, rising as he spoke, I am gallant enough to offer it to you. How kind you are! Only remember one thing. A small dose is a remedy, a large one is poison. One drop will restore life, as you have seen. Five or six will inevitably kill, and in a way the more terrible inasmuch as, poured into a glass of wine, 
it would not in the slightest degree affect its flavor. But I say no more, madame. It is really as if I were prescribing for you. The clock struck half-past six, and a lady was announced, a friend of Madame de Villefort, who came to dine with her. If I had had the honor of seeing you for the third or fourth time, Count, instead of only for the second, said Madame de Villefort, if I had had the honor of being your friend, instead of only having the happiness of being under an obligation to you, I should insist on detaining you to dinner, and not allow myself to be daunted by a first refusal. A thousand thanks, Madame, replied Monte Cristo but I have an engagement which I cannot break. I have promised to escort to the Academy a Greek princess of my acquaintance, who has never seen your grand opera, and who relies on me to conduct her thither. Adieu, then, sir, and do not forget the prescription. Ah, in truth, madame, to do that I must forget the hour's conversation I have had with you, which is indeed impossible. Monte Cristo bowed and left the house. Madame de Villefort remained immersed in thought, he is a very strange man, she said, and in my opinion is himself the Adelmont he talks about. As to Monte Cristo, the result had surpassed his utmost expectations. Good, said he, as he went away, this is a fruitful soil, and I feel certain that the seed sown will not be cast on barren ground. Next morning, faithful to his promise, he sent the prescription requested. End of chapter 52 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 53 Robert Le Diable. The pretext of an opera engagement was so much the more feasible, as there chanced to be on that very night a more than ordinary attraction at the Académie Royale. Levasseur, who had been suffering under severe illness, made his reappearance in the character of Bertrand, and, as usual, the announcement of the most admired production of the favorite composer of the day had attracted a brilliant and fashionable audience. Morcerf, like most other young men of rank and fortune, had his orchestra stall, with the certainty of always finding a seat in at least a dozen of the principal boxes occupied by persons of his acquaintance. He had, moreover, his right of entry into the omnibus box. Chateau Renaud rented a stall beside his own, while Beauchamp, as a journalist, had unlimited range all over the theatre. It happened that on this particular night the minister's box was placed at the disposal of Lucien de Bray who offered it to the Comte de Morcerf, who again, upon his mother's rejection of it, sent it to Danglars, with an intimation that he should probably do himself the honour of joining the Baroness and her daughter during the evening, in the event of their accepting the box in question. The ladies received the offer with too much pleasure to dream of a refusal. To no class of persons is the presentation of a gratuitous opera-box more acceptable than to the wealthy millionaire, who still hugs economy while boasting of carrying a king's ransom in his waistcoat pocket. Danglars had, however, protested against showing himself in a ministerial box, declaring that his political principles and his parliamentary position as a member of the opposition party would not permit him so to commit himself. The baroness had, therefore, dispatched a note to Lucien de Bray, bidding him call for them, it being wholly impossible for her to go alone with Eugénie to the opera. There is no gainsaying the fact that a very unfavourable construction would have been put upon the circumstance if the two women had gone without escort, while the addition of a third, in the person of her mother's admitted lover, enabled Mademoiselle Danglars to defy malice and ill-nature. One must take the world as one finds it. The curtain rose, as usual, to an almost empty house, it being one of the absurdities of Parisian fashion never to appear at the opera until after the beginning of the performance, so that the first act is generally played without the slightest attention being paid to it, that part of the audience already assembled being too much occupied in observing the fresh arrivals, while nothing is heard but the noise of opening and shutting doors, and the buzz of conversation. Surely, said Albert, as the door of a box on the first circle opened, that must be the Comtesse G. And who is the Countess G? inquired Chateau Renaud. What a question! Now do you know, Baron, I have a great mind to pick a quarrel with you for asking it, as if all the world did not know who the Countess G was. 
"'Ah, to be sure,' replied Chateau Renaud. "'The lovely Venetian, is it not?' "'Herself.' At this moment the Countess perceived Albert, and received his salutation with a smile. "'You know her, it seems?' said Chateau Renaud. "'France introduced me to her at Rome,' replied Albert. "'Well, then, will you do as much for me in Paris as France did for you in Rome?' "'With pleasure.' There was a cry of, "'Shut up!' from the audience. This manifestation on the part of the spectators of their wish to be allowed to hear the music produced not the slightest effect on the young men, who continued their conversation. "'The Countess was present at the races in the Champ de Mars,' said Chateau Renaud. "'Today?' "'Yes. Bless me, I quite forgot the races. Did you bet?' "'Oh, merely a paltry fifty louis.' "'And who was the winner?' "'Nautilus. I staked on him.' "'But there were three races, were there not?' "'Yes, there was the prize given by the Jockey Club, a gold cup, you know, and a very singular circumstance occurred about that race.' "'What was it?' "'Oh, shut up!' again interposed some of the audience. "'Why, it was won by a horse and rider utterly unknown on the course. Is that possible?' "'True as day. The fact was, nobody had observed a horse entered by the name of Vampa, or that of a jockey styled Job, when at the last moment a splendid roan, mounted by a jockey about as big as your fist, presented themselves at the starting-post. They were obliged to stuff at least twenty pounds weight of shot in the small rider's pockets to make him wait, but with all that he outstripped Ariel and Barber, against whom he ran, by at least three whole lengths. And was it not found out at last to whom the horse and jockey belonged? No. You say that the horse was entered under the name of Vampa. Exactly. That was the title. Then, answered Albert, I am better informed than you are, and know who the owner of that horse was. Shut up! cried the pit in chorus. And this time the tone and manner in which the command was given betokened such growing hostility that the two young men perceived, for the first time, that the mandate was addressed to them. Leisurely turning around, they calmly scrutinized the various countenances around them, as though demanding some one person who would take upon himself the responsibility of what they deemed excessive impertinence. But as no one responded to the challenge, the friends turned again to the front of the theatre, and affected to busy themselves with the stage. At this moment the door of the minister's box opened, and Madame Danglars, accompanied by her daughter, entered, escorted by Lucien de Bray, who assiduously conducted them to their seats. "'Ha! ha!' said Chateau Renaud. "'Here come some friends of yours, Viscount. Oh, what are you looking at there? Don't you see they are trying to catch your eye?' Albert turned round, just in time to receive a gracious wave of the fan from the baroness. As for Mademoiselle Eugénie, she scarcely vouchsafed to waste the glances of her large black eyes even upon the business of the stage. "'I tell you what, my dear fellow,' said Chateau Renaud, "'I cannot imagine what objection you can possibly have to Mademoiselle Danglars, that is, setting aside her want of ancestry and somewhat inferior rank, which, by the way, I don't think you care very much about.' Barring all that, now, I mean to say, she is a deuced fine girl. Handsome, certainly, replied Albert, but not to my taste, which I confess inclines to something softer, gentler, and more feminine. Ah, well, exclaimed Chateau Renaud, who, because he had seen his thirtieth summer, fancied himself duly warranted in assuming a sort of paternal air with his more youthful friend. You young people are never satisfied. Why, what would you have more? Your parents have chosen you a bride built on the model of Diana the Huntress, and yet you are not content. No, for that very resemblance affrights me. I should have liked something more in the manner of the Venus of Milo or Capua, but this chase-loving Diana, continually surrounded by her nymphs, gives me a sort of alarm, lest she should some day bring on me the fate of Actaeon. And, indeed, it required but one glance at Mademoiselle Danglars to comprehend the justness of Morcerf's remark. She was beautiful, but her beauty was of too marked and decided a character to please a fastidious taste. Her hair was raven black, but its natural waves seemed somewhat rebellious. Her eyes, of the same color as her hair, were surmounted by well-arched brows, whose great defect, however, consisted in an almost habitual frown, while her whole physiognomy wore that expression of firmness and decision so little in accordance with the gentler attributes of her sex 
her nose was precisely what a sculptor would have chosen for a chiselled Juno. Her mouth, which might have been found fault with as too large, displayed teeth of pearly whiteness, rendered still more conspicuous by the brilliant carmine of her lips, contrasting vividly with her naturally pale complexion. But that which completed the almost masculine look Morcer found so little to his taste was a dark mole, of much larger dimensions than those freaks of nature generally are, placed just at the corner of her mouth, and the effect tended to increase the expression of self-dependence that characterized her countenance. The rest of Mademoiselle Eugenie's person was in perfect keeping with the head just described. She indeed reminded one of Diana, as Chateau Renaud observed, but her bearing was more haughty and resolute. As regarded her attainments, the only fault to be found with them was the same that a fastidious connoisseur might have found with her beauty, that they were somewhat too erudite and masculine for so young a person. She was a perfect linguist, a first-rate artist, wrote poetry, and composed music. To the study of the latter she professed to be entirely devoted, following it with an indefatigable perseverance, assisted by a schoolfellow, a young woman without fortune whose talent promised to develop into remarkable powers as a singer. It was rumoured that she was an object of almost paternal interest to one of the principal composers of the day, who excited her to spare no pains in the cultivation of her voice, which might hereafter prove a source of wealth and independence. But this counsel effectually decided Mademoiselle Danglars never to commit herself by being seen in public with one destined for a theatrical life. And acting upon this principle, the banker's daughter, though perfectly willing to allow Mademoiselle Louise Tarmely, that was the name of the young virtuosa, to practice with her through the day, took especial care not to be seen in her company. Still, though not actually received at the Hôtel d'Anglars in the light of an acknowledged friend, Louise was treated with far more kindness and consideration than is usually bestowed on a governess. The curtain fell almost immediately after the entrance of Madame Danglars into her box. The band quitted the orchestra for the accustomed half-hour's interval allowed between acts, and the audience were left at liberty to promenade the salon or the lobbies, or to pay and receive visits in their respective boxes. Morcerf and Chateau Renaud were among the first to avail themselves of this permission. For an instant the idea struck Madame Danglars that this eagerness on the part of the young Viscount arose from his impatience to join her party, and she whispered her expectations to her daughter, that Albert was hurrying to pay his respects to them. Mademoiselle Eugénie, however, merely returned a dissenting movement of the head, while with a cold smile she directed the attention of her mother to an opposite box on the first circle, in which sat the Countess G., and where Morcerf had just made his appearance. "'So we meet again, my travelling friend, do we?' cried the Countess, extending her hand to him with all the warmth and cordiality of old acquaintance. "'It was really very good of you to recognize me so quickly, and still more to bestow your first visit on me.' "'Be assured,' replied Albert, "'that if I had been aware of your arrival in Paris, and had known your address, I should have paid my respects to you before this. Allow me to introduce my friend, Baron de Chateau-Renaud, one of the few true gentlemen now to be found in France, and from whom I have just learned that you were a spectator of the races in the Champ de Mars yesterday.' Chateau-Renaud bowed to the Countess. "'So you were at the races, Baron?' inquired the Countess eagerly. "'Yes, madame.' "'Well, then,' pursued Madame G., with considerable animation, "'you can probably tell me who won the Jockey Club stakes.' "'I am sorry to say I cannot,' replied the Baroness, "'and I was just asking the same question of Albert.' "'Are you very anxious to know, Countess?' asked Albert. "'To know what?' "'The name of the owner of the winning horse.' "'Oh, excessively! Only imagine! But do tell me, Viscount, whether you really are acquainted with it or no.' I beg your pardon, madame, but you were about to relate some story, were you not? You said, only imagine, and then paused. Pray continue. Well, then, listen. You must know I felt so interested in that splendid roan horse, with his elegant little rider, so tastefully dressed in a pink satin jacket and cap, that I could not help praying for their success, with as much earnestness as though the half of my fortune were at stake and when I saw them outstrip all the others, and come to the winning post in such gallant style, I actually clapped my hands with joy. Imagine my surprise, when, upon returning home, the first object I met on the staircase was the identical jockey in the pink jacket. I concluded that, by some singular chance, the owner of the winning horse must live in the same hotel as myself. 
but as I entered my apartments, I beheld the very gold cup awarded as a prize to the unknown horse and rider. Inside the cup was a small piece of paper, on which were written these words, From Lord Ruthven to Countess G. Precisely. I was sure of it, said Morcerf. Sure of what? That the owner of the horse was Lord Ruthven himself. What Lord Ruthven do you mean? Why, our Lord Ruthven, the vampire of the Sal Argentino. Is it possible, exclaimed the Countess, is he here in Paris? To be sure, why not? And you visit him, meet him at your own house and elsewhere? I assure you, he is my most intimate friend, and Monsieur de Chateau Renaud has also the honour of his acquaintance. But why are you so sure of his being the winner of the Jockey Club prize? Was not the winning horse entered by the name of Vampa? What of that? Why, do you not recollect the name of the celebrated bandit by whom I was made prisoner? Oh, yes! And from whose hands the Count extricated me in so wonderful a manner? Oh, to be sure! I remember it all now. He called himself Vampa. You see, it's evident where the Count got the name. But what could have been his motive for sending the cup to me? In the first place, because I had spoken much of you to him, as you may believe, and in the second, because he delighted to see a countrywoman take so lively an interest in his success. I trust and hope you never repeated to the Count all the foolish remarks we used to make about him. I should not like to affirm under oath that I have not. Besides, his presenting you the cup under the name of Lord Ruthven. Oh, but that is dreadful! Why, the man must owe me a fearful grudge. Does his action appear like that of an enemy? No, certainly not. Well, then. And so he is in Paris? Yes. And what effect does he produce? Why, said Albert, he was talked about for a week, then the coronation of the Queen of England took place, followed by the theft of Mademoiselle Mars's diamonds, and so people talked of something else. My good fellow, said Chateau Renaud, the Count is your friend, and you treat him accordingly. Do not believe what Albert is telling you, Countess. So far from the sensation excited in Parisian circles by the appearance of the Count of Monte Cristo having abated, I take it upon myself to declare that it is as strong as ever. His first astounding act upon coming amongst us was to present a pair of horses worth thirty-two thousand francs to Madame Danglars. His second, the almost miraculous preservation of Madame de Villefort's life. Now it seems that he has carried off the prize awarded by the Jockey Club. I therefore maintain, in spite of Morcerf, that not only is the Count the object of interest at this present moment, but also that he will continue to be so for a month longer if he pleases to exhibit an eccentricity of conduct, which, after all, may be his ordinary mode of existence. "'Perhaps you are right,' said Morcerf. "'Meanwhile, who is in the Russian ambassador's box?' "'Which box do you mean?' asked the Countess. "'The one between the pillars on the first tier. "'It seems to have been fitted up entirely afresh.' "'Did you observe any one during the first act?' asked Chateau Renaud. "'Where?' "'In that box.' "'No,' replied the Countess. "'It was certainly empty during the first act.' "'Then, resuming the subject of their previous conversation, she said, "'And so you really believe that it was your mysterious Count of Monte Cristo that gained the prize?' I'm sure of it. And who afterwards sent the cup to me? Undoubtedly. But I don't know him, said the Countess. I have a great mind to return it. Oh, do no such thing, I beg of you. He would only send you another, formed of a magnificent sapphire, or hollowed out of a gigantic ruby. It is his way, and you must take him as you find him. At this moment the bell rang to announce the drawing up of the curtain for the second act. Albert rose to return to his place. "'Shall I see you again?' asked the Countess. "'At the end of the next act, with your permission, "'I will come and inquire whether there is anything I can do for you in Paris.' "'Pray take notice,' said the Countess, "'that my present residence is twenty-two Rue de Rivoli, "'and I am now at home to friends every Saturday evening. "'So now you are both forewarned.' "'The young men bowed, and quitted the box. "'Upon reaching their stalls they found the whole of the audience in the parterre standing up, and directing their gaze toward the box formerly possessed by the Russian ambassador. A man of thirty-five to forty years of age, dressed in deep black, had just entered, 
accompanied by a young woman dressed after the Eastern style. The lady was surpassingly beautiful, while the rich magnificence of her attire drew all eyes upon her. Hello, said Albert. It is Monte Cristo and his Greek. The strangers were indeed no other than the Count and Heidi. In a few moments the young girl had attracted the attention of the whole house, and even the occupants of the boxes leaned forward to scrutinize her magnificent diamonds. The second act passed away during one continued buzz of voices, one deep whisper intimating that some great and universally interesting event had occurred. All eyes, all thoughts, were occupied with the young and beautiful woman, whose gorgeous apparel and splendid jewels made a most extraordinary spectacle. Upon this occasion an unmistakable sign from Madame Danglars intimated her desire to see Albert in her box directly the curtain fell on the second act, and neither the politeness nor good taste of Morcerf would permit his neglecting an invitation so unequivocally given. At the close of the act he therefore went to the baroness. Having bowed to the two ladies, he extended his hand to Debray. By the baroness he was most graciously welcomed, while Eugénie received him with her accustomed coldness. "'My dear fellow,' said Debray, "'you've come in the nick of time. There is Madame overwhelming me with questions respecting the Count. She insists upon it that I can tell her his birth, education, and parentage, where he came from, and whither he is going.' Being no disciple of Cagliostro, I was wholly unable to do this. So by way of getting out of the scrape, I said, "'Ask Morcerf. He has got the whole history of his beloved Monte Cristo at his fingers' ends,' whereupon the baroness signified her desire to see you. "'Is it not almost incredible,' said Madame Danglars, "'that a person having at least half a million of secret service money at his command should possess so little information?' "'Let me assure you, madame,' said Lucien, that had I really the sum you mentioned at my disposal, I would employ it more profitably than in troubling myself to obtain particulars respecting the Count of Monte Cristo, whose only merit in my eyes consists in his being twice as rich as a nabob. However, I have turned the business over to Morcerf, so pray settle it with him, as may be most agreeable to you. For my own part I care nothing about the Count or his mysterious doings." I am very sure no nabob would have sent me a pair of horses worth thirty-two thousand francs, wearing on their heads four diamonds, valued at five thousand francs each. He seems to have a mania for diamonds, said Morcerf, smiling, and I verily believe that, like Potemkin, he keeps his pockets filled, for the sake of strewing them along the roads, as Tom Thumb did his flint stones. Perhaps he has discovered some mine, said Madame Danglars. I suppose you know he has an order for unlimited credit on the baron's banking establishment. I was not aware of it, replied Albert, but I can readily believe it. And further, that he stated to Monsieur Danglars his intention of only staying a year in Paris, during which time he proposed to spend six millions. He must be the Shah of Persia, travelling incog. Have you noticed the remarkable beauty of the young woman, Monsieur Lucien? inquired Eugénie. I never really met with one woman so ready to do justice to the charms of another as yourself," responded Lucien, raising his lorgnette to his eye. A most lovely creature upon my soul, was his verdict. Who is this young person, Monsieur de Morcerf? inquired Eugénie. Does anybody know? Mademoiselle, said Albert, replying to this direct appeal, I can give you very exact information on that subject, as well as on most points relative to that mysterious person of whom we are now conversing. The young woman is a Greek. So I should suppose by her dress. If you know no more than that, every one here is as well informed as yourself. I am extremely sorry you find me so ignorant a Cicerone, replied Morcerf, but I am reluctantly obliged to confess I have nothing further to communicate. Yes, stay, I do know one thing more, namely that she is a musician, for one day, when I chanced to be breakfasting with the Count, I heard the sound of a guzla. It is impossible that it could have been touched by any other finger than her own. Then your Count entertains visitors, does he? asked Madame Danglars. Indeed he does, and in a most lavish manner, I can assure you. I must try and persuade Monsieur Danglars to invite him to a ball or a dinner, or something of the sort, that he may be compelled to ask us in return. What, said Debray, laughing, do you really mean you would go to his house? Why not? My husband could accompany me. But do you know, this mysterious Count is a bachelor. 
"'You have ample proof to the contrary, if you look opposite,' said the baroness, as she laughingly pointed to the beautiful Greek. "'No, no,' exclaimed Debray, "'that girl is not his wife. He told us himself she was his slave. Do you not recollect, Morserf, his telling us so at your breakfast?' "'Well, then,' said the baroness, "'if slave she be, she has all the air and manner of a princess.' "'Of the Arabian Nights?' "'If you like. But tell me, my dear Lucian, what is it that constitutes a princess? Why, diamonds, and she is covered with them.' "'To me she seems overloaded,' observed Eugenie. "'She would look far better if she wore fewer, and we should then be able to see her finely formed throat and wrists.' "'See how the artist peeps out!' exclaimed Madame Danglars. "'My poor Eugenie, you must conceal your passion for the fine arts.' "'I admire all that is beautiful,' returned the young lady. "'And what do you think of the Count?' inquired Debray. "'He is not much amiss, according to my ideas of good looks.' "'The Count,' repeated Eugenie, as though it had not occurred to her to observe him sooner. "'The Count? Oh, he is so dreadfully pale.' "'I quite agree with you,' said Morcerf. "'and the secret of that very pallor is what we want to find out. "'The Countess G. insists upon it that he is a vampire.' "'Then the Countess G. has returned to Paris, has she?' inquired the Baroness. "'Is that she, Mamma? asked Eugenie, almost opposite to us, with that profusion of beautiful light hair. "'Yes,' said Madame Danglars, "'that is she. Shall I tell you what you ought to do, Morcerf?' "'Command me, Madame.' "'Well, then, you should go and bring your Count of Monte Cristo to us.' "'What for?' asked Eugenie. "'What for? Why, to converse with him, of course.' "'Have you really no desire to meet him?' "'None whatever,' replied Eugenie. "'Strange child,' murmured the baroness. "'He will very probably come of his own accord,' said Morcerf. "'There, do you see, madame? He recognizes you, and bows.' The baroness returned the salute in the most smiling and graceful manner. "'Well,' said Morcerf, "'I may as well be magnanimous, and tear myself away to forward your wishes. Adieu, I will go and try if there are any means of speaking to him.' "'Go straight to his box. That will be the simplest plan. "'But I have never been presented.' "'Presented to whom?' "'To the beautiful Greek.' "'You say she is only a slave. "'While you assert that she is a queen, or at least a princess. "'No, I hope that when he sees me leave you he will come out.' "'That is possible. Now go.' "'I am going,' said Albert, as he made his parting bow. Just as he was passing the Count's box, the door opened, and Monte Cristo came forth. After giving some directions to Ali, who stood in the lobby, the Count took Albert's arm. Carefully closing the box door, Ali placed himself before it, while a crowd of spectators assembled round the Nubian. "'Upon my word,' said Monte Cristo, "'Paris is a strange city, and the Parisians a very singular people.' See that cluster of persons collected around poor Ali, who is as much astonished as themselves. Really, one might suppose he was the only Nubian they had ever beheld. Now I can promise you that a Frenchman might show himself in public, either in Tunis, Constantinople, Baghdad, or Cairo, without being treated in that way. That shows that the Eastern nations have too much good sense to waste their time and attention on objects undeserving of either. However, as far as Ali is concerned, I can assure you, the interest he excites is merely from the circumstance of his being your attendant, you who are at this moment the most celebrated and fashionable person in Paris. Really? And what has procured me so fluttering a distinction? What? Why, yourself, to be sure. You give away horses worth a thousand louis. You save the lives of ladies of high rank and beauty. Under the name of Major Brack you run thoroughbreds ridden by tiny urchins not larger than marmots. Then, when you've carried off the golden trophy of victory, instead of setting any value on it, you give it to the first handsome woman you think of. And who has filled your head with all this nonsense? Why, in the first place, I heard it from Madame Danglars, who, by the by, is dying to see you in her box, or to have you seen there by others. Secondly, I learned it from Beauchamp's journal, and thirdly, from my own imagination. Why, if you sought concealment, did you call your horse Vampa? That was an oversight, certainly, replied the Count. But tell me, does the Count of Morcerf never visit the opera? I have been looking for him, but without success. He will be here to-night. In what part of the house? In the Baroness's box, I believe. 
That charming young woman with her is her daughter. Yes. I congratulate you, Morcerf smiled. We will discuss that subject at length some future time, said he. But what do you think of the music? What music? Why, the music you have been listening to. Oh, it is well enough as the production of a human composer sung by featherless bipeds, to quote the late Diogenes. From which it would seem, my dear Count, that you can at pleasure enjoy the seraphic strains that proceed from the seven choirs of paradise. You are right in some degree. When I wish to listen to sounds more exquisitely attuned to melody than mortal ear ever yet listened to, I go to sleep. Then sleep here, my dear Count. The conditions are favourable. What else was opera invented for? No, thank you. Your opera is too noisy. To sleep after the manner I speak of, absolute calm and silence are necessary, and then a certain preparation. I know, the famous hashish. Precisely. So, my dear Viscount, whenever you wish to be regaled with music, come and sup with me. I have already enjoyed that treat when breakfasting with you, said Morcerf. Do you mean at Rome? I do. Ah, then I suppose you heard Haydis Gusla. The poor exile frequently beguiles a weary hour in playing over to me the airs of her native land. Morcerf did not pursue the subject, and Monte Cristo himself fell into a silent reverie. The bell rang at this moment for the rising of the curtain. You will excuse my leaving you, said the Count, turning in the direction of his box. What? Are you going? Pray, say everything that is kind to Countess G. on the part of her friend the vampire. And what message shall I convey to the baroness? That with her permission I shall do myself the honour of paying my respects in the course of the evening. The third act had begun, and during its progress the Count of Morcerf, according to his promise, made his appearance in the box of Madame Danglars. The Count of Morcerf was not a person to excite either interest or curiosity in a place of public amusement. His presence, therefore, was wholly unnoticed, save by the occupants of the box in which he had just seated himself. The quick eye of Monte Cristo, however, marked his coming, and a slight though meaning smile passed over his lips. Heidi, whose soul seemed centred in the business of the stage, like all unsophisticated natures, delighted in whatever addressed itself to the eye or ear. The third act passed off as usual. Mademoiselles Noblet, Julie, and Leroux executed the customary pirouettes. Robert duly challenged the Prince of Granada, and the royal father of the Princess Isabella, taking his daughter by the hand, swept around the stage with majestic strides, the better to display the rich folds of his velvet robe and mantle. After which the curtain again fell, and the spectators poured forth from the theatre into the lobbies and salon. The Count left his box, and a moment later was saluting the Baron d'Anglars, who could not restrain a cry of mingled pleasure and surprise. "'You are welcome, Count,' she exclaimed, as he entered. "'I have been most anxious to see you, that I might repeat orally the thanks writing can so ill express. "'Surely so trifling a circumstance cannot deserve a place in your remembrance. "'Believe me, madame, I had entirely forgotten it.' "'But it is not so easy to forget, monsieur, that the very next day, after your princely gift, "'you saved the life of my dear friend, Madame de Villefort, "'which was endangered by the very animals your generosity restored to me.' This time, at least, I do not deserve your thanks. It was Ali, my Nubian slave, who rendered this service to Madame de Villefort. Was it Ali, asked the Count of Morcerf, who rescued my son from the hands of the bandits? No, Count, replied Monte Cristo, taking the hand held out to him by the general. In this instance I may fairly and freely accept your thanks. But you have already tendered them, and fully discharged your debt, if indeed there existed one, and I feel almost mortified to find you still reverting to the subject. May I beg of you, Baroness, to honour me with an introduction to your daughter? Oh, you are no stranger, at least not by name, replied Madame Danglars, and the last two or three days we have really talked of nothing but you. Eugénie, continued the Baroness, turning toward her daughter, this is the Count of Monte Cristo. The Count bowed, while Mademoiselle Danglars bent her head slightly. "'You have a charming young person with you to-night, Count,' said Eugenie. "'Is she your daughter?' "'No, mademoiselle,' said Monte Cristo, astonished at the coolness and freedom of the question. "'She is a poor, unfortunate Greek left under my care.' "'And what is her name?' "'Heidi,' replied Monte Cristo. "'A Greek?' murmured the Count of Morcerf. "'Yes, indeed, Count,' said Madame Danglars. 
"'And tell me, did you ever see at the court of Ali Tepelini, "'whom you so gloriously and valiantly served, "'a more exquisite beauty, or a richer costume?' "'Did I hear rightly, monsieur,' said Monte Cristo, "'that you served at Yanina?' "'I was inspector-general of the Pasha's troops,' replied Morcerf, "'and it is no secret that I owe my fortune, such as it is, "'to the liberality of the illustrious Albanese chief.' "'But look!' exclaimed Madame Danglars. "'Where?' stuttered Morcerf. "'There,' said Monte Cristo, placing his arms around the Count, and leaning with him over the front of the box, just as Heidi, whose eyes were occupied in examining the theatre in search of her guardian, perceived his pale features close to Morcerf's face. It was as if the young girl beheld the head of Medusa. She bent forwards as though to assure herself of the reality of what she saw, then uttering a faint cry, threw herself back in her seat, the sound was heard by the people about Ali, who instantly opened the box door. "'Why, Count!' exclaimed Eugénie. "'What has happened to your ward? She seems to have been taken suddenly ill.' "'Very probably,' answered the Count. "'But do not be alarmed on her account. Heidi's nervous system is delicately organized, and she is peculiarly susceptible to the odors even of flowers. Nay, there are some which cause her to faint if brought in her presence. However,' continued Monte Cristo, drawing a small file from his pocket, I have an infallible remedy. So saying, he bowed to the baroness and to her daughter, exchanged a parting shake of the hand with Debray and the Count, and left Madame Danglars' box. Upon his return to Heidi he found her still very pale. As soon as she saw him, she seized his hand. Her own hands were moist and icy cold. "'Who was it you were talking with over there?' she asked. "'With the Count of Morcerf,' answered Monte Cristo. He tells me he served your illustrious father, and that he owes his fortune to him. Wretch! exclaimed Heidi, her eyes flashing with rage. He sold my father to the Turks, and the fortune he boasts was the price of his treachery. Did you not know that, my dear lord? Something of this I have heard in Epirus, said Monte Cristo, but the particulars are still unknown to me. You shall relate them to me, my child. They are, no doubt, both curious and interesting. Oh, yes, yes, but let us go. I feel as though it would kill me to remain long near that dreadful man." So saying, Heidi arose, and wrapping herself in her burnous of white cashmere, embroidered with pearls and coral, she hastily quitted the box at the moment when the curtain was rising upon the fourth act. "'Do you observe,' said the Countess G. to Albert, who had returned to her side, "'that man does nothing like other people. He listens most devoutly to the third act of Robert Le Diable, and when the fourth begins, takes his departure. End of chapter 53 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 54 A Flurry in Stocks. Some days after this meeting, Albert de Morcerf visited the Count of Monte Cristo at his house in the Champs Elysees, which had already assumed that palace like appearance which the Count's princely fortune enabled him to give even to his most temporary residences. He came to renew the thanks of Madame Danglars, which had already been conveyed to the Count through the medium of a letter, signed Baron Danglars, née Hermine de Servio. Albert was accompanied by Lucien de Bray, who, joining his friend's conversation, added some passing compliments, the source of which the Count's talent for finesse easily enabled him to guess. He was convinced that Lucien's visit was due to a double feeling of curiosity, the larger half of which sentiment emanated from the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. In short, Madame Danglars, not being personally able to examine in detail the domestic economy and household arrangements of a man who gave away horses worth thirty thousand francs, and who went to the opera with a Greek slave wearing diamonds to the amount of a million of money, had deputed these eyes, by which she was accustomed to see, to give her a faithful account of the mode of life of this incomprehensible person. But the Count did not appear to suspect that there could be the slightest connection between Lucien's visit and the curiosity of the Baroness. "'You are in constant communication with the Baron Danglars?' the Count inquired of Albert de Morcerf. "'Yes, Count, you know what I told you.' "'All remains the same, then, in that quarter?' 
"'It is more than ever a settled thing,' said Lucian, and considering that this remark was all that he was at that time called upon to make, he adjusted the glass to his eye, and biting the top of his gold-headed cane, began to make a tour of the apartment, examining the arms and the pictures. "'Ah,' said Monte Cristo, "'I did not expect that the affair would be so promptly concluded.' "'Oh, things take their course without our assistance. While we are forgetting them, they are falling into their appointed order, and when again our attention is directed to them, we are surprised at the progress they have made toward the proposed end. My father and Monsieur Danglars served together in Spain, my father in the army, and Monsieur Danglars in the commissariat department. It was there that my father, ruined by the revolution, and Monsieur Danglars, who had never possessed any patrimony, both laid the foundations of their different fortunes.' Yes, said Monte Cristo. I think Monsieur Danglars mentioned that in a visit which I paid him. And, continued he, casting a side glance at Lucien, who was turning over the leaves of an album, Mademoiselle Eugenie is pretty. I think I remember that to be her name. Very pretty, replied Albert, or rather very beautiful, but of that style of beauty which I do not appreciate. I am an ungrateful fellow. You speak as if you were already her husband. Ah, returned Albert, in his turn looking around to see what Lucien was doing. Really, said Monte Cristo, lowering his voice, you do not appear to me to be very enthusiastic on the subject of this marriage. Mademoiselle Danglars is too rich for me, replied Morcerf, and that frightens me. Bah! exclaimed Monte Cristo, that's a fine reason to give. Are you not rich yourself? My father's income is about fifty thousand francs per annum, and he will give me, perhaps, ten or twelve thousand when I marry. That, perhaps, might not be considered a large sum, in Paris especially, said the Count, but everything does not depend on wealth, and it is a fine thing to have a good name, and to occupy a high station in society. Your name is celebrated, your position magnificent, and then the Comte de Morcerf is a soldier, and it is pleasing to see the integrity of a Bayard united to the poverty of a Duguesclin. clean Disinterestedness is the brightest ray in which a noble sword can shine. As for me, I consider the union with Mademoiselle Danglars a most suitable one. She will enrich you, and you will ennoble her. Albert shook his head, and looked thoughtful. There is still something else, said he. I confess, observed Monte Cristo, that I have some difficulty in comprehending your objection to a young lady who is both rich and beautiful. Oh, said Morcerf, this repugnance, if repugnance it may be called, is not all on my side. Whence can it arise, then? For you told me your father desired the marriage. It is my mother who dissents. She has a clear and penetrating judgment, and does not smile upon the proposed union. I cannot account for it, but she seems to entertain some prejudice against the Danglars. Ah, said the Count, in a somewhat forced tone, that may be easily explained. The Comtesse de Morcerf, who is aristocracy and refinement itself, does not relish the idea of being allied to your marriage with one of ignoble birth. That is natural enough. I do not know if that is her reason, said Albert, but one thing I do know, that if this marriage be consummated it will render her quite miserable. There was to have been a meeting six weeks ago in order to talk over and settle the affair, but I had such a sudden attack of indisposition. Real? interrupted the Count, smiling. Oh, real enough, from anxiety, doubtless. At any rate, they postponed the matter for two months. There is no hurry, you know. I am not yet twenty-one, and Eugenie is only seventeen, but the two months expire next week. It must be done. My dear Count, you cannot imagine how my mind is harassed. How happy you are in being exempt from all this! Well, and why should not you be free, too? What prevents you from being so? Oh, it will be too great a disappointment to my father if I do not marry Mademoiselle Danglars. Marry her, then, said the Count, with a significant shrug of the shoulders. Yes, replied Morcerf, but that will plunge my mother into positive grief. Then do not marry her, said the Count. Well, I shall see. I will try and think over what is the best thing to be done. You will give me your advice, will you not, and, if possible, extricate me from my unpleasant position. I think rather than give pain to my dear mother, I would run the risk of offending the Count." Monte Cristo turned away. He seemed moved by this last remark. "'Ah!' said he to Debray, who had thrown himself into an easy chair at the furthest extremity of the salon, and who held a pencil in his right hand and an account-book in his left. "'What are you doing there?' Are you making a sketch after Poussin? 
"'Oh, no,' was the tranquil response. "'I am too fond of art to attempt anything of that sort. "'I am doing a little sum in arithmetic.' "'In arithmetic?' "'Yes. I am calculating—' "'By the way, Morcerf, that indirectly concerns you. "'I am calculating what the house of Danglars must have gained "'by the last rise in Haiti bonds. "'From two hundred six they have risen to four hundred nine in three days, "'and the prudent banker had purchased at two hundred six. Therefore he must have made three hundred thousand livres. "'That is not his biggest scoop,' said Morcerf. "'Did he not make a million in Spaniards this last year?' "'My dear fellow,' said Lucien, "'here is the Count of Monte Cristo, who will say to you, as the Italians do, "'Money and sanctity, each in a moiety. "'When they tell me such things, I only shrug my shoulders and say nothing.' "'But you were speaking of Haitians,' said Monte Cristo. "'Ah, Haitians, that is quite another thing.' Haitians are the écart of French stock-jobbing. We may like Boulot, delight in whist, be enraptured with Boston, and yet grow tired of them all, but we always come back to écart. It is not only a game, it is an hors d'oeuvre. Monsieur Danglars sold yesterday at four hundred five, and pockets three hundred thousand francs. Had he but waited to today, the price would have fallen to two hundred five, and instead of gaining three hundred thousand francs, he would have lost twenty or twenty-five thousand. "'And what has caused the sudden fall from four hundred nine to two hundred six? asked Monte Cristo. "'I am profoundly ignorant of all these stock-jobbing intrigues.' "'Because,' said Albert, laughing, "'one piece of news follows another, and there is often great dissimilarity between them.' "'Ah,' said the Count, "'I see that Monsieur Danglars is accustomed to play at gaining or losing three hundred thousand francs in a day. He must be enormously rich.' "'It is not he who plays,' exclaimed Lucien. "'It is Madame Danglars. She is indeed daring.' "'But you, who are a reasonable being, Lucien, and who know how little dependence is to be placed on the news, since you are at the fountainhead, surely you ought to prevent it,' said Morcerf with a smile. "'How can I, if her husband fails in controlling her?' asked Lucien. "'You know the character of the baroness. No one has any influence with her, and she does precisely what she pleases.' "'Ah, if I were in your place,' said Albert. "'Well?' "'I would reform her. It would be rendering a service to her future son-in-law.' "'How would you set about it?' "'Ah, that would be easy enough. I would give her a lesson.' "'A lesson?' "'Yes. Your position as secretary to the minister renders your authority great on the subject of political news. You never open your mouth, but the stockbrokers immediately stenograph your words. Cause her to lose a hundred thousand francs, and that would teach her prudence. "'I do not understand,' stammered Lucien. "'It is very clear notwithstanding,' replied the young man, with an artlessness wholly free from affectation. "'Tell her some fine morning an unheard-of piece of intelligence, some telegraphic despatch of which you alone are in possession. For instance, that Henri the Fourth was seen yesterday at Gabrielle's. That would boom the market. She will buy heavily, and she will certainly lose when Beauchamp announces the following day, in his gazette, the reports circulated by some usually well-informed persons that the king was seen yesterday at Gabriel's house is totally without foundation. We can positively assert that his majesty did not quit the Pont Neuf. Lucien half smiled. Monte Cristo, although apparently indifferent, had not lost one word of this conversation, and his penetrating eye had even read a hidden secret in the embarrassed manner of the secretary. This embarrassment had completely escaped Albert, but it caused Lucien to shorten his visit. He was evidently ill at ease. The Count, in taking leave of him, said something in a low voice, to which he answered, "'Willingly, Count, I accept.' The Count returned to young Morcerf. "'Do you not think, on reflection,' he said to him, "'that you have done wrong in speaking thus of your mother-in-law "'in the presence of Monsieur Dubray?' "'My dear Count,' said Monsieur, "'I beg of you not to apply that title so prematurely. "'Now, speaking without any exaggeration, "'is your mother really so very much averse to this marriage?' "'So much so that the Baroness very rarely comes to the house, "'and my mother has not, I think, visited Madame Danglars twice in her whole life.' Then, said the Count, I am emboldened to speak openly to you. Monsieur Danglars is my banker. Monsieur de Villefort has overwhelmed me with politeness in return for a service which a casual piece of good fortune enabled me to render him. I predict from all this an avalanche of dinners and routs. Now, in order not to presume on this, and also to be beforehand with them, I have, if agreeable to you, thought of inviting Monsieur and Madame Danglars and Monsieur and Madame de Villefort to my country house at Autuy. 
If I were to invite you and the Count and Countess of Morcerf to this dinner, I should give it the appearance of being a matrimonial meeting, or at least Madame de Morcerf would look upon the affair in that light, especially if Baron Danglars did me the honour to bring his daughter. In that case your mother would hold me in aversion, and I do not at all wish that. On the contrary, I desire to stand high in her esteem. Indeed, Count, said Morcerf. I thank you sincerely for having used so much candour toward me, and I gratefully accept the exclusion which you propose. You say you desire my mother's good opinion. I assure you it is already yours to a very unusual extent. Do you think so? said Monte Cristo, with interest. I am sure of it. We talked of you an hour after you left us the other day. But to return to what we were saying, if my mother could know of this attention on your part, and I will venture to tell her, I am sure that she will be most grateful to you. It is true that my father will be equally angry. The Count laughed. Well, said he to Morcerf, but I think your father will not be the only angry one. Monsieur and Madame Danglars will think me a very ill-mannered person. They know that I am intimate with you, that you are, in fact, one of the oldest of my Parisian acquaintances, and they will not find you at my house. They will certainly ask me why I did not invite you. Be sure to provide yourself with some previous engagement which shall have some semblance of probability, and communicate the fact to me by a line in writing. You know that with bankers nothing but a written document will be valid." "'I wish to do better than that,' said Albert. "'My mother is wishing to go to the seaside. What day is fixed for your dinner?' "'Saturday. This is Tuesday. Well, to-morrow evening we leave, and the day after we shall be at Treport. Really, Count, you have a delightful way of setting people at their ease. Indeed, you give me more credit than I deserve. I only wish to do what will be agreeable to you, that is all. When shall you send your invitations? This very day. Well, I will immediately call on Monsieur Danglars, and tell him that my mother and myself must leave Paris to-morrow. I have not seen you, consequently I know nothing of your dinner. How foolish you are! Have you forgotten that Monsieur de Bray has just seen you at my house? Ah, true. Fix it this way. I have seen you, and invited you without any ceremony, when you instantly answered that it would be impossible for you to accept, as you were going to Treport. Well, then, that is settled. But you will come and call on my mother before to-morrow. Before to-morrow? That will be a difficult matter to arrange. Besides, I shall just be in the way of all the preparations for departure. Well, you can do better. You were only a charming man before, but if you accede to my proposal, you will be adorable." What must I do to obtain such sublimity? You are to-day as free as air. Come and dine with me. We shall be a small party, only yourself, my mother, and I. You have scarcely seen my mother. You shall have an opportunity of observing her more closely. She is a remarkable woman, and I only regret that there does not exist another like her, about twenty years younger. In that case, I assure you, there would very soon be a countess and a viscountess of Morcerf. As to my father, you will not see him. He is officially engaged, and dines with the chief referendary. We will talk over our travels, and you, who have seen the whole world, will relate your adventures. You shall tell us the history of the beautiful Greek who was with you the other night at the opera, and whom you call your slave and yet treat like a princess. We will talk Italian and Spanish. Come, accept my invitation, and my mother will thank you." A thousand thanks, said the Count. Your invitation is most gracious, and I regret exceedingly that it is not in my power to accept it. I am not so much at liberty as you suppose. On the contrary, I have a most important engagement. Ah, take care. You were teaching me just now how, in case of an invitation to dinner, one might creditably make an excuse. I require the proof of a pre-engagement. I am not a banker like Monsieur Danglars, but I am quite as incredulous as he is. I am going to give you a proof, replied the Count, and he rang the bell. Humph, said Morcerf, it is the second time that you have refused to dine with my mother. It is evident that you wish to avoid her. Monte Cristo started. Oh, you do not mean that, said he. Besides, here comes the confirmation of my assertion. Baptistine entered, and remained standing at the door. I had no previous knowledge of your visit, had I? Indeed, you are such an extraordinary person that I would not answer for it. At all events, I could not guess that you would invite me to dinner. Probably not. Well, listen, Baptistine, what did I tell you this morning when I called you into my laboratory? To close the door against visitors as soon as the clock struck five, replied the valet. What then? 
"'Ah, my dear Count,' said Albert, "'no, no, I wish to do away with that mysterious reputation that you've given me, my dear Viscount. It is tiresome to be always acting Manfred. I wish my life to be free and open. Go on, Baptistine.' then to admit no one except Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti and his son. You hear? Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti, a man who ranks among the most ancient nobility of Italy, whose name Dante has celebrated in the tenth canto of the Inferno. You remember it, do you not? Then there is his son, Andrea, a charming young man, about your own age, Viscount, bearing the same title as yourself, and who is making his entry into the Parisian world, aided by his father's millions. The major will bring his son with him this evening, the contino, as we say in Italy. He confides him to my care. If he proves himself worthy of it, I will do what I can to advance his interests. You will assist me in the work, will you not? Most undoubtedly. This major Cavalcanti is an old friend of yours, then? By no means. He is a perfect nobleman, very polite, modest, and agreeable, such as may be found constantly in Italy, descendants of very ancient families. I have met him several times at Florence, Boulogne, and Lucca, and now he has communicated to me the fact of his arrival in Paris. The acquaintances one makes in travelling have a sort of claim on one. They everywhere expect to receive the same attention which you once paid them by chance, as though the civilities of a passing hour were likely to awaken any lasting interest in favour of the man in whose society you may happen to be thrown in the course of your journey. This good Major Cavalcanti is coming to take a second view of Paris, which he only saw in passing through in the time of the Empire, when he was on his way to Moscow. I shall give him a good dinner, he will confide his son to my care, and I will promise to watch over him. I shall let him follow in whatever path his folly may lead him, and then I shall have done my part. Certainly. I see you are a model mentor, said Albert. Good-bye. We shall return on Sunday. By the way, I have received news of France. Have you? Is he still amusing himself in Italy? I believe so. However, he regrets your absence extremely. He says you were the son of Rome, and that without you all appears dark and cloudy. I do not know if he does not even go so far as to say that it rains. His opinion of me is altered for the better, then. No, he still persists in looking upon you as the most incomprehensible and mysterious of beings. He is a charming young man, said Monte Cristo and I felt a lively interest in him the very first evening of my introduction, when I met him in search of a supper, and prevailed upon him to accept a portion of mine. He is, I think, the son of General Depinay. He is. The same who was so shamefully assassinated in 1815. By the Bonapartists. Yes. Really, I like him extremely. Is there not also a matrimonial engagement contemplated for him? Yes, he is to marry Mademoiselle de Villefort. Indeed. And you know I am to marry Mademoiselle Danglars, said Albert, laughing. You smile. Yes. Why do you do so? I smile because there appears to me to be about as much inclination for the consummation of the engagement in question as there is for my own. But really, my dear Count, we are talking as much of women as they do of us. It is unpardonable. Albert rose. Are you going? Oh, really, that is a good idea. Two hours have I been boring you to death with my company, and then you, with the greatest politeness, ask me if I'm going. Indeed, Count, you are the most polished man in the world. And your servants, too. How very well behaved they are! There is quite a style about them. Monsieur Baptistine especially. I never could get such a man as that. My servants seem to imitate those you sometimes see in a play, who, because they have only a word or two to say, acquit themselves in the most awkward manner possible. Therefore, if you part with Monsieur Baptistine, give me the refusal of him. By all means. That is not all. Give my compliments to your illustrious Lucanese, Cavalcante of the Cavalcante, and if by any chance he should be willing to establish his son, find him a wife very rich, very noble, on her mother's side at least, and a baroness in right of her father. I will help you in the search. Ah, you will do as much as that, will you? Yes. Well, really, nothing is certain in this world. Oh, Count, what a service you might render me! I should like you a hundred times better if by your intervention I could remain a bachelor, even if it were only for ten years. Nothing is impossible, gravely replied Monte Cristo, and taking leave of Albert he returned into the house, and struck the gong three times. Bertuccio appeared. Monsieur Bertuccio, you understand that I intend entertaining company on Saturday at Autuy. 
Bertuccio slightly started. I shall require your services to see that all be properly arranged. It is a beautiful house, or at all events may be made so. There must be a good deal done before it can deserve that title, Your Excellency, for the tapestried hangings are very old. Let them all be taken away and changed, then. With the exception of the sleeping chamber, which is hung with red damask, you will leave that exactly as it is. Bertuccio bowed. You will not touch the garden, either. As to the yard, you may do what you please with it. I should prefer that being altered beyond all recognition. I will do everything in my power to carry out your wishes, Your Excellency. I should be glad, however, to receive Your Excellency's commands concerning the dinner. Really, my dear Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count, since you have been in Paris you have become quite nervous, and apparently out of your element. You no longer seem to understand me. But surely Your Excellency will be so good as to inform me who are you expecting to receive. I do not yet know myself, neither is it necessary that you should do so. Lucullus dines with Lucullus. That is quite sufficient. Bertuccio bowed, and left the room. End of chapter 54 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, July 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 55 Major Cavalcante. Both the Count and Baptistine had told the truth when they announced to Morcerf the proposed visit of the Major, which had served Monte Cristo as a pretext for declining Albert's invitation. Seven o'clock had just struck, and Monsieur Bertuccio, according to the command which had been given to him, had two hours before left for Autuy, when a cab stopped at the door, and after depositing its occupant at the gate, immediately hurried away, as if ashamed of its employment. The visitor was about fifty-two years of age, dressed in one of the green surtouts ornamented with black frogs which have so long maintained their popularity all over Europe. He wore trousers of blue cloth, boots tolerably clean but not of the brightest polish, and a little too thick in the soles, buckskin gloves, a hat somewhat resembling in shape those usually worn by the gendarmes, and a black cravat striped with white, which, if the proprietor had not worn it of his own free will, might have passed for a halter, so much did it resemble one. Such was the picturesque costume of the person who rang at the gate, and demanded if it was not at number thirty in the Avenue des Champs-Élysées that the Count of Monte Cristo lived, and who, being answered by the porter in the affirmative, entered, closed the gate after him, and began to ascend the steps. The small and angular head of this man, his white hair and thick grey moustaches, caused him to be easily recognised by Baptistine, who had received an exact description of the expected visitor, and who was awaiting him in the hall. Therefore scarcely had the stranger time to pronounce his name before the Count was apprised of his arrival. He was ushered into a simple and elegant drawing-room, and the Count rose to meet him with a smiling air. "'Ah, my dear sir, you are most welcome. I was expecting you.' "'Indeed,' said the Italian. "'Was your Excellency then aware of my visit?' "'Yes, I had been told that I should see you to-day at seven o'clock.' "'Then you have received full information concerning my arrival?' "'Of course.' "'Ah, so much the better. I feared this little precaution might have been forgotten.' "'What precaution?' "'That of informing you beforehand of my coming.' "'Oh, no, it has not.' "'But you're sure you're not mistaken?' "'Very sure. "'It really was I whom your Excellency expected at seven o'clock this evening.' "'I will prove it to you beyond a doubt.' "'Oh, no, never mind that,' said the Italian. "'It is not worth the trouble.' "'Yes, yes,' said Monte Cristo. "'His visitor appeared slightly uneasy. "'Let me see,' said the Count. "'Are you not the Marquis Bartolomeo Cavalcante?' "'Bartolomeo Cavalcante,' joyfully replied the Italian. "'Yes, I really am he.' Ex-major in the Austrian service? Was I a major? timidly asked the old soldier. Yes, said Monte Cristo. You were a major. That is the title the French give to the post which you filled in Italy. Very good, said the major. I do not demand more, you understand. Your visit here today is not of your own suggestion, is it? said Monte Cristo. No, certainly not. You were sent by some other person? Yes. By the excellent Abbe Busoni. "'Exactly so,' said the delighted Major. "'And you have a letter?' 
"'Yes, there it is. "'Give it to me, then.' "'And Monte Cristo took the letter, which he opened and read. "'The major looked at the Count with his large staring eyes, "'and then took a survey of the apartment, "'but his gaze almost immediately reverted to the proprietor of the room. "'Yes, yes, I see. "'Major Cavalcanti, a worthy patrician of Lucca, "'a descendant of the Cavalcanti of Florence,' "'continued Monte Cristo, reading aloud, "'possessing an income of half a million. "'Monte Cristo raised his eyes from the paper and bowed. "'Half a million,' said he, "'magnificent. "'Half a million, is it?' said the major. "'Yes, in so many words. "'And it must be so, for the abbé knows correctly "'the amount of all the largest fortunes in Europe.' "'Well, be it half a million, then. "'But on my word of honour I had no idea that it was so much. "'Because you are robbed by your steward, "'you must make some reformation in that quarter.' "'You have opened my eyes,' said the Italian gravely. "'I will show the gentleman the door.' "'Monte Cristo resumed the perusal of the letter. "'And who needs only one more thing to make him happy?' "'Yes, indeed, but one,' said the Major, with a sigh. "'Which is to recover a lost and adored son.' A lost and adored son, stolen away in his infancy, either by an enemy of his noble family, or by the gypsies. At the age of five years, said the major, with a deep sigh, and raising his eye to heaven. Unhappy father, said Monte Cristo. The count continued, I have given him renewed life and hope, in the assurance that you have the power of restoring the son whom he has vainly sought for fifteen years. The major looked at the count with an indescribable expression of anxiety. "'I have the power of so doing,' said Monte Cristo. The major recovered his self-possession. "'So then,' said he, "'the letter was true to the end?' "'Did you doubt it, my dear Monsieur Bartolomeo?' "'No, indeed, certainly not. A good man, a man holding religious office, as does the Abbé Busoni, could not condescend to deceive or play off a joke. But your excellency has not read all.' "'Ah, true,' said Monte Cristo. "'There is a postscript.' "'Yes, yes,' repeated the major. "'Yes, there is a postscript.' "'In order to save Major Cavalcanti the trouble of drawing on his banker, "'I send him a draft for two thousand francs to defray his travelling expenses, "'and a credit on you for the further sum of forty-eight thousand francs, which you still owe me.' "'The major awaited the conclusion of the postscript, apparently with great anxiety.' "'Very good,' said the Count. "'He said, "'Very good,' muttered the Major. "'Then, sir,' replied he. "'Then what?' asked Monte Cristo. "'Then the postscript. "'Well, what of the postscript?' "'Then the postscript is as favourably received by you as the rest of the letter?' "'Certainly. "'The Abbé Busoni and myself have a small account open between us.' I do not remember if it is exactly forty-eight thousand francs which I am still owing him, but I dare say we shall not dispute the difference. You attached great importance, then, to this postscript, my dear Monsieur Cavalcanti. I must explain to you, said the Major, that, fully confiding in the signature of the Abbé Busoni, I had not provided myself with any other funds, so that, if this resource had failed me, I should have found myself very unpleasantly situated in Paris. "'Is it possible that a man of your standing should be embarrassed anywhere?' said Monte Cristo. "'Why, really, I know no one,' said the Major. "'But then you yourself are known to others.' "'Yes, I am known, so that—' "'Proceed, my dear Monsieur Cavalcanti. "'So that you will remit to me these forty-eight thousand francs?' "'Certainly, at your first request.' The Major's eyes dilated with pleased astonishment. "'But sit down,' said Monte Cristo. "'Really, I do not know what I have been thinking of. "'I have positively kept you standing for the last quarter of an hour.' "'Don't mention it.' "'The Major drew an armchair toward him, and proceeded to seat himself. "'Now,' said the Count, "'what will you take? "'A glass of port, sherry, or alicante?' "'Alicante, if you please. "'It is my favourite wine. "'I have some that is very good. "'You will take a biscuit with it, will you not?' "'Yes, I will take a biscuit, as you are so obliging.' Monte Cristo rang. Baptistine appeared. The Count advanced to meet him. "'Well,' said he, in a low voice. "'The young man is here,' said the valet de chambre, in the same tone. "'Into what room did you take him?' "'Into the blue drawing-room, according to your Excellency's instructions. "'That's right. Now bring the Alicante and some biscuits.' Baptistine left the room. 
Really, said the Major, I am quite ashamed of the trouble I am giving you. Pray don't mention such a thing, said the Count. Baptistine re entered with glasses, wine, and biscuits. The Count filled one glass, but in the other he only poured a few drops of the ruby colored liquid. The bottle was covered with spiders' webs and all the other signs which indicate the age of a wine more truly than do wrinkles on a man's face. The Major made a wise choice. He took the full glass and a biscuit. The Count told Baptistine to leave the plate within reach of his guest, who began by sipping the Alicante with an expression of great satisfaction, and then delicately steeped his biscuit in the wine. So, sir, you lived at Lucca, did you? You were rich, noble, held in great esteem, had all that could render a man happy. All, said the Major, hastily swallowing his biscuit, positively all. And yet there was one thing wanting in order to complete your happiness. Only one thing, said the Italian. And that one thing, your lost child. Ah, said the Major, taking a second biscuit, that consummation of my happiness was indeed wanting. The worthy Major raised his eyes to heaven and sighed. Let me hear, then, said the Count, who this deeply regretted son was, for I always understood you were a bachelor. That was the general opinion, sir, said the Major, and I— Yes, replied the Count, and you confirmed the report. A youthful indiscretion, I suppose, which you were anxious to conceal from the world at large. The Major recovered himself, and resumed his usual calm manner, at the same time casting his eyes down, either to give himself time to compose his countenance, or to assist his imagination, all the while giving an underlook at the Count, the protracted smile on whose lips still announced the same polite curiosity. Yes, said the Major, I did wish this fault to be hidden from every eye. Not on your own account, surely, replied Monte Cristo, for a man is above that sort of thing. Oh, no, certainly not on my account, said the Major, with a smile and a shake of the head. But for the sake of the mother, said the Count. Yes, for the mother's sake, his poor mother, cried the Major, taking a third biscuit. Take some more wine, my dear Cavalcanti, said the Count, pouring out for him a second glass of Alicante. Your emotion has quite overcome you. His poor mother, murmured the Major, trying to get the lacrimal gland in operation, so as to moisten the corner of his eye with a false tear. She belonged to one of the first families in Italy, I think, did she not? She was of a noble family of Fiesoli, Count. And her name was—do you desire to know her name? Oh, said Monte Cristo, it would be quite superfluous for you to tell me, for I already know it. The Count knows everything, said the Italian, bowing. Oliva Corsinari, was it not? Oliva Corsinari. A marchioness? A marchioness. And you married her at last, notwithstanding the opposition of her family? Yes, that was the way it ended. And you have doubtless brought all your papers with you, said Monte Cristo. What papers? The certificate of your marriage with Oliva Corsinari, and the register of your child's birth. The register of my child's birth? The register of the birth of Andrea Cavalcante, your son. Is not his name Andrea? I believe so, said the Major. What? You believe so? I dare not positively assert it, as he has been lost for so long a time. Well, then, said Monte Cristo, you have all the documents with you? Your Excellency, I regret to say that, not knowing it was necessary to come provided with these papers, I neglected to bring them. That is unfortunate, returned Monte Cristo. Were they then so necessary? They were indispensable. The Major passed his hand across his brow. Ah, Perbacco, indispensable were they? Certainly they were. Supposing there were to be doubts raised as to the validity of your marriage, or the legitimacy of your child. True, said the Major, there might be doubts raised. In that case your son would be very unpleasantly situated. It would be fatal to his interests. It might cause him to fail in some desirable matrimonial alliance. Oh, peccato! You must know that in France they are very particular on these points. It is not sufficient, as in Italy, to go to the priest and say, We love each other, and want you to marry us. Marriage is a civil affair in France, and in order to marry in an orthodox manner you must have papers which undeniably establish your identity. That is the misfortune. You see, I have not these necessary papers. Fortunately, I have them, though, said Monte Cristo. You? Yes. You have them? I have them. 
Indeed, said the Major, who, seeing the object of his journey frustrated by the absence of the papers, feared also that his forgetfulness might give rise to some difficulty concerning the forty-eight thousand francs. Ah, indeed, that is a fortunate circumstance. Yes, that really is lucky, for it never occurred to me to bring them. I do not at all wonder at it. One cannot think of everything, but happily the Abbe Busoni thought for you. He is an excellent person. He is extremely prudent and thoughtful. He is an admirable man, said the Major, and he sent them to you. Here they are. The Major clasped his hands in token of admiration. You married Oliva Corsinari in the church of San Paolo de Montecatini. Here is the priest's certificate. Yes, indeed, there it is truly, said the Italian, looking on with astonishment. And here is Andrea Cavalcanti's baptismal register, given by the curate of Saravezza. All quite correct. Take these documents, then. They do not concern me. You will give them to your son, who will, of course, take great care of them. I should think so, indeed. If he were to lose them— Well, and if he were to lose them, said Monte Cristo. In that case, replied the Major, it would be necessary to write to the curate for duplicates, and it would be some time before they could be obtained. It would be a difficult matter to arrange, said Monte Cristo. Almost an impossibility, replied the Major. Well, I am very glad to see that you understand the value of these papers. I regard them as invaluable. Now, said Monte Cristo, as to the mother of the young man. As to the mother of the young man, repeated the Italian, with anxiety. As regards the Marchesa Corsinari. Really, said the Major, difficulties seem to thicken upon us. Will she be wanted in any way? No, sir, replied Monte Cristo. Besides, has she not? Yes, sir, said the Major, she has. Paid the last debt of nature? Alas, yes, returned the Italian. I knew that, said Monte Cristo. She has been dead these ten years. And I am still mourning her loss, exclaimed the Major, drawing from his pocket a checked handkerchief, and alternately wiping first the left and then the right eye. What would you have, said Monte Cristo? We are all mortal. Now you understand, my dear Monsieur Cavalcante, that it is useless for you to tell people in France that you have been separated from your son for fifteen years. Stories of gypsies who steal children are not at all in vogue in this part of the world, and would not be believed. You sent him for his education to a college in one of the provinces, and now you wish him to complete his education in the Parisian world. That is the reason which has induced you to leave Via Reggio, where you have lived since the death of your wife. That will be sufficient. You think so? Certainly. Very well, then. If they should hear of the separation— Ah, yes, what could I say? that an unfaithful tutor brought over by the enemies of your family, by the Corsinari, precisely, had stolen away this child in order that your name might become extinct. That is reasonable, since he is an only son. Well, now that all is arranged, do not let these newly awakened remembrances be forgotten. You have doubtless already guessed that I was preparing a surprise for you. An agreeable one? asked the Italian. Ah, I see the eye of a father is no more to be deceived than his heart. Hum, said the Major. Someone has told you the secret, or perhaps you guessed that he was here. That who was here? Your child, your son, your Andrea. I did guess it, replied the Major, with the greatest possible coolness. Then he is here? He is, said Monte Cristo. When the valet de chambre came in just now, he told me of his arrival. Ah, very well, very well, said the Major, clutching the buttons of his coat at each exclamation. My dear sir, said Monte Cristo, I understand your emotion. You must have time to recover yourself. I will, in the meantime, go and prepare the young man for this much desired interview, for I presume that he is not less impatient for it than yourself. I should quite imagine that to be the case, said Cavalcante. Well, in a quarter of an hour he shall be with you. You will bring him in, then? You carry your goodness so far as even to present him to me yourself. No, I do not wish to come between a father and a son. Your interview will be private. But do not be uneasy. Even if the powerful voice of nature should be silent, you cannot well mistake him. He will enter by this door. He is a fine young man of fair complexion, a little too fair, perhaps, pleasing in manners, but you will see and judge for yourself. By the way, said the Major, you know I have only the two thousand francs which the Abbe Bussoni sent me. This sum I have expended upon travelling expenses, and—and and you want money? That is a matter of course, my dear Monsieur Cavalcante. 
"'Well, here are eight thousand francs on account.' The major's eyes sparkled brilliantly. "'It is forty thousand francs which I now owe you,' said Monte Cristo. "'Does your excellency wish for a receipt?' said the major, at the same time slipping the money into the inner pocket of his coat. "'For what?' said the count. "'I thought you might want it to show the Abbe Busoni. "'Well, when you receive the remaining forty thousand, you shall give me a receipt in full. "'Between honest men such excessive precaution is, I think, quite unnecessary.' "'Yes, so it is, between perfectly upright people.' "'One word more,' said Monte Cristo. "'Say on. "'You will permit me to make one remark.' "'Certainly, pray do so. "'Then I should advise you to leave off wearing that style of dress.' "'Indeed,' said the Major, regarding himself with an air of complete satisfaction. "'Yes, it may be worn at Via Reggio, but that costume, however elegant in itself, has long been out of fashion in Paris.' "'That's unfortunate. "'Oh, if you really are attached to your old mode of dress, "'you can easily resume it when you leave Paris. "'But what shall I wear?' "'What you find in your trunks.' "'In my trunks? "'I have but one portmanteau. "'I dare say you have nothing else with you. "'What is the use of boring oneself with so many things? "'Besides, an old soldier always likes to march "'with as little baggage as possible.' "'That is just the case. "'Precisely so.' "'But you are a man of foresight and prudence. "'Therefore you sent your luggage on before you. "'It has arrived at the Hôtel de Princes, Rue de Richelieu. "'It is there you are to take up your quarters.' "'Then in these trunks? "'I presume you have given orders to your valet de chambre "'to put in all you are likely to need, "'your plain clothes and your uniform. "'On grand occasions you must wear your uniform. "'That will look very well. "'Do not forget your crosses. "'They still laugh at them in France, "'and yet always wear them for all that.' "'Very well, very well,' said the Major, who was in ecstasy at the attention paid him by the Count. "'Now,' said Monte Cristo, "'that you have fortified yourself against all painful excitement, "'prepare yourself, my dear Monsieur Cavalcante, to meet your lost Andrea.' Saying which, Monte Cristo bowed, and disappeared behind the tapestry, leaving the Major fascinated beyond expression with the delightful reception which he had received at the hands of the Count. End of chapter 55 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Opheliad in New South Wales, Australia, August 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 56. André Cavalcanti. The Count of Monte Cristo entered the adjoining room, which Baptistin had designated as the drawing room, and found there a young man, of graceful demeanour and elegant appearance, who had arrived in a cab about half an hour previously. Baptistin had not found any difficulty in recognising the person who presented himself at the door for admittance. He was certainly the tall young man with light hair, red beard, black eyes, and brilliant complexion, whom his master had so particularly described to him. When the Count entered the room, the young man was carelessly stretched on a sofa, tapping his boot with the gold-headed cane which he held in his hand. On perceiving the Count, he rose quickly. "'The Count of Monte Cristo, I believe,' said he. "'Yes, sir, and I think I have the honour of addressing Count Andrea Cavalcanti?' "'Count Andrea Cavalcanti,' repeated the young man, accompanying his words with a bow. "'You are charged with a letter of introduction addressed to me, are you not?' said the Count." I did not mention that, because the signature seemed to me so strange. The letter signed, Sinbad the Sailor, is it not? Exactly so. Now, as I have never known any Sinbad, with the exception of the one celebrated in the Thousand and One Nights. Well, it is one of his descendants, and a great friend of mine. He is a very rich Englishman, eccentric almost to insanity, and his real name is Lord Wilmore. Ah, indeed! Then that explains everything that is extraordinary, said André. He is, then, the same Englishman whom I met at... Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Well, monsieur, I am at your service. If what you say is true, replied the Count, smiling, perhaps you will be kind enough to give me some account of yourself and your family? Certainly I will do so, said the young man, with a quickness which gave proof of his ready invention. I am, as you have said, the Count Andrea 
Cavalcanti, son of Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti, a descendant of the Cavalcanti whose names are inscribed in the Golden Book at Florence. Our family, although still rich, for my father's income amounts to half a million, has experienced many misfortunes, and I myself was, at the age of five years, taken away by the treachery of my tutor, so that for fifteen years I have not seen the author of my existence. Since I have arrived at years of discretion and become my own master, I have been constantly seeking him, but all in vain. At length I received this letter from your friend, which states that my father is in Paris, and authorises me to address myself to you for information respecting him. "'Really, all you have related to me is exceedingly interesting,' said Monte Cristo, observing the young man with a gloomy satisfaction. "'And you have done well to confirm in everything to the wishes of my friend Sinbad, for your father is indeed here, and is seeking you.' The Count, from the moment of first entering the drawing-room, had not once lost sight of the expression of the young man's countenance. He had admired the assurance of his look and the firmness of his voice, but at these words, so natural in themselves, your father is indeed here and is seeking you, young Andrea started and exclaimed, My father? Is my father here? Most undoubtedly, replied Monte Cristo, your father, Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti. The expression of terror which for the moment had overspread the features of the young man had now disappeared. Ah, yes, that is the name, certainly. "'Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti. "'And you really mean to say, "'Monsieur, that my dear father is here?' "'Yes, sir, and I can even add "'that I have only just left his company. "'The history which he related to me "'of his lost son touched me to the quick. "'Indeed, his griefs, hopes, and fears "'on that subject might furnish material "'for a most touching and pathetic poem. "'At length he one day received a letter, "'stating that the abductors of his son "'now offered to restore him, or at least to give notice where he might be found, on condition of receiving a large sum of money by way of ransom. Your father did not hesitate an instant, and the sum was sent to the frontier of Piedmont, with a passport signed for Italy. You were in the south of France, I think? Yes, replied Andrea, with an embarrassed air. I was in the south of France. A carriage was to await you at Nice? Precisely so and it conveyed me from Nice to Genoa, from Genoa to Turin, and from Turin to Chambéry, from Chambéry to Pont de Beauvoisin, and from Pont de Beauvoisin to Paris. Indeed, then your father ought to have met with you on the road, for it is exactly the same route which he himself took, and that is how we have been able to trace your journey to this place. But, said Andrea, if my father had met me, I doubt if he would have recognized me. I must be somewhat altered since he last saw me. "'Oh, the voice of nature,' said Monte Cristo. "'True,' interrupted the young man, "'I had not looked upon it in that light.' "'Now,' replied Monte Cristo, "'there is only one source of uneasiness left in your father's mind, which is this. "'He is anxious to know how you have been employed during your long absence from him, "'how you have been treated by your persecutors, "'and if they have conducted themselves towards you with all the deference due to your rank.' Finally, he is anxious to see if you have been fortunate enough to escape the bad moral influence to which you have been exposed, and which is infinitely more to be dreaded than any physical suffering. He wishes to discover if the fine abilities with which nature has endowed you have been weakened by want of culture, and in short whether you consider yourself capable of resuming and retaining in the world the high position to which your rank entitles you. Sir, exclaimed the young man, quite astounded, I hope no false report. As for myself, I first heard you spoken of by my friend Wilmore, the philanthropist. I believe he found you in some unpleasant position, but do not know of what nature, for I did not ask, not being inquisitive. Your misfortunes engaged his sympathies, so you see you must have been interesting. He told me that he was anxious to restore you to the position which you had lost, and that he would seek your father until he found him. He did seek, and has found him, apparently, since he is here now. And, finally, my friend apprised me of your coming and gave me a few other instructions relative to your future fortune. I am quite aware that my friend Wilmore is peculiar, but he is sincere, and as rich as a gold mine. Consequently, he may indulge his eccentricities without any fear of their ruining him, and I have promised to adhere to his instructions. Now, sir, pray do not be offended at the question I am about to put to you, as it comes in the way of my duty as your patron. I would wish to know if the misfortunes which have happened to you— misfortunes entirely beyond your control, and which in no degree diminish my regard for you, 
I would wish to know if they have not, in some measure, contributed to render you a stranger to the world in which your fortune and your name entitle you to make a conspicuous figure. Sir, returned the young man, with a reassurance of manner, make your mind easy on this score. Those who took me from my father, and who always intended, sooner or later, to sell me again to my original proprietor, as they have now done, calculated that, in order to make the most of their bargain, it would be politic to leave me in possession of all my personal and hereditary worth, and even to increase the value if possible. I have therefore received a very good education, and have been treated by those kidnappers very much as the slaves were treated in Asia Minor, whose masters made them grammarians, doctors, and philosophers, in order that they might fetch a higher price on the Roman market. Monte Cristo smiled with satisfaction. It appeared as if he had not expected so much from Monsieur André Cavalcanti. Besides, continued the young man, if there did appear some defect in education, or offence against the established forms of etiquette, I suppose it would be excused in consideration of the misfortunes which accompanied my birth and followed me through my youth. Well, said Monte Cristo in an indifferent tone, you will do as you please, Count, for you are the master of your own actions, and are the person most concerned in the matter. But if I were you, I would not divulge a word of these adventures. Your history is quite a romance, and the world which delights in romances in yellow covers strangely mistrusts those which are bound in living parchment, even though they be gilded like yourself. This is the kind of difficulty which I wish to represent to you, my dear Count. You would hardly have recited your touching history before it would go forth to the world and be deemed unlikely and unnatural. You would be no longer a lost child found, but you would be looked upon as an upstart, who had sprung up like a mushroom in the night. You might excite a little curiosity, but it is not everyone who likes to be made the centre of observation and the subject of unpleasant remark. I agree with you, monsieur, said the young man, turning pale and, in spite of himself, trembling beneath the scrutinising look of his companion. Such consequences would be extremely unpleasant. Nevertheless, you must not exaggerate the evil, said Monte Cristo, for by endeavouring to avoid one fault, you will fall into another. You must resolve upon one simple and single line of conduct, and for a man of your intelligence, this plan is as easy as it is necessary. You must form honourable friendships, and by that means counteract the prejudice which may attach to the obscurity of your former life. Andrea visibly changed countenance. I would offer myself as your surety and friendly adviser, said Monte Cristo, did I not possess a moral distrust of my best friends, and a sort of inclination to lead others to doubt them too. Therefore, in departing from this rule, I should, as the actors say, be playing a part quite out of my line, and should therefore run the risk of being hissed, which would be an act of folly. However, your excellency, said Andrea, in consideration of Lord Wilmore, by whom I was recommended to you— Yes, certainly, interrupted Monte Cristo. But Lord Wilmore did not admit to inform me, my dear Monsieur André, that the season of your youth was rather a stormy one. Ah, said the Count, watching Andrea's countenance, I do not demand any confession from you. It is precisely to avoid that necessity that your father was sent for from Lucca. You shall soon see him. He is a little stiff and pompous in his manner, and he is disfigured by his uniform, but when it becomes known that he has been for eighteen years in the Austrian service, all that will be pardoned. We are not generally very severe with the Austrians. In short, you will find your father a very presentable person, I assure you. Ah, sir, you have given me confidence. It is so long since we were separated that I have not the least remembrance of him. And besides, you know that, in the eyes of the world, a large fortune covers all defects. He is a millionaire. His income is five hundred thousand francs. Then, said the young man with anxiety, I shall be sure to be placed in an agreeable position. One of the most agreeable possible, my dear sir. He will allow you an income of fifty thousand livres per annum during the whole time of your stay in Paris. Then in that case I shall always choose to remain there. You cannot control circumstances, my dear sir. Man proposes, and God disposes. Andrea sighed. But, said he, so long as I do remain in Paris, and nothing forces me to quit it, do you mean to tell me that I may rely on receiving the sum you just now mentioned to me? You may. Shall I receive it from my father? asked André, with some uneasiness. Yes, you will receive it from your father personally, but Lord Wilmore will be the security for the money. He has, at the request of your father, opened an account of six thousand francs a month at Monsieur Danglars, 
which is one of the safest banks in Paris. "'And does my father mean to remain long in Paris?' asked Andrea. "'Only a few days,' replied Monte Cristo. "'His service does not allow him to absent himself more than two or three weeks together.' "'Ah, oh, my dear father!' exclaimed Andrea, evidently charmed with the idea of his speedy departure. "'Therefore,' said Monte Cristo, feigning to mistake his meaning, "'therefore I will not for another instant retard the pleasure of your meeting. Are you prepared to embrace your worthy father?' "'I hope you do not doubt it. Go then into the drawing-room, my young friend, where you will find your father awaiting you.' Andrea made a low bow to the Count and entered the adjoining room. Monte Cristo watched him till he disappeared, and then touched a spring in a panel made to look like a picture, which, in sliding partly from the frame, discovered to view a small opening, so cleverly contrived that it revealed all that was passing in the drawing-room, now occupied by Cavalcanti and Andrea. The young man closed the door behind him and advanced towards the major, who had risen when he heard steps approaching him. "'Ah, my dear father!' said André, in a loud voice, in order that the Count might hear him in the next room. "'Is it really you?' "'How do you do, my dear son?' said the major gravely. "'After so many years of painful separation,' said André, in the same tone of voice, and glancing towards the door, "'what a happiness it is to meet again!' "'Indeed it is, after so long a separation.' "'Will you not embrace me, sir?' said André. "'If you wish it, my son,' said the Major, and the two men embraced each other after the fashion of actors on the stage, that is to say, each rested his head on the other's shoulder. "'Then we are once more reunited,' said André. "'Once more,' replied the Major. "'Never more to be separated?' "'Why, as to that, I think, my dear son, you must be by this time so accustomed to France as to look upon it almost as a second country.' "'The fact is,' said the young man, "'that I should be exceedingly grieved to leave it. "'As for me, you must know I cannot possibly live out of Lucca. "'Therefore I shall return to Italy as soon as I can. "'But before you leave France, my dear father, "'I hope you will put me in possession of the documents "'which will be necessary to prove my descent.' "'Certainly. I am come expressly on that account. It has cost me much trouble to find you, but I had resolved on giving them into your hands, and, if I had to recommence my search, it would occupy all the few remaining years of my life. "'Where are these papers, then?' "'Here they are.' André seized the certificate of his father's marriage and his own baptismal register, and after having opened them with all the eagerness which might be expected under the circumstances, he read them with a facility which proved that he was accustomed to similar documents, and with an expression which plainly denoted an unusual interest in the contents. When he had perused the documents, an indefinable expression of pleasure lightened up his countenance, and, looking at the Major with a most peculiar smile, he said in very excellent Tuscan, "'Then there is no longer any such thing in Italy as being condemned to the galleys?' The Major drew himself up to his full height. "'Why, what do you mean by that question?' I mean that if there were, it would be impossible to draw up with impunity two such deeds as these. In France, my dear sir, half such a piece of effrontery as that would cause you to be quickly dispatched to Toulon for five years for change of air. "'Will you be good enough to explain your meaning?' said the Major, endeavouring as much as possible to assume an air of the greatest majesty. "'My dear Monsieur Cavalcanti,' said André, taking the Major by the arm in a confidential manner, "'How much are you paid for being my father?' The Major was about to speak when André continued in a low voice. "'Nonsense. I am going to set you an example of confidence. They give me fifty thousand francs a year to be your son. Consequently, you can understand that it is not at all likely I shall ever deny my parent.' The Major looked anxiously around him. "'Make yourself easy. We are quite alone,' said André. "'Besides, we are conversing in Italian.' "'Well, then,' replied the Major." They paid me fifty thousand francs down. Monsieur Cavalcanti, said André, do you believe in fairy tales? I used not to do so, but I really feel now almost obliged to have faith in them. You have then been induced to alter your opinion. You have had some proofs of their truth? The Major drew from his pocket a handful of gold. Most palpable proofs, said he, as you may perceive. You think, then, that I may rely on the Count's promises? "'Certainly I do. You are sure he will keep his word with me?' "'To the letter, but at the same time, remember, we must continue to play our respective parts. I, as a tender father, 
and I as a dutiful son, as they choose that I shall be descended from you. Whom do you mean by they? Ma foi, I can hardly tell, but I was alluding to those who wrote the letter. You received one, did you not? Yes. From whom? From a certain Abbe Busoni. Have you any knowledge of him? No, I have never seen him. What did he say in the letter? You will promise not to betray me. Rest assured of that. You well know that our interests are the same. Then read for yourself. And the major gave a letter into the young man's hand. André read in a low voice. You are poor. A miserable old age awaits you. Would you like to become rich, or at least independent? Set out immediately for Paris and demand of the Count of Monte Cristo, Avenue des Champs-Élysées, number 30, the son whom you had by the Marchesa Corsinari, and who was taken from you at five years of age. This son is named André Cavalcanti. In order that you may not doubt the kind intention of the writer of this letter, you will find enclosed an order for 2,400 francs, payable in Florence, at Signor Gozzi's. Also a letter of introduction to the Count of Monte Cristo, on whom I give you a draft of 48,000 francs. Remember to go to the Count on the 26th of May, at 7 o'clock in the evening. Signed, Abbe Busoni. It is the same. What do you mean? said the Major. I was going to say that I received a letter almost to the same effect. You? Yes. From the Abbe Busoni? No. From whom, then? From an Englishman called Lord Wilmore, who takes the name of Sinbad the Sailor, and of whom you have no more knowledge than I of the Abbe Busoni. You are mistaken. There I am ahead of you. You have seen him, then? Yes, once. Where? Ah, that is just what I cannot tell you. If I did, I should make you as wise as myself, which it is not my intention to do. And what did the letter contain? Read it. You are poor, and your future prospects are dark and gloomy. Do you wish for a name, should you like to be rich and your own master? Ma foi, said the young man, was it possible there could be two answers to such a question? Take the post chairs which you will find waiting at the Porte de Gênes as you enter Nice. Pass through Turin, Chambry, and Pont de Beauvoisin. Go to the Count of Monte Cristo, Avenue des Champs-Élysées, on the 26th of May, at seven o'clock in the evening, and demand of him your father. You are the son of the Marchese Cavalcanti and the Marchesa Oliva Corsinari. The Marquis will give you some papers which will certify this fact and authorize you to appear under that name in the Parisian world. As to your rank, an annual income of 50,000 livres will enable you to support it admirably. I enclose a draft for 5,000 livres, payable on Monsieur Ferrier, banker at Nice, and also a letter of introduction to the Count of Monte Cristo, whom I have directed to supply all your wants. Sinbad the Sailor. Humph, said the Major, very good. You have seen the Count, you say? I have only just left him. And has he conformed to all that the letter specified? He has. Do you understand it? Not in the least. There is a dupe somewhere. At all events, it is neither you nor I. Certainly not. Well, then. Why, it does not much concern us. Do you think that it does? No, I agree with you there. We must play the game to the end, and consent to be blindfold. Ah, you shall see. I promise you I will sustain my part to admiration. I never once doubted your doing so. Monte Cristo chose this moment for re-entering the drawing-room. On hearing the sound of his footsteps, the two men threw themselves in each other's arms, and while they were in the midst of this embrace, the Count entered. "'Well, Marquis,' said Monte Cristo, "'you appear to be in no way disappointed in the son whom your good fortune has restored to you. "'Ah, Your Excellency, I am overwhelmed with delight.' "'And what are your feelings?' said Monte Cristo, turning to the young man." As for me, my heart is overflowing with happiness. Happy father, happy son, said the Count. There is only one thing which grieves me, observed the Major, and that is the necessity for my leaving Paris so soon. Ah, my dear Monsieur Cavalcanti, I trust you will not leave before I have had the honour of presenting you to some of my friends. I am at your service, sir, replied the Major. Now, sir, said Monte Cristo, addressing André, make your confession. To whom? Tell Monsieur Cavalcanti something of the state of your finances. Ma foi, monsieur, you have touched upon a tender cord. Do you hear what he says, Major? Certainly I do. But do you understand? I do. Your son says he requires money. 
"'Well, what would you have me do?' said the Major. "'You should furnish him with some, of course,' replied Monte Cristo. "'I?' "'Yes, you,' said the Count, at the same time advancing towards André and slipping a packet of banknotes into the young man's hand. "'What is this?' "'It is from your father.' "'From my father?' "'Yes. Did you not tell him just now that you wanted money? "'Well, then, he deputes me to give you this.' "'Am I to consider this as part of my income on account?' "'No, it is for the first expenses of your settling in Paris.' "'Ah, how good my dear father is!' "'Silence,' said Monte Cristo. "'He does not wish you to know that it comes from him.' "'I fully appreciate his delicacy,' said André, "'cramming the notes hastily into his pocket. "'And now, gentlemen, I wish you good morning,' said Monte Cristo. "'And when may we have the honour of seeing you again, Your Excellency?' asked Cavalcanti. Ah, said André, when may we hope for that pleasure? On Saturday, if you will. Yes, let me see. Saturday. I am to dine at my country house at Auteuil on that day, Rue de la Fontaine, number 28. Several persons are invited, and, among others, Monsieur Danglars, your banker. I will introduce you to him, for it will be necessary he should know you, as he is to pay your money. "'Full dress?' said the Major, half aloud. "'Oh, yes, certainly,' said the Count. "'Uniform, cross, knee-breeches. "'And how shall I be dressed?' demanded André. "'Oh, very simply. "'Black trousers, patent leather boots, white waistcoat, "'either a black or blue coat, and a long cravat. "'Go to Blin or Véronique for your clothes. "'Baptistin will tell you where, if you do not know their address. "'The less pretension there is in your attire, "'the better will be the effect, as you are a rich man.' If you mean to buy any horses, get them at Devedot, and if you purchase a phaeton, go to Paptiste for it. At what hour shall we come? asked the young man. About half past six. We will be with you at that time, said the major. The two Cavalcanti bowed to the count and left the house. Monte Cristo went to the window and saw them crossing the street arm in arm. There go two miscreants, said he. It is a pity they are not really related. Then, after an instant of gloomy reflection, "'Come, I will go to see the morals,' said he. "'I think that disgust is even more sickening than hatred.'" End of chapter 56「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by George Coots, August 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 57 In the Lucerne Patch. Our readers must now allow us to transport them again to the enclosure surrounding M. de Villefort's house, and behind the gate, half screened from view by the large chestnut trees, which on all sides spread their luxuriant branches, we shall find some people of our acquaintance. This time Maximilian was the first to arrive. He was intently watching for a shadow to appear among the trees, and awaiting with anxiety the sound of a light step on the gravel walk. At length, the long-desired sound was heard, and instead of one figure, as he had expected, he perceived that two were approaching him. The delay had been occasioned by a visit from Madame d'Anglaire and Eugénie, which had been prolonged beyond the time at which Valentine was expected. That she might not appear to fail in her promise to Maximilian, she proposed to Mademoiselle d'Anglaire that they should take a walk in the garden, being anxious to show that the delay, which was doubtless a cause of vexation to him, was not occasioned by any neglect on her part. The young man, with the intuitive perception of a lover, quickly understood the circumstances in which she was involuntarily placed, and he was comforted. Besides, although she avoided coming within speaking distance, Valentine arranged so that Maximilian could see her pass and repass, and each time she went by, she managed, unperceived by her companion, to cast an expressive look at the young man, which seemed to say, Have patience. You see it is not my fault. And Maximilian was patient, and employed himself in mentally contrasting the two girls, 
one fair with soft languishing eyes a figure gracefully bending like a weeping willow the other a brunette with a fierce and haughty expression and as straight as a poplar it is unnecessary to state that in the eyes of the young man valentine did not suffer by the contrast in about half an hour the girls went away and maximilian understood that mademoiselle d'anglaire's visit had at last come to an end in a few minutes valentine re-entered the garden alone for fear that any one should be observing her return she walked slowly and instead of immediately directing her steps towards the gate she seated herself on a bench and carefully casting her eyes around to convince herself that she was not watched she presently arose and proceeded quickly to join maximilian good evening valentine said a well-known voice good evening maximilian i know i have kept you waiting but you saw the cause of my delay yes i recognized mademoiselle d'anglaire i was not aware that you were so intimate with her who told you we were intimate maximilian no one but you appeared to be so from the manner in which you walked and talked together one would have thought you were two schoolgirls telling your secrets to each other we were having a confidential conversation returned valentine she was owning to me her repugnance to the marriage with m de morcerf and i on the other hand was confessing to her how wretched it made me to think of marrying m de Penay. dear valentine that will account to you for the unreserved manner which you observed between me and eugenie as in speaking of the man whom i could not love my thoughts involuntarily reverted to him on whom my affections were fixed ah how good you are to say so valentine you possess a quality which can never belong to mademoiselle d'anglaire it is that indefinable charm which is to a woman what perfume is to the flower and flavor to the fruit for the beauty of either is not the only quality we seek it is your love which makes you look upon everything in that light no valentine i assure you such is not the case i was observing you both when you were walking in the garden and on my honor, without at all wishing to deprecate the beauty of Mademoiselle d'Anglaire, I cannot understand how any man can really love her. The fact is, Maximilian, that I was there, and my presence had the effect of rendering you unjust in your comparison. No, but tell me. It is a question of simple curiosity, and which was suggested by certain ideas passing in my mind relative to Mademoiselle d'Anglaire's I dare say it is something disparaging which you are going to say. It only proves how little indulgence we may expect from your sex, interrupted Valentine. You cannot at least deny that you are very harsh judges of each other. If we are so, it is because we generally judge under the influence of excitement. But return to your question. Does Mademoiselle d'Anglaire object to this marriage with M. de Morcerf on account of loving another? I told you I was not on terms of strict intimacy with Eugenie. Yes, but girls tell each other secrets without being particularly intimate. Own now that you did question her on the subject. Ah, I see you are smiling. If you were already aware of the conversation that passed, the wooden partition which interposed between us and you has proved but a slight security. Come, what did she say? She told me that she loved no one, said Valentine that she disliked the idea of being married, that she would infinitely prefer leading an independent and unfettered life, and that she almost wished her father might lose his fortune, that she might become an artist, like her friend, Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly. Ah, you see. Well, what does that prove? asked Valentine. Nothing, replied Maximilian. Then why did you smile? Why, you know very well that you are reflecting on yourself, Valentine. You want me to go away? Ah, no, no. But do not let us lose time. You are the subject on which I wish to speak. True, we must be quick, for we have scarcely ten minutes more to pass together. Ma foi, said Maximilian in consternation. Yes, you are right. I am but a poor friend to you. What a life I cause you to lead, poor Maximilian, you who are formed for happiness. I bitterly reproach myself, I assure you. Well, what does it signify, Valentine, so long as I am satisfied, and feel that even this long and painful suspense is amply repaid by five minutes of your society, or two words from your lips? 
and I have also a deep conviction that heaven would not have created two hearts, harmonizing as ours do, and almost miraculously brought us together to separate us at last. Those are kind and cheering words. You must hope for us both, Maximilian, that you will make me at least partly happy. But why must you leave me so soon? I do not know the particulars. I can only tell you that Madame de Villefort sent to request my presence, as she had a communication to make on which a part of my fortune depended. Let them take my fortune. I am already too rich. And perhaps when they have taken it, they will leave me in peace and quietness. You would love me as much if I were poor, would you not, Maximilian? Oh, I shall always love you. What should I care for either riches or poverty if my valentine was near me, and I felt certain that no one could deprive me of her? But do you not fear that this communication may relate to your marriage? I do not think that is the case. However it may be, Valentine, you must not be alarmed. I assure you that as long as I live, I shall never love anyone else. You think to reassure me when you say that, Maximilian. Pardon me, you are right. I am a brute. But I was going to tell you that I met M. de Morcerf the other day. Well? Monsieur Franz is his friend, you know. What then? Monsieur de Morcerf has received a letter from Franz announcing his immediate return. Valentine turned pale and leaned her hand against the gate. Ah, heavens, if I thought it were that. But no, the communication would not come through Madame de Villefort. Why not? Because, I scarcely know why, but it has appeared as if Madame de Villefort secretly objected to the marriage, although she did not choose openly to oppose it. Is it so? Then I feel as if I could adore Madame de Villefort. Do not be in such a hurry to do that, said Valentine, with a sad smile. If she objects to your marrying M. de Penet, she would be all the more likely to listen to any other proposition. No, Maximilian. It is not suitors to which Madame de Villefort objects. It is marriage itself. Marriage? If she dislikes that so much, why did she ever marry herself? You do not understand me, Maximilian. About a year ago I talked of retiring to a convent. Madame de Villefort, in spite of all the remarks which she considered it her duty to make, secretly approved of the proposition. My father consented to it at her instigation and it was only on account of my poor grandfather that I finally abandoned the project. You can form no idea of the expression of the old man's eye when he looks at me, the only person in the world whom he loves, and, I had almost said, by whom he is beloved in return. When he learned my resolution, I shall never forget the reproachful look which he cast on me, and the tears of utter despair which chased each other down his lifeless cheeks. Uh, Maximilian, I experienced at that moment such remorse for my intention, that throwing myself at his feet I exclaimed, Forgive me, pray forgive me, my dear grandfather. They may do what they will with me. I will never leave you. When I had ceased speaking, he thankfully raised his eyes to heaven, but without uttering a word. Uh, Maximilian, I may have much to suffer, but I feel as if my grandfather's look at that moment could more than compensate for all. Dear Valentine, you are a perfect angel, and I am sure I do not know what I, sabering right and left among the Bedouins, can have done to a merit your being revealed to me, unless, indeed, heaven took into consideration the fact that the victims of my sword were infidels. But tell me what interest Madame de Villefort can have in your remaining unmarried. Did I not tell you just now that I was rich, Maximilian? Too rich? I possess nearly fifty thousand livres in right of my mother. My grandfather and my grandmother, the Marquis and Marquise de saint Morin, will leave me as much, and M. Nortier evidently intends to make me his heir. My brother Edward, who inherits nothing from his mother, will therefore be poor in comparison with me. Now if I had taken the veil, all this fortune would have descended to my father, and in reversion to his son. Ah, how strange it seems that such a young and beautiful woman should be so avaricious. It is not for herself that she is so, but for her son. And what you regard as vice becomes almost a virtue when looked at in the light of maternal love. But could you not compromise matters and give up a portion of your fortune to her son? How could I make such a proposition, 
especially to a woman who always professes to be so entirely disinterested. Valentine, I have always regarded our love the light of something sacred. Consequently, I have covered it with a veil of respect and hid it in the innermost recesses of my soul. No human being, not even my sister, is aware of its existence. Valentine, will you permit me to make a confidant of a friend and reveal to him the love I bear you? Valentine started. A friend, Maximilian? And who is this friend? I tremble to give my permission. Listen, Valentine, have you never experienced for any one that sudden and irresistible sympathy which made you feel as if the object of it had been your old and familiar friend, though in reality it was the first time you had ever met? Nay, further, have you never endeavored to recall the time, place, and circumstances of your former intercourse, and failing in this attempt, have almost believed that your spirits must have held converse with each other in some state of being anterior to the present? and that you are only now occupied in a reminiscence of the past? Yes. Well, that is precisely the feeling which I experienced when I first saw that extraordinary man. Extraordinary, did you say? Yes. You have known him for some time, then. Scarcely longer than eight or ten days. And do you call a man your friend whom you have only known for eight or ten days? Ah, oh, Maximilian, I had hoped you set a higher value on the title of friend. Your logic is most powerful, Valentine, but say what you will, I can never renounce the sentiment which has instinctively taken possession of my mind. I feel as if it were ordained that this man should be associated with all the good which the future may have in store for me, and sometimes it really seems as if his eye was able to see what was to come, and his hand endowed with the power of directing events according to his own will. He must be a prophet then, said Valentine, smiling. Indeed, said Maximilian, I have often been almost tempted to attribute to him the gift of prophecy, for at all events he has a wonderful power of foretelling any future good. Ah, said Valentine in a mournful tone, do let me see this man, Maximilian. He may tell me whether I shall ever be loved sufficiently to make amends for all that I have suffered. My poor girl, you know him already. I know him? Yes, it was he who saved the life of your stepmother and her son. The Count of Monte Cristo, The same. Ah, cried Valentine, he is too much the friend of Madame de Villefort ever to be mine. The friend of Madame de Villefort? It cannot be. Surely, Valentine, you are mistaken. No, indeed, I am not, for I assure you, his power over our household is almost unlimited. Courted by my stepmother, who regards him as the epitome of human wisdom, admired by my father, who says he has never before heard such sublime ideas so eloquently expressed, idolized by Edward, who notwithstanding his fear of the Count's large black eyes, runs to meet him the moment he arrives, and opens his hand, in which he is sure to find some delightful present. M. de Monte Cristo appears to exert a mysterious and almost uncontrollable influence over all the members of our family. If such be the case, my dear Valentine, you must yourself have felt, or at all events will soon feel, the effects of his presence. He meets Albert de Morcerf in Italy. It is to rescue him from the hands of the banditti. He introduces himself to Madame d'Angler. It is that he may give her a royal present. Your stepmother and her son pass before his door. It is that his Nubian may save them from destruction. This man evidently possesses the power of influencing events both as regards men and things. I never saw more simple tastes united to greater magnificence. His smile is so sweet when he addresses me that I forget it can ever be bitter to others. Ah, Valentine, tell me, if he ever looked upon you with one of those sweet smiles? If so, depend on it. You will be happy. Me, said the young girl, he never even glances at me. On the contrary, if I accidentally cross his path, he appears rather to avoid me. Well, he is not generous, neither does he possess that supernatural penetration which you attribute to him. For if he did, he would have perceived that I was unhappy. And if he had been generous, seeing me sad and solitary, he would have used his influence to my advantage. And since, as you say, he resembles the sun, he would have warmed my heart with one of his life-giving rays. You say he loves you, Maximilian. How do you know that he does? 
All would pay deference to an officer like you, with a fierce mustache and a long saber. But they think they may crush a poor weeping girl with impunity. Ah, Valentine, I assure you, you are mistaken. If it were otherwise, if he treated me diplomatically, that is to say, like a man who wishes by some means or other to obtain a footing in the house, so that he may ultimately gain the power of dictating to its occupants, he would, if it had been but once, have honored me with a smile which you extol so loudly. But no, he saw that I was unhappy, he understood that I could be of no use to him, and therefore paid no attention to me whatever. Who knows but that in order to please Madame de Villefort and my father, he may not persecute me by every means in his power. It is not just that he should despise me so, without any reason. Ah, forgive me, said Valentine, perceiving the effect which her words were, were producing on Maximilian. I have done wrong, for I have given utterance to thoughts concerning that man which I did not even know existed in my heart. I do not deny the influence of which you speak, or that I have not myself experienced it, but with me it has been productive of evil rather than good. Well, Valentine, said Morel with a sigh, we will not discuss the matter further. I will not make a confidant of him. Alas, said Valentine, I see that I have given you pain. I can only say how sincerely I ask pardon for having griefed you. But indeed, I am not prejudiced beyond the power of conviction. Tell me what this Count of Monte Cristo has done for you. I own that your question embarrasses me, Valentine, for I cannot say that the Count has rendered me any ostensible service. Still, as I have already told you, I have an instinctive affection for him, the source of which I cannot explain to you. Has the sun done anything for me? No. He warms me with his rays, and it is by his light that I see you, nothing more. Has such and such a perfume done anything for me? No. Its odor charms one of my senses. That is all I can say when I am asked why I praise it. My friendship for him is as strange and unaccountable as his for me. A secret voice seems to whisper to me that there must be something more than chance in this unexpected reciprocity of friendship. In his most simple actions, as well as in his most secret thoughts, I find a relation to my own. You will perhaps smile at me when I tell you that, ever since I have known this man, I have involuntarily entertained the idea that all the good fortune which has befallen me originated from him. However, I have managed to live thirty years without this protection, you will say, but I will endeavor a little to illustrate my meaning. He invited me to dine with him on Saturday, which was a very natural thing for him to do. Well, what have I learned since? That your mother and M. de Villefort are both coming to this dinner. I shall meet them there, and who knows what future advantages may result from the interview. This may appear to you to be no unusual combination of circumstances. Nevertheless, I perceive some hidden plot in the arrangement. Something, in fact, more than is apparent on a casual view of the subject. I believe that this singular man, who appears to fathom the motives of everyone, has purposely arranged for me to meet M. and Madame de Villefort, and sometimes, I confess, I have gone so far as to try to read in his eyes whether he was in possession of the secret of our love. My good friend, said Valentine, I should take you for a visionary, and should tremble for your reason, if I were always to hear you talk in a strain similar to this. Is it possible that you can see anything more than the merest chance in this meeting? Pray reflect a little. My father, who never goes out, has several times been on the point of refusing this invitation. Madame de Villefort, on the contrary, is burning with the desire of seeing this extraordinary nabob in his own house. Therefore she has with great difficulty prevailed on my father to accompany her. No, no, it is as I have said, Maximilian. There is no one in the world of whom I can ask help but yourself and my grandfather, who is little better than a corpse. I see you are right, logically oh. speaking, said Maximilian, but the gentle voice which usually has such power over me fails to convince me today. I feel the same as regards yourself, said Valentine, and I own that if you have no stronger proof to give me. I have another, replied Maximilian but I fear you will deem it even more absurd than the first. So much the worse, said Valentine, smiling. It is, nevertheless, conclusive to my mind. 
My ten years of service have also confirmed my ideas on the subject of sudden inspirations, for I have several times owed my life to a mysterious impulse which directed me to move at once either to the right or to the left, in order to escape the ball which killed the comrade fighting by my side, while it left me unharmed. Dear Maximilian, why not attribute your escape to my constant prayers for your safety? When you are away, I no longer pray for myself, but for you. Yes, since you have known me, said Morel, smiling, but that cannot apply to the time previous to our acquaintance, Valentine. You are very provoking, and will not give me credit for anything, but let me hear this second proof which you yourself own to be absurd. Well, look through this opening, and you will see the beautiful new horse which I rode here. Ah, what a beautiful creature, cried Valentine. Why did you not bring him close to the gate so that I could talk to him and pat him? He is, as you see, a very valuable animal, said Maximilian. You know that my means are limited, and that I am what would be designated a man of moderate pretensions. Well, I went to a horse dealer's, where I saw this magnificent horse, which I have named Medea. I asked the price. They told me it was 4,500 francs. I was therefore obliged to give it up, as you may imagine, but I own I went away with rather a heavy heart, for the horse had looked at me affectionately had rubbed his head against me, and, when I mounted him, had pranced in the most delightful way imaginable, so that I was altogether fascinated with him. The same evening some friends of mine visited me, M. de Chateau Renaud, M. de Bray, and five or six other choice spirits whom you do not know, even by name. They proposed a game of boudillot. I never play, for I am not rich enough to afford to lose, or sufficiently poor to desire to gain. But I was at my own house, you understand, so there was nothing to be done but to send for the cards, which I did. Just as they were sitting down to table, M. de Monte Cristo arrived. He took his seat amongst them. They played, and I won. I am almost ashamed to say that my gains amounted to five thousand francs. We separated at midnight. I could not defer my pleasure, so I took a cabriolet and drove to the horse dealers. Feverish and excited, I rang at the door. The person who opened it must have taken me for a madman, for I rushed at once to the stable. Medea was standing at the rack, eating his hay. I immediately put on the saddle and the bridle, to which operation he lent himself with the best grace possible. Then putting the forty-five hundred francs into the hands of the astonished dealer, I proceeded to fulfill my intention of passing the night and riding on the Champs-Élysées. As I rode by the Count's house, I perceived a light in one of the windows and fancied I saw the shadow of its figure moving behind the curtain. Now, Valentine, I firmly believe that he knew of my wish to possess this horse, and that he lost expressly to give me the means of procuring him. My dear Maximilian, you are really too fanciful. You will not love even me long. A man who accustoms himself to live in such a world of poetry and imagination must find far too little excitement in a common everyday sort of attachment such as ours. But they are calling me, do you hear? Ah, Valentine, said Maximilian, give me but one finger through this opening in the grating, one finger, the littlest finger of all, that I may have the happiness of kissing it. Maximilian, we said we would be to each other as two voices, two shadows. As you will, Valentine. Shall you be happy if I do what you wish? Oh, yes. Valentine mounted on the bench and passed not only her finger, but her whole hand through the opening. Maximilian uttered a cry of delight, and springing forwards, seized the hand extended towards him, and imprinted on it a fervent and impassioned kiss. The little hand was then immediately withdrawn, and the young man saw Valentine hurrying towards the house, as though she were almost terrified at her own sensations. End of chapter 57「
We will now relate what was passing in the house of the king's attorney after the departure of Madame Danglars and her daughter, and during the time of the conversation between Maximilian and Valentine, which we have just detailed, Monsieur de Villefort entered his father's room, followed by Madame de Villefort. Both of the visitors, after saluting the old man and speaking to Barras, a faithful servant who had been twenty-five years in his service, took their places on either side of the paralytic. Monsieur Nautier was sitting in an armchair, which moved upon casters, in which he was wheeled into the room in the morning and in the same way drawn out again at night. He was placed before a large glass, which reflected the whole apartment, and so, without any attempt to move, which would have been impossible. He could see all who entered the room and everything which was going on around him. Monsieur Nautier, although almost as immovable as a corpse, looked at the newcomers with a quick and intelligent expression, perceiving at once by their ceremonious courtesy that they were come on business of an unexpected and official character. Sight and hearing were the only senses remaining, and they, like two solitary sparks, remained to animate the miserable body which seemed fit for nothing but the grave. It was only, however, by means of one of these senses that he could reveal the thoughts and feelings that still occupied his mind, and the look by which he gave expression to his inner life was like the distant gleam of a candle which a traveller sees by night across some desert place, and knows that a living being dwells beyond the silence and obscurity. Nautia's hair was long and white, and flowed over his shoulders, while in his eyes, shaded by thick black lashes, was concentrated, as it often happens with an organ which is used to the exclusion of the others. All the activity, address, force, and intelligence which were formerly diffused over his whole body, and so, although the movement of the arm, the sound of his voice, and the agility of the body were wanting, the speaking eye sufficed for all. He commanded with it. It was the medium through which his thanks were conveyed. In short, his whole appearance produced on the mind the impression of a corpse with living eyes, and nothing could be more startling than to observe the expression of anger or joy suddenly lighting up these organs, while the rest of the rigid and marble-like features were utterly deprived of the power of participation. Three persons only could understand this language of the poor paralytic, these were Villefort, Valentine, and the old servant of whom we have already spoken. But as Villefort saw his father but seldom, and then only when absolutely obliged, and as he never took any pains to please or gratify him when he was there, all the old man's happiness was centred in his granddaughter. Valentine, by means of her love, her patience, and her devotion, had learned to read in Nautia's look all the varied feelings which were passing in his mind. To this dumb language, which was so unintelligible to others, she answered by throwing her whole soul into the expression of her countenance, and in this manner were the conversations sustained between the blooming girl and the helpless invalid whose body could scarcely be called a living one, but who, nevertheless, possessed a fund of knowledge and penetration, united with a will as powerful as ever, although clogged by a body rendered utterly incapable of obeying its impulses. Valentine had solved the problem, and was able easily to understand his thoughts and to convey her own in return, and, 
Through her untiring and devoted assiduity, it was seldom that. In the ordinary transactions of everyday life, she failed to anticipate the wishes of the living, thinking mind, or the wants of the almost inanimate body. As to the servant, he had, as we have said, been with his master for five and twenty years. Therefore he knew all his habits, and it was seldom that Nautier found it necessary to ask for anything. So prompt was he in administering to all the necessities of the invalid. Villefort did not need the help of either Valentine or the domestic in order to carry on with his father the strange conversation which he was about to begin. As we have said, he perfectly understood the old man's vocabulary, and if he did not use it more often, it was only indifference and ennui which prevented him from doing. He therefore allowed Valentine to go into the garden, sent away Barris, and after having seated himself at his father's right hand, while Madame de Villeport placed herself on the left, he addressed him thus. I trust you will not be displeased, sir, that Valentine has not come with us, or that I dismissed Barris, for our conference will be one which could not with propriety be carried on in the presence of either. Madame de Villefort and I have a communication to make to you. Nautier's face remained perfectly passive during this long preamble while, on the contrary, Villefort's eye was endeavouring to penetrate into the inmost recess of the old man's heart. This communication continued the procurer, in that cold and decisive tone which seemed at once to preclude all discussion. Will, we are sure, meet with your approbation. The eye of the invalid still retained that vacancy of expression which prevented his son from obtaining any knowledge of the feelings which were passing in his mind. He listened, nothing more. Sir, resumed Villefort, we are thinking of marrying Valentine. Had the old man's face been moulded in wax, it could not have shown less emotion at this news than was now to be traced there. The marriage will take place in less than three months, said Villefort. Nautier's eye still retained its intimate expression. Madame de Villefort now took her part in the conversation and added, We thought this news would possess an interest for you, sir, who have always entertained a great affection for Valentine. It therefore only now remains for us to tell you the name of the young man for whom she is destined. It is one of the most desirable connections which could possibly be formed. He possesses fortune, a high rank in society, and every personal qualification likely to render Valentine supremely happy. His name, moreover, cannot be wholly unknown to you. It is Monsieur Frank de Quinzel, Baron d'Epinay. While his wife was speaking, Villefort had narrowly watched the old man's countenance. When Madame de Villefort pronounced the name of France, the pupil of Monsieur Nautier's eye began to dilate, and his eyelids trembled with the same movement that may be perceived on the lips of an individual about to speak, and he darted a lightning glance at Madame de Villefort and his son. The procureur, who knew the political hatred which had formerly existed between Monsieur Nautier and the elder d'Epinay, well understood the agitation and anger which the announcement had produced. But, feigning not to perceive either, he immediately resumed the narrative begun by his wife. Sir, said he, 
You are aware that Valentine is about to enter her nineteenth year, which renders it important that she should lose no time in forming a suitable alliance. Nevertheless, you have not been forgotten in our plans, and we have fully ascertained beforehand that Valentine's future husband will consent not to live in this house, for that might not be pleasant for the young people, but that you should live with them, so that you and Valentine, who are so attached to each other, would not be separated, and you would be able to pursue exactly the same course of life which you have hitherto done, and thus, instead of losing, you will be a gainer by the change as it will secure to you two children, instead of one, to watch over and comfort you. Nortia's look was furious. It was very evident that something desperate was passing in the old man's mind, for a cry of anger and grief rose in his throat, and not being able to find vent in utterance, appeared almost to choke him, for his face and lips turned quite purple with the struggle. Villefort quietly opened a window, saying, It is very warm, and the heat affects Monsieur Nautier. He then returned to his place, but did not sit down. This marriage, added Madame de Villefort, is quite agreeable to the wishes of Monsieur de Epinay and his family. Besides, he had no relations nearer than an uncle and aunt, his mother having died at his birth, and his father having been assassinated in 1815, that is to say, when he was but two years old. It was naturally followed that the child was permitted to choose his own pursuits, and he has, therefore, seldom acknowledged any other authority but that of his own will. That assassination was a mysterious affair, said Villefort, and the perpetrators have hitherto escaped detection. Although suspicion has fallen on the head of more than one person, Nautier made such an effort that his lips expanded into a smile. Now, continued Villefort, those to whom the guilt really belongs, by whom the crime was committed, on whose heads the justice of man may probably descend here, and the certain judgment of God hereafter, would rejoice in the opportunity thus afforded of bestowing such a peace offering as Valentine on the son of him whose life they so ruthlessly destroyed. Nautier had succeeded in mastering his emotion more than could have been deemed possible with such an enfeebled and shattered frame. Yes, I understand, was the reply contained in his look, and this look expressed a feeling of strong indignation, mixed with profound contempt. Villefort fully understood his father's meaning and answered by a slight shrug of his shoulders. He then motioned to his wife to take leave. Now, sir, said Madame de Villefort, I must bid you farewell. Would you like me to send Edward to you for a short time? It had been agreed that the old man should express his approbation by closing his eyes, his refusal by winking them several times and if he had some desire or feeling to express, he raised them to heaven. If he wanted Valentine, he closed his right eye only, and if Barras, the left. At Madame de Villefort's proposition, he instantly winked his eyes. Provoked by a complete refusal, she bit her lip and said, Then shall I send Valentine to you? The old man closed his eyes eagerly, thereby intimating that such was his wish. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort bowed and left the room, giving orders that Valentine should be summoned to her grandfather's presence, 
and feeling sure that she would have much to do to restore calmness to the perturbed spirit of the invalid. Valentine, with a colour still heightened by the emotion, entered the room just after her parents had quitted it. One look was sufficient to tell her that her grandfather was suffering, and that there was much on his mind which he was wishing to communicate to her. "'Dear Grandpapa,' cried she, "'what has happened? They have vexed you, and you are angry.' The paralytic closed his eyes, in token of assent. "'Who has displeased you? Is it my father?' "'No. Madame de Villefort? No. Me?' The former sign was repeated. "'Are you displeased with me?' cried Valentine, in astonishment. Monsieur Nautier again closed his eyes. And what have I done, dear Grandpapa, that you should be angry with me? cried Valentine. There was no answer, and she continued, I have not seen you all day. Has anyone been speaking to you against me? Yes, said the old man's look, with eagerness. Let me think a moment. I do assure you, Grandpapa, ah, Monsieur and Madame de Villefort have just left this room, have they not? Yes. And it was they who told you something which made you angry? What was it then? May I go and ask them, that I may have the opportunity of making my peace with you? No, no, said Nautier's look. Ah, you frighten me. What can they have said? And she again tried to think what it could be. Ah, I know, said she, lowering her voice and going close to the old man. They have been speaking of my marriage, have they not? Yes, replied the angry look. I understand you are displeased at the silence I have preserved on the subject. The reason of it was that they had insisted on my keeping the matter a secret, and begged me not to tell you anything of it. They did not even acquaint me with their intentions, and I only discovered them by chance. That is why I have been so reserved with you, dear Grandpapa. Pray forgive me but there was no look calculated to reassure her. All it seemed to say was, It is not only your reserve which afflicts me. What is it, then? asked the young girl. Perhaps you think I shall abandon you, dear Grandpapa, and that I shall forget you when I am married? No. They told you, then, that Monsieur d'Epinay consented to our all living together? Yes. Then why are you still vexed and grieved? The old man's eyes beamed with an expression of gentle affection. Yes, I understand, said Valentine. It is because you love me. The old man assented, and you are afraid I shall be unhappy. Yes. You do not like Monsieur France, the eyes repeated several times. No, no, no. Then you are vexed with the engagement? Yes. Well, listen, said Valentine, throwing herself on her knees and putting her arm round her grandfather's neck. I am vexed, too, for I do not love Monsieur Franc d'Epinay. An expression of intense joy illumined the old man's eyes. When I wished to retire into a convent, you remember how angry you were with me? A tear trembled in the eye of the invalid. Well, continued Valentine, the reason of my proposing it was that I might escape this hateful marriage, which drives me to despair. Nautier's breathing came thick and short. Then the idea of this marriage really grieves you too. Ah, if you could but help me, if we could both together defeat their plan, but you are unable to oppose them. 
you whose mind is so quick and whose will is so firm and nevertheless as weak and unequal to the contest as i am myself alas you who would have been such a powerful protector to me in the days of your health and strength can now only sympathize in my joys and sorrows without being able to take any active part in them however this is much and calls for gratitude and heaven has not taken away all my blessings when it leaves me your sympathy and kindness at these words there appeared in nortia's eye an expression of such deep meaning that the young girl thought she could read these words there you are mistaken i can still do much for you do you think you can help me dear grandpapa said valentine yes nortier raised his eyes it was the sign agreed between him and valentine when he wanted anything what is it you want dear grandpapa said valentine and she endeavoured to recall to mind all the things which he would be likely to need and as the ideas presented themselves to her mind she repeated them aloud then finding that all her efforts elicited nothing but a constant no she said come since this plan does not answer i will have recourse to another she then recited all the letters of the alphabet from a down to n when she arrived at that letter the paralytic made her understand that she had spoken the initial letter of the thing he wanted ah said valentine the thing you desire begins with the letter n it is with n that we have to do then well let me see what can you want that begins with n na ni ni no yes 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 said the old man's eye ah it is no then yes valentine fetched a dictionary which she placed on a desk before nortier she opened it and seeing that the odd man's eye was thoroughly fixed on its pages she ran her finger quickly up and down the columns during the six years which had passed since nortier's first fell into this sad state valentine's power of invention had been too often put to the test not to render her expert in devising expedients for gaining a knowledge of his wishes and the constant practice had so perfected her in the art that she guessed the old man's meaning as quickly as if he himself had been able to seek for what he wanted at the word notary nortia made a sign to her to stop notary said she do you want a notary dear grandpapa the old man again signified that it was a notary he desired you would wish a notary to be sent for then said valentine yes shall my father be informed of your wish yes do you wish the notary to be sent for immediately yes then they shall go for him directly dear grandpapa is that all you want yes valentine rang the bell and ordered the servant to tell Monsieur or Madame de Villefort that they were requested to come to Monsieur Nortier's room. Are you satisfied now? inquired Valentine. Yes, I am sure you are. It is not very difficult to discover that. And the young girl smiled on her grandfather, as if he had been a child. Monsieur de Villefort entered followed by Barras. "'What do you want me for, sir?' demanded he of the paralytic. "'Sir,' said Valentine, "'my grandfather wishes for a notary.' At this strange and unexpected demand, Monsieur de Villefort and his father exchanged looks. "'Yes,' motioned the latter, 
with a firmness which seemed to declare that with the help of Valentine and his old servant, who both knew what his wishes were, he was quite prepared to maintain the contest. "'Do you wish for a notary?' asked Villefort. "'Yes. What to do?' Nortier made no answer. "'What do you want with a notary?' again repeated Villefort. The invalid's eye remained fixed, by which expression he intended to intimate that his resolution was unalterable. Is it to do us some ill turn? Do you think it is worth while? said Villefort. Still, said Barras, with the freedom and fidelity of an old servant, if Monsieur asks for a notary, I suppose he really wishes for a notary. Therefore I shall go at once and fetch one. Barras acknowledged no master but Nortier, and never allowed his desires in any way to be contradicted. Yes, I do want a notary, motioned the old man, shutting his eyes with a look of defiance, which seemed to say, and I should like to see the person who dares to refuse my request. You shall have a notary, as you absolutely wish for one, sir, said Villefort, but I shall explain to him your state of health, and make excuses for you, for the scene cannot fail of being a most ridiculous one. Never mind that, said Barris. I shall go and fetch a notary, nevertheless, and the old servant departed triumphantly on his mission. End of chapter 58「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 59 The Will. As soon as Barras had left the room, Nortier looked at Valentine with a malicious expression that said many things. The young girl perfectly understood the look, and so did Villefort, for his countenance became clouded, and he knitted his eyebrows angrily. He took a seat and quietly awaited the arrival of the notary. Nortier saw him seat himself with an appearance of perfect indifference, at the same time giving a side look at Valentine, which made her understand that she also was to remain in the room. Three quarters of an hour after, Barris returned, bringing the notary with him. Sir, said Villefort, after the first solutions were over, you were sent for by Monsieur Nortier, whom you see here. All his limbs have been completely paralyzed. He has lost his voice also, and we ourselves find much trouble in endeavoring to catch some fragments of his meaning. Nortier cast an appealing look on Valentine, which look was at once so earnest and imperative that she answered immediately. Sir, said she, I perfectly understand my grandfather's meaning at all times. That is quite true, said Barris, and that is what I told the gentleman as we walked along. Permit me, said the notary, turning first to Villefort and then to Valentine. Permit me to state that the case in question is just one of those in which a public officer like myself cannot proceed to act without thereby incurring a dangerous responsibility. The first thing necessary to render an act valid is that the notary should be thoroughly convinced that he has faithfully interpreted the will and wishes of the person dictating the act. 
Now I cannot be sure of the approbation or disapprobation of a client who cannot speak, and as the object of his desire or his repugnance cannot be clearly proved to me, on account of his want of speech, my services here would be quite useless, and cannot be legally exercised. The notary then prepared to retire. An imperceptible smile of triumph was expressed on the lips of the procurer. Nortier looked at Valentine with an expression so full of grief that she arrested the departure of the notary. Sir, said she, the language which I speak with my grandfather may be easily learnt, and I can teach you in a few minutes, to understand it almost as well as I can myself. Will you tell me what you require in order to set your conscience quite at ease on the subject? In order to render an act valid, I must be certain of the approbation or disapprobation of my client. Illness of body would not affect the validity of the deed, but sanity of mind is absolutely requisite. Well, sir, by the help of two signs, with which I will acquaint you presently, you may ascertain with perfect certainty that my grandfather is still in the full possession of all his mental faculties. Monsieur Nautier, being deprived of voice and motion, is accustomed to convey his meaning by closing his eyes when he wishes to signify yes, and to wink when he means no. You now know quite enough to enable you to converse with Monsieur Nautier. Try. Nautier gave Valentine such a look of tenderness and gratitude that it was comprehended even by the notary himself. You have heard and understood what your granddaughter has been saying, sir, have you? asked the notary. Nautier closed his eyes. And you approve of what she said? That is to say, you declare that the signs which she mentioned are really those by means of which you are accustomed to convey your thoughts? Yes. It was you who sent for me? Yes. To make your will? Yes. And you do not wish me to go away without fulfilling your original intentions? The old man winked violently. Well, sir, said the young girl, do you understand now? And is your conscience perfectly at rest on the subject? But before the notary could answer, Villefort had drawn him aside. Sir, said he, do you suppose for a moment that a man can sustain a physical shock such as Monsieur Nautier has received without any detriment to his mental faculties? It is not exactly that, sir, said the notary, which makes me uneasy, but the difficulty will be in wording his thoughts and intentions, so as to be able to get his answers. You must see that to be an utter impossibility, said Villefort. Valentine and the old man heard this conversation, and Nautier fixed his eyes so earnestly on Valentine that she felt bound to answer to look. Sir, said she, that need not make you uneasy, however difficult it may at first sight appear to be. I can discover and explain to you my grandfather's thoughts, so as to put an end to all your doubts and fears on the subject. I have been six years with Monsieur Nautier, and let me tell you if ever once, during that time, he has entertained a thought which he was unable to make me understand. No, signed the old man. Let us try what we can do, then, said the notary. You accept this young lady as your interpreter, Monsieur Nautier? Yes. Well, sir, what do you require of me? 
and what document is it that you wish to be drawn up? Valentine named all the letters of the alphabet until she came to W. At this letter, the eloquent eye of Nautia gave her notice that she was to stop. It is very evident that it is the letter W which Monsieur Nautier wants, said the notary. Wait, said Valentine, and turning to her grandfather, she repeated, Wa, we, we. The old man stopped her at the last syllable. Valentine then took the dictionary, and the notary watched her while she turned over the pages. She passed her finger slowly down the columns, and when she came to the word will, Monsieur Nautier's eye bade her stop. Will, said the notary, it is very evident that Monsieur Nautier is desirous of making his will. Yes, 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 motioned the invalid. Really, sir, you must allow that this is most extraordinary said the astonished notary, turning to Monsieur de Villefort. Yes, said the procurer, and I think the will promises to be yet more extraordinary, for I cannot see how it is to be drawn up without the intervention of Valentine, and she may, perhaps, be considered as too much interested in its contents to allow of her being a suitable interpreter of the obscure and ill-defined wishes of her grandfather. No, 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 replied the eye of the paralytic. What, said Villefort, do you mean to say that Valentine is not interested in your will? No, sir, said the notary, whose interest had been greatly excited and who had resolved on publishing far and wide the account of this extraordinary and picturesque scene. What appeared so impossible to me an hour ago has now become quite easy and practicable, and this may be a perfectly valid will, provided it be read in the presence of seven witnesses, approved by the testator, and sealed by the notary in the presence of the witnesses. As to the time, it will not require very much more than the generalty of wills. There are certain forms necessary to be gone through, and which are always the same. As to the details, the greater part will be furnished afterwards by the state in which we find the affairs of the testator and by yourself, who, having had the management of them, can doubtless give full information on the subject. But besides all this, in order that the instrument may not be contested, I am anxious to give it the greatest possible authenticity. Therefore, one of my colleagues will help me, and, contrary to custom, will assist in the dictation of the testament. Are you satisfied, sir? Continued the notary, addressing the old man. Yes, looked the invalid, his eye beaming with delight at the ready interpretation of his meaning. What is he going to do, thought Villefort, whose position demanded much reserve, but who was longing to know what his father's intentions were. He left the room to give orders for another notary to be sent. But Barras, who had heard all that passed, had guessed his master's wishes, and had already gone to fetch one. The procurer then told his wife to come up. In the course of a quarter of an hour, every one had assembled in the chamber of the paralytic, the second notary had also arrived. A few words sufficed for a mutual understanding between the two officers of the law. They read to Nautier the formal copy of a will, in order to give him an idea of the terms in which such documents are generally couched, 
Then, in order to test the capacity of the testator, the first notary said, turning towards him, When an individual makes his will, it is generally in favour or in prejudice of some person. Yes. Have you an exact idea of the amount of your fortune? Yes. I will name to you several sums which will increase by gradation. You will stop me when I reach the one representing the amount of your own possessions. Yes. There was a kind of solemnity in his interrogation. Never had the struggle between mind and matter been more apparent than now, and if it was not a sublime, it was, at least, a curious spectacle. They had formed a circle round the invalid. The second notary was sitting at a table, prepared for writing and his colleague was standing before the testator, in the act of interrogating him on the subject to which we have alluded. Your fortune exceeds three hundred thousand francs, does it not? asked he. Nautier made a sign that it did. Do you possess four hundred thousand francs? inquired the notary. Nautier's eye remained immovable. Five hundred thousand. The same expression continued. Six hundred thousand. Seven hundred thousand. Eight hundred thousand. Nine hundred thousand. Nautier stopped him at the last named sum. You are then in possession of nine hundred thousand francs? asked the notary. Yes. In landed property? No. In stock? Yes. The stock is in your hands. The look which Monsieur Nautier cast on Burris showed that there was something wanting which he knew where to find. The old servant left the room, and presently returned, bringing with him a small casket. Do you permit us to open this casket? asked the notary. Nautier gave his assent. They opened it, and found nine hundred thousand francs in bank scrip. The first notary handed over each note, as he examined it, to his colleague. The total amount was found to be, as Monsieur Nautier had stated. It is all as he has said. It is very evident that the mind still retains its full force and vigour. Then, turning towards the paralytic, he said, You possess, then, nine hundred thousand francs of capital, which, according to the manner in which you have invested it, ought to bring in an income of about four hundred livres. Yes. To whom do you desire to leave this fortune? Oh, said Madame de Villefort, there is not much doubt on that subject. Monsieur Nautier tenderly loves his granddaughter. Mademoiselle de Villefort, it is she who has nursed and tended him for six years, and has, by her devoted attention, fully secured the affection. I had almost said the gratitude of her grandfather, and it is but just that she should reap the fruit of her devotion. The eye of Nautier clearly showed by its expression that he was not deceived by the false assent given by Madame de Villefort's words and manner to the motives which she supposed him to entertain. Is it, then, to Mademoiselle Valentine de Villefort that you leave these nine hundred thousand francs? demanded the notary, thinking he had only to insert this clause, but waiting first for the assent of Nautier, which it was necessary should be given before all the witnesses of this singular scene. Valentine, when her name was made, the subject of discussion, had stepped back to escape unpleasant observation. 
her eyes were cast down, and she was crying. The old man looked at her for an instant with an expression of the deepest tenderness. Then, turning towards the notary, he significantly winked his eye in token of dissent. What? said the notary. Do you not intend making Mademoiselle Valentine de Villefort your residuary legatee? No. You are not making any mistake, are you? said the notary. You really mean to declare that such is not your intention? No, repeated Nautier. No. Valentine raised her head, struck dumb with astonishment. It was not so much the conviction that she was disinherited that caused her grief, but her total inability to account for the feelings which had provoked her grandfather to such an act. But Nautier looked at her with so much affectionate tenderness that she exclaimed, Oh, Grandpapa, I see now that it is only your fortune of which you deprive me. You still leave me the love which I have always enjoyed. Ah, yes, most absurdly, said the eyes of the paralytic, for he closed them with an expression which Valentine could not mistake. Thank you, thank you, murmured she. The old man's declaration that Valentine was not the destined inheritor of his fortune had excited the hopes of Madame de Villefort. She gradually approached the invalid and said, Then, doubtless, dear Monsieur Nautier, you intend leaving your fortune to your grandson, Edward de Villefort? The winking of the eyes which answered this speech was most decided and terrible and expressed a feeling almost amounting to hatred. No, said the notary. Then, perhaps, it is to your son, Monsieur de Villefort. No, the two notaries looked at each other in mute astonishment and inquiry as to what were the real intentions of the testator. Villefort and his wife both grew red, one from shame, the other from anger. What have we all done, then, dear grandpapa, said Valentine? You no longer seem to love any of us. The old man's eyes passed rapidly from Villefort and his wife, and rested on Valentine with a look of unutterable fondness. Well, said she, if you love me, grandpapa, Try and bring that love to bear upon your actions at this present moment. You know me well enough to be quite sure that I have never thought of your fortune. Besides, they say I am already rich in right of my mother. Too rich, even. Explain yourself, then. Nautier fixed his intelligent eyes on Valentine's hand. My hand, said she. Yes, her hand, exclaimed everyone. Oh, gentlemen, you see it is all useless, and that my father's mind is really impaired, said Villefort. Ah, cried Valentine suddenly, I understand. It is my marriage, you mean. Is it not, dear Grandpapa? Yes, 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 signed the paralytic casting on Valentine a look of joyful gratitude for having guessed his meaning. You are angry with us all on account of this marriage, are you not? Yes. Really, this is too absurd, said Villefort. Excuse me, sir, replied the notary. On the contrary, the meaning of Monsieur Nautier is quite evident to me and I can quite easily connect the train of ideas passing in his mind. You do not wish me to marry Monsieur Fran d'Epinay, observed Valentine. I do not wish it, said the eye of her grandfather. And you disinherit your granddaughter, continued the notary. 
because she has contracted an engagement contrary to your wishes? Yes, so that, but for this marriage, she would have been your heir? Yes, there was a profound silence. The two notaries were holding a consultation as to the best means of proceeding with the affair. Valentine was looking at her grandfather with a smile of intense gratitude, and Villefort was biting his lips with vexation, while Madame de Villefort could not succeed in repressing an inward feeling of joy, which, in spite of herself, appeared in her whole countenance. But, said Villefort, who was the first to break the silence, I consider that I am the best judge of the propriety of the marriage in question. I am the only person possessing the right to dispose of my daughter's hand. It is my wish that she should marry Monsieur Franz d'Epinay, and she shall marry him. Valentine sunk weeping into a chair. Sir, said the notary, how do you intend disposing of your fortune in case Mademoiselle de Villefort still determines on marrying Monsieur France? The old man gave no answer. You will, of course, dispose of it in some way or other? Yes, in favor of some member of your family? No. Do you intend devoting it to charitable purposes, then? pursued the notary. Yes, but, said the notary, you are aware that the law does not allow a son to be entirely deprived of his patrimony? Yes, you only intend, then, to dispose of that part of your fortune which the law allows you to subtract from the inheritance of your son? Nautier made no answer. Do you still wish to dispose of all? Yes, but they will contest the will after your death. No, my father knows me, replied Villefort. He is quite sure that his wishes will be held sacred by me. Besides, he understands that in my position I cannot plead against the poor. The eye of Nautio beamed with triumph. What do you decide on, sir? asked the notary of Villeport. Nothing, sir. It is a resolution which my father has taken, and I know he never alters his mind. I am quite resigned. These nine hundred thousand francs will go out of the family in order to enrich some hospital. But it is ridiculous thus to yield to the caprices of an old man and I shall, therefore, act according to my conscience. Having said this, Villefort quitted the room with his wife, leaving his father at liberty to do as he pleased. The same day the will was made, the witnesses were brought. It was approved by the old man, sealed in the presence of all and given in charge to Monsieur de Champs the family notary. End of chapter 59「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 60 The Telegraph. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort found on their return that the Count of Monte Cristo, who had come to visit them in their absence, had been ushered into the drawing room and was still waiting them there. Madame de Villefort who had not yet sufficiently recovered from her late emotion to allow of her entertaining visitors so immediately, retired to her bedroom, while the procurer, who could better depend upon himself, 
proceeded at once to the saloon. Although Monsieur de Villefort flattered himself that, to all outward view, he had completely masked the feelings which were passing in his mind, he did not know that the cloud was still lowering on his brow, so much so that the Count, whose smile was radiant, immediately noticed his sombre and thoughtful air. Mafoy said Monte Cristo, after the first compliments were over, what is the matter with you, Monsieur de Villefort? Have I arrived at the moment when you were drawing up an indictment for a capital crime? Villefort tried to smile. No, Count, he replied, I am the only victim in this case. It is I who lose my cause, and it is ill luck, obstinacy, and folly which have caused it to be decided against me. To what do you refer, said Monte Cristo, with well-feigned interest? Have you really met with some great misfortune? Oh, no, Monsieur, said Villefort, with a bitter smile. It is only a loss of money which I have sustained. Nothing worth mentioning, I assure you. True, said Monte Cristo. The loss of a sum of money becomes almost immaterial with a fortune such as you possess, and to one of your philosophic spirit. It is not so much the loss of the money that vexes me, said Villefort, though, after all, nine hundred thousand francs are worth regretting, but I am the more annoyed with this fate, chance, or whatever you please to call the power which has destroyed my hopes and my fortune, and may blast the prospects of my child also, as it is all occasioned by an old man relapsed into second childhood. What do you say? said the Count. Nine hundred thousand francs? It is indeed a sum which might be regretted even by a philosopher. And who is the cause of all this annoyance? My father, as I told you. Monsieur Nautier, but I thought you told me he had become entirely paralyzed, and that all his faculties were completely destroyed. Yes, his bodily faculties, for he can neither move nor speak. Nevertheless, he thinks, acts, and wills in the manner I have described. I left him about five minutes ago, and he is now occupied in dictating his will to two notaries. But to do this he must have spoken. He has done better than that. He has made himself understood. How was such a thing possible? By the help of his eyes, which are still full of life, and, as you perceive, possess the power of inflicting mortal injury. My dear, said Madame de Villefort, who had just entered the room, perhaps you exaggerate the evil. Good morning, Madame, said the Count, bowing. Madame de Villefort acknowledged the salutation with one of her most gracious smiles. What is this that Monsieur de Villefort has been telling me? demanded Monte Cristo and what incomprehensible misfortune. Incomprehensible is not the word, interrupted the procurer, shrugging his shoulders. It is an old man's caprice. And is there no means of making him revoke his decision? Yes, said Madame de Villefort, and it is still entirely in the power of my husband to cause the will which is now in prejudice of Valentine, to be altered in her favour. The Count, who perceived that Monsieur and Madame de Villefort were beginning to speak in parables, appeared to pay no attention to the conversation, and feigned to be busily engaged in watching Edward, who was mischievously pouring some ink into the bird's water-glass. My dear, said Villefort, in answer to his wife, you know I have never been accustomed to play the patriarch in my family, nor have I ever considered 
that the fate of a universe was to be decided by my nod. Nevertheless, it is necessary that my will should be respected in my family, and that the folly of an old man and the caprice of a child should not be allowed to overturn a project which I have entertained for so many years. The Baron d'Epinay was my friend, as you know, and an alliance with his son is the most suitable thing that could possibly be arranged. Do you think, said Madame de Villefort, that Valentine is in league with him? She has always been opposed to this marriage, and I should not be at all surprised if what we have just seen and heard is nothing but the execution of a plan concerted between them. Madam, said Villefort, believe me, a fortune of nine hundred thousand francs is not so easily renounced. She could, nevertheless, make up her mind to renounce the world, sir, since it is only about a year ago that she herself proposed entering a convent. Never mind, replied Villefort. I say that this marriage shall be consummated. Notwithstanding your father's wishes to the contrary, said Madame de Villefort, selecting a new point of attack. That is a serious thing, Monte Cristo, who pretended not to be listening, heard, however, every word that was said. Madame, replied Villefort, I can truly say that I have always entertained a high respect for my father, because, to the natural feeling of relationship was added, the consciousness of his moral superiority. The name of father is sacred in two senses. He should be reverenced as the author of our being, and as a master whom we ought to obey. But, under the present circumstances, I am justified in doubting the wisdom of an old man who, because he hated the father, vents his anger on the son. It would be ridiculous in me to regulate my conduct by such caprices. I shall still continue to preserve the same respect toward Monsieur Nautier. I will suffer, without complaint, the pecuniary deprivation to which he has subjected me, but I shall remain firm in my determination, and the world shall see which party has reason on his side. Consequently, I shall marry my daughter to the Baron Fran d'Epinay, because I consider it would be a proper and eligible match for her to make, and, in short, because I choose to bestow my daughter's hand on whomever I please. What? said the Count, the approbation of whose eye Villefort had frequently solicited during his speech. What? Do you say that Monsieur Nautier disinherits Mademoiselle de Villefort because she is going to marry Monsieur le Baron Fran d'Epinay? Yes, sir. That is the reason, said Villefort, shrugging his shoulders. The apparent reason, at least, said Madame de Villefort. The real reason, Madame, I can assure you, I know my father. But I want to know in what way Monsieur d'Epinay can have displeased your father more than any other person. I believe I know Monsieur Fran d'Epinay, said the Count is not the son of General de Quenzel, who was created Baron d'Epinay by Charles X? The same, said Villefort. Well, but he is a charming young man, according to my ideas. He is, which makes me believe that it is only an excuse of Monsieur Nautier to prevent his granddaughter marrying. Old men are always so selfish in their affection said Madame de Villefort. But, said Monte Cristo, do you not know any cause for this hatred? Ah, ma foi, who is to know? Perhaps it is some political difference. My father and the Baron d'Epinay lived in the stormy times of which I only saw the ending, said Villefort. 
"'Was not your father a Bonapartist?' asked Monte Cristo. "'I think I remember that you told me something of that kind. "'My father has been a Jacobin more than anything else,' said Villefort, "'carried by his emotion beyond the bounds of prudence. "'And the senator's robe, which Napoleon cast on his shoulders,' only served to disguise the old man without in any degree changing him. When my father conspired, it was not for the emperor, it was against the Bourbons, for Monsieur Nautier possessed this peculiarity. He never projected any utopian schemes which could never be realized, but strove for possibilities, and he applied to the realization of these possibilities the terrible theories of the mountain, theories that never shrunk from any means that were deemed necessary to bring about the desired result. Well, said Monte Cristo, it is just as I thought. It was politics which brought Nautier and Monsieur d'Epinay into personal contact. Although General d'Epinay served under Napoleon, did he not still retain royalists' sentiments? And was he not the person who was assassinated one evening on leaving a Bonapartist meeting to which he had been invited on the supposition that he favoured the cause of the emperor? Villefort looked at the count almost with terror. Am I mistaken, then, said Monte Cristo? No, sir. The facts were precisely what you have stated, said Madame de Villefort, and it was to prevent the renewal of old feuds that Monsieur de Villefort formed the idea of uniting in the bonds of affection the two children of these inveterate enemies. It was a sublime and charitable thought, said Monte Cristo, and the whole world should applaud it. It would be noble to see Mademoiselle Nautier de Villefort assuming the title of Madame Fran d'Epinay. Villefort shuddered and looked at Monte Cristo as if he wished to read in his countenance the real feelings which had dictated the words he had just uttered. But the Count completely baffled the procurer and prevented him from discovering anything beneath the never-varying smile he was so constantly in the habit of assuming. Although, said Villefort, it will be a serious thing for Valentine to lose her grandfather's fortune. I do not think that Monsieur d'Epinay will be frightened at this pecuniary loss. He will, perhaps, hold me in greater esteem than the money itself, seeing that I sacrifice everything in order to keep my word with him. Besides, he knows that Valentine is rich in right of her mother, and that she will, in all probability, inherit the fortune of Monsieur and Madame de saint Moran, her mother's parents, who both love her tenderly, and who are fully as well worth loving and tending as Monsieur Nautier, said Madame de Villefort. Besides, they are to come to Paris in about a month, and Valentine, after the affront she has received, need not consider it necessary to continue to bury herself alive by being shut up with Monsieur Nautier. The Count listened with satisfaction to this tale of wounded self-love and defeated ambition. But it seems to me, said Monte Cristo, and I must begin by asking your pardon for what I am about to say, that if Monsieur Nautier disinherits Mademoiselle de Villefort because she is going to marry a man whose father he detested, he cannot have the same cause of complaint against this dear Edward. True, said Madame de Villefort, with an intonation of voice, which it is impossible to describe, it is not unjust, shamefully unjust. Poor Edward is as much Monsieur Nautier's grandchild as Valentine, and yet, if she had not been going to marry Monsieur France, Monsieur Nautier would have left her all his money, 
and supposing Valentine to be disinherited by her grandfather, she will still be three times richer than he. The Count listened and said no more. Count, said Villefort, we will not entertain you any longer with our family misfortunes. It is true that my patrimony will go to endow charitable institutions, and my father will have deprived me of my lawful inheritance without any reason for doing so. But I shall have the satisfaction of knowing that I have acted like a man of sense and feeling. Monsieur d'Epinay, to whom I had promised the interest of this sum, shall receive it, even if I endure the most cruel privations. However, said Madame de Villefort, returning to the one idea which incessantly occupied her mind, perhaps it would be better to explain this unlucky affair to Monsieur d'Epinay in order to give him the opportunity of himself renouncing his claim to the hand of Mademoiselle de Villefort. Ah, that would be a great pity, said Villefort. A great pity, said Monte Cristo. Undoubtedly, said Villefort, moderating the tones of his voice. A marriage once concerted and then broken off throws a sort of discredit on a young lady. Then again, the old reports, which I was so anxious to put an end to, will instantly gain ground. No, it will all go well. Monsieur d'Epinay, if he is an honourable man, will consider himself more than ever pledged to Mademoiselle de Villefort, unless he were actuated by a decided feeling of avarice. But that is impossible." I agree with Monsieur de Villefort, said Monte Cristo, fixing his eyes on Madame de Villefort, and if I were sufficiently intimate with him to allow of giving my advice, I would persuade him, since I have been told Monsieur de Epinay is coming back, to settle this affair at once beyond all possibility of revocation. I will answer for the success of a project which will reflect so much honour on Monsieur de Villefort. This procurer arose, delighted with the preposition, but his wife slightly changed colour. Well, that is all that I wanted, and I will be guided by a counsellor such as you are, said he, extending his hand to Monte Cristo. Therefore let everyone here look upon what has passed today as if it had not happened, and as though we had never thought of such a thing as a change in our original plans. Sir, said the Count, the world, unjust as it is, will be pleased with your resolution. Your friends will be proud of you. And Monsieur d'Epinay, even if he took Mademoiselle de Villefort without any dowry, which he will not do, would be delighted with the idea of entering a family which could make such sacrifices in order to keep a promise and fulfil a duty. At the conclusion of these words, the Count rose to depart. Are you going to leave us, Count? said Madame de Villefort. I am sorry to say I must do so, Madame. I only came to remind you of your promise for Saturday. Did you fear that we should forget it? You are very good, madam, but Monsieur de Villefort has so many important and urgent occupations. My husband has given me his word, sir, said Madame de Villefort. You have just seen him resolve to keep it when he has everything to lose, and surely there is more reason for his doing so where he has everything to gain. And, said Villefort, is it at your house in the Sham Elysees that you receive your visitors? No, said Monte Cristo, which is precisely the reason which renders your kindness more meritorious. It is in the country. In the country? Yes. Where is it, then? Near Paris, is it not? Very near. Only half a league from the barriers. It is at Autour. 
At all too, said Villefort. True, Madame de Villefort told me you lived at all too, since it was to your house that she was taken. And at what part of all too do you reside? Rue de la Fontaine. Rue de la Fontaine, exclaimed Villefort, in an agitated tone. At what number? Number twenty-eight. Then, cried Villefort, was it you who bought Monsieur de saint Meran's house? Did it belong to Monsieur de saint Meran? demanded Monte Cristo. Yes, replied Madame de Villefort. And would you believe it, Count? Believe what? You think this house pretty, do you not? I think it charming. Well, my husband would never live in it. Indeed, returned Monte Cristo. That is a prejudice on your part, Monsieur de Villefort, for which I am quite at a loss to account. I do not like or to, sir, said the procurer, making an evident effort to appear calm. But I hope you will not carry your antipathy so far as to deprive me of the pleasure of your company, sir, said Monte Cristo. No, Count, I hope, I assure you, I shall do my best, stammered Villefort. Oh, said Monte Cristo, I allow of no excuse. On Saturday, at six o'clock, I shall be expecting you, and if you fail to come, I shall think, for how do I know to the contrary, that this house, which has remained uninhabited for twenty years, must have some gloomy tradition or dreadful legend connected with it. I will come, Count. I will be sure to come, said Villefort eagerly. Thank you, said Monte Cristo. Now you must permit me to take my leave of you. You said before that you were obliged to leave us, Monsieur, said Madame de Villefort and you were about to tell us why when your attention was called to some other subject. Indeed, madam, said Monte Cristo, I scarcely know if I dare tell you where I am going. Nonsense, say on. Well, then, it is to see a thing on which I have sometimes mused for hours together. What is it? A telegraph. So now I have told my secret. A telegraph, repeated Madame de Villefort. Yes, a telegraph. I had often seen one placed at the end of a road on a hillock, and in the light of the sun its black arms, bending in every direction, always reminded me of the claws of an immense beetle, and I assure you it was never without emotion that I gazed on it, for I could not help thinking how wonderful it was that these various signs should be made to cleave the air with such precision as to convey to the distance of three hundred leagues the ideas and wishes of a man sitting at a table at one end of the line to another man similarly placed at the opposite extremity. And all this effected by a simple act of volition on the part of the sender of the message. I began to think of Jeanie silks, gnomes, in short, of all the ministers of the occult sciences, until I laughed aloud at the freaks of my own imagination. Now, it never occurred to me to wish for a nearer inspection of these large insects, with their long black claws, for I always feared to find under their stone wings some little human genius fagged to death with cabals, factions, and government intrigues. But one fine day I learned that the mover of this telegraph was only a poor wretch, hired for twelve hundred francs a year, and employed all day, not in studying the heavens like an astronomer, or in gazing on the water like an angler, or even in enjoying the privilege of observing the country around him but all his monotonous life was passed in watching his white-bellied, black-clawed fellow insect, four or five leagues distant from him. At length I felt a desire to study this living chrysalis more closely, and to endeavour to understand the secret part 
played by these insect actors when they occupy themselves simply with pulling different pieces of string. And are you going there? I am. What telegraph do you intend visiting? That of the home department or of the observatory? Oh, no, I should find there people who would force me to understand things of which I would prefer to remain ignorant, and who would try to explain to me, in spite of myself, a mystery which even they do not understand. Ma foi, I should wish to keep my illusions concerning insects unimpaired. It is quite enough to have those dissipated which I had formed of my fellow creatures. I shall, therefore, not visit either of these telegraphs, but one in the open country where I shall find a good-natured simpleton, who knows no more than the machine he is employed to work. You are a singular man, said Villefort. What line would you advise me to study? The one that is most in use just at this time. The Spanish one, you mean, I suppose. Yes, should you like a letter to the minister that they might explain to you? No, said Monte Cristo, since, as I told you before, I do not wish to comprehend it. The moment I understand it, there will no longer exist a telegraph for me. It will be nothing more than a sign from Monsieur de Chatel, or from Monsieur Montalivet, transmitted to the perfect of Bayonne, mystified by two Greek words, Tala, Graphene. It is the insect with black claws, and the awful word which I wish to retain in my imagination in all its purity and all its importance. Go then, for in the course of two hours it will be dark, and you will not be able to see anything. Ma foi, you frighten me. Which is the nearest way? Bayonne? Yes, the road to Bayonne. And afterwards the road to Chatillon? Yes. By the Tower of Montalieri, you mean? Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. On Saturday I will tell you my impressions concerning the telegraph. At the door the Count was met by the two notaries, who had just completed the act which was to disinherit Valentine, and who were leaving under the conviction of having done a thing which could not fail of redounding considerably to their credit. End of chapter 60This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by West Winds 12. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 61. How a Gardener May Get Rid of the Dormice That Eat His Peaches. Not on the same night as he had intended, but the next morning the Count of Monte Cristo went out by the Barrier de Enfer, taking the road to Orleans, leaving the village of Linus without stopping at the telegraph, which flourished its great bony arms as he passed. The Count reached the tower of Montalhere, situated, as everyone knows, upon the highest point of the plain of that name. At the foot of the hill the Count dismounted and began to ascend by a little winding path, about eighteen inches wide. When he had reached the summit he found himself stopped by a hedge, upon which green fruit had seceded to red and white flowers. Monte Cristo looked for the entrance to the enclosure, and was not long in finding a little wooden gate, working on willow hinges, and fastened with a nail and string. The Count soon mastered the mechanism, the gate opened, and he then found himself in a little garden, about twenty feet long by twelve wide, bounded on one side by part of the hedge, which contained the ingenious contrivance we have called a gate, on the other by the old tower, covered with ivy and studded with wallflowers. No one would have thought, in looking at this old, weather-beaten, floral-decked tower, 
which might be likened to an elderly dame dressed up to receive her grandchildren at a birthday feast, that it would have been capable of telling strange things, if, in addition to the menacing ears which the proverbs say all walls are provided with, it had also a voice. The garden was crossed by a path of red gravel, edged by a border of thick box, of many years' growth, and of a tone and color that would have delighted the heart of Delacroix, our modern Rubens. This path was formed in the shape of the figure of eight, thus, in its windings, making a walk of sixty feet in a garden of only twenty. Never had Flora, the fresh and smiling goddess of gardeners, been honored with a purer or more scrupulous worship than that which was paid to her in this little enclosure. In fact, of the twenty rose trees which formed the parterre, not one bore the mark of the slug, nor were there evidences anywhere of the clustering aphis which is so destructive to plants growing in a damp soil. And yet it was not because the damp had been excluded from the garden. The earth, black as soot, the thick foliage of the trees betrayed its presence. Besides, had natural humidity been wanting, it could have been immediately supplied by artificial means, thanks to a tank of water, sunk in one of the corners of the garden, and upon which were stationed a frog and a toad, who, from antipathy, no doubt, always remained on the two opposite sides of the basin. There was not a blade of grass to be seen in the paths, or a weed in the flower-beds, no fine lady ever trained and watered her geraniums, her cacti, and her rhododendrons with more pains than this hitherto unseen gardener bestowed upon his little enclosure. Monte Cristo stopped after having closed the gate and fastened the string to the nail, and cast a look around. The man at the telegraph, said he, must either engage a gardener or devote himself passionately to agriculture. Suddenly he struck against something crouching behind a wheelbarrow filled with leaves. The something rose, uttering an exclamation of astonishment, and Monte Cristo found himself facing a man about fifty years old, who was plucking strawberries, which he was placing upon grape leaves. He had twelve leaves and about as many strawberries, which, on rising suddenly, he let fall from his hand. "'You are gathering your crop, sir?' said Monte Cristo, smiling. "'Excuse me, sir,' replied the man, raising his hand to his cap. "'I am not up there, I know, but I have only just come down.' "'Do not let me interfere with you in anything, my friend,' said the Count. "'Gather your strawberries, if, indeed, there are any left.' "'I have ten left,' said the man, "'for here are eleven, and I had twenty-one, five more than last year. "'But I am not surprised the spring has been warm this year.' and strawberries require heat, sir. This is the reason that, instead of the sixteen I had last year, I have this year, you see, eleven, already plucked, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Ah, I missed three. They were here last night. Sir, I am sure they were here. I counted them. It must be the Mary Simon's son who has stolen them. I saw him strolling about here this morning. Ah, the young rascal, stealing in a garden. He does not know where that may lead him to. Certainly it is wrong, said Monte Cristo, but you should take into consideration the youth and greediness of the delinquent. Of course, said the gardener, but that does not make it the less unpleasant. But, sir, once more I beg pardon. Perhaps you are an officer that I am detained here? and he glanced timidly at the Count's blue coat. "'Calm yourself, my friend,' said the Count, with the smile which he made at will, either terrible or benevolent, and which now expressed only the kindliest feeling. I am not an inspector, but a traveller, brought here by a curiosity he half repents of, since he causes you to lose your time.' "'Ah, my time is not valuable,' replied the man, with a melancholy smile. Still, it belongs to the government, and I ought not to waste it, but, having received the signal that I might rest for an hour, here he glanced at the sundial, for there was everything in the enclosure of Montelhere, 
even a sundial, and having ten minutes before me, and my strawberries being ripe, when, a day longer, by the by, sir, do you think dormice eat them? Indeed, I should think not, replied Monte Cristo. Dormice are bad neighbors for us who do not eat them preserved, as the Romans did. What? Did the Romans eat them? said the gardener. Eight dormice? But I this have read year, so, continued in Petronius, the said the Count. I'll take care. Really? It shall not happen. They can't be nice, though they do say, as fat as a dormouse. It is not a wonder they are fat, sleeping all day, and only waking to eat all night. Listen, last year I had four apricots. They stole one. I had one nectarine, only one. Well, sir, they ate half of it on the wall. A splendid nectarine. I never ate a better. You ate it? That is to say, the half that was left, you understand. It was exquisite, sir. Ah, those gentlemen never choose the worst morsels, like Murray Simon's son, who has not chosen the worst strawberries. But this year, continued the horticulturist, I'll take care, it shall not happen, even if I should be forced to sit by the whole night to watch when the strawberries are ripe. Monte Cristo had seen enough. Every man has a devouring passion in his heart, as every fruit has its worm. That of the telegraph man was horticulture. He began gathering the grape leaves, which screened the sun from the grapes, and won the heart of the gardener. Did you come here, sir, to see the telegraph? he said. Yes. If it isn't contrary to the rules. Oh, no, said the gardener, not in the least, since there is no danger that anyone can possibly understand what we are saying. I have been told, said the Count, that you do not always yourselves understand the signals you repeat. That is true, sir, and that is what I like best, said the man, smiling. Why do you like that best? Because then I have no responsibility. I am a machine, then and nothing else, and so long as I work, nothing more is required of me. Is it possible, said Monte Cristo to himself, that I can have met with a man that has no ambition, that would spoil my plans? Sir, said the gardener, glancing at the sundial, the ten minutes are almost up. I must return to my post. Will you go up with me? I follow you. Monte Cristo entered the tower, which was divided into three stories. The tower contained implements such as spades, rakes, watering pots, hung against the wall. This was all the furniture. The second was the man's conventional abode, or rather sleeping place. It contained a few poor articles of household furniture, a bed, a table, two chairs, a stone pitcher, and some dry herbs hung up to the ceiling, which the Count recognized as sweet peas, and of which the good man was preserving the seeds. He had labeled them with as much care as if he had been master botanist in the Jardin des Plantes. Does it require much study to learn the art of telegraphing? asked Monte Cristo. The study does not take long. It was acting as a supernumerary that was so tedious. And what is the pay? A thousand francs, sir. It is nothing. No, but then we are lodged, as you perceive. Monte Cristo looked at the room. They passed to the third story. It was the telegraph room. Monte Cristo looked, in turn, at the two iron handles by which the machine was worked. It is very interesting, he said, but it must be very tedious for a lifetime. Yes. At first my neck was cramped with looking at it, but at the end of a year I became used to it, and then we have our hours of recreation, and our holidays. Holidays? Yes. When? When we have a fog. Ah, to be sure. Those are indeed holidays to me. I go into the garden, I plant, I prune, I trim, I kill the insects all day long. How long have you been here? Ten years, and five as a supernumerary, make fifteen. You are fifty-five years old. How long must you have served to claim the pension? Oh, sir, twenty-five years. And how much is the pension? A hundred crowns. 
"'Poor humanity,' murmured Count Monte Cristo. "'What did you say, sir?' asked the man. "'I was saying it was very interesting.' "'What was?' "'All you were showing me. "'And you really understand none of these signals?' "'None at all.' "'And have you ever tried to understand them?' "'Never. Why should I?' But still there are some signals only addressed to you. Certainly. And do you understand them? They are always the same. And they mean... Nothing new. You have an hour, or to-morrow. This is simple enough, said the Count. But look, is not your correspondent putting itself in motion? Ah, yes. Thank you, sir. And what is it saying? Anything you understand? Yes, it asks if I am ready. And you reply? By the same sign, which, at the same time, tells my right-hand correspondent that I am ready, while it gives notice to my left-hand correspondent to prepare in his turn. It is very ingenious, said the Count. You see, said the man proudly, in five minutes he will speak. I have, then, five minutes, said Monte Cristo to himself. It is more time than I require. My dear sir, will you allow me to ask you a question? What is it, sir? You are fond of gardening? Passionately. And you would be pleased to have, instead of this terrace of twenty feet, an enclosure of two acres? Sir, I should make a terrestrial paradise of it. You live badly on your thousand francs? Badly enough, but yet... I do live. Yes, but you have a wretchedly small garden. True, the garden is not large. And then, such as it is, it is filled with dormice, who eat everything. Ah, they are my scourges. Tell me, should you have the misfortune to turn your head while your right-hand correspondent is telegraphing, I should not see him. Then what would happen? I could not repeat the signals. And then, not having repeated them, through negligence, I should be fined. How much? A hundred francs. The tenth of your income. That would be fine work. Ah, uh, said the man. Has it ever happened to you? said Monte Cristo. Once, sir, when I was grafting a rose tree. Well, suppose you were to alter a signal and substitute another. Ah, that is another case. I should be turned off and lose my pension. Three hundred francs? A hundred crowns, yes, sir. So you see that I am not likely to do any of these things. Not even for fifteen years' wages? Come, it is worth thinking about. For fifteen thousand francs? Yes. Sir, you alarm me. Nonsense. Sir, are you tempting me? Just so. Fifteen thousand francs. Do you understand? Sir, let me see my right-hand correspondent. On the contrary, do not look at him, but at this. What is it? What? Do you not know these bits of paper? Bank notes? Exactly. There are fifteen of them. And whose are they? Yours, if you like. Mine? exclaimed the man, half suffocated. Yes, yours. Your own property. Sir, my right-hand correspondent is signaling. Let him signal. Sir, you have distracted me. I shall be fined. That will cost you a hundred francs. You see, it is your interest to take my banknotes. Sir, my right-hand correspondent redoubles his signals. He is impatient. Never mind. Take these. And the Count placed the packet in the man's hands. Now this is not all, he said. You cannot live upon your fifteen thousand francs. I shall still have my place. No, you will lose it, for you are going to alter your correspondent's message. Oh, sir, what are you proposing? A jest. Sir, unless you force me, I think I can effectually force you, and Monte Cristo drew another packet from his pocket. Here are ten thousand more francs, he said. 
With the fifteen thousand already in your pocket, they will make twenty-five thousand. With five thousand you can buy a pretty little house with two acres of land, and remaining twenty thousand will bring you in a thousand francs a year. A garden with two acres of land? And a thousand francs a year. Oh, heavens! Come, take them, and Monte Cristo forced the bank notes into his hand. What am I to do? Nothing very difficult. But what is it? To repeat these signs. Monte Cristo took a paper from his pocket, upon which were drawn three signs, with numbers to indicate the order in which they were to be worked. There, you see, it will not take long. Yes, but... Do this, and you will have nectarines and all the rest. The shot told, red with fever, while the large drops fell from his brow. The man executed, one after the other, the three signs given by the Count, in spite of the frightful contortions of the right-hand correspondent, who, not understanding the change, began to think the gardener had gone mad. As to the left-hand one, he conscientiously repeated the same signals, which were finally transmitted to the Minister of the Interior. "'Now you are rich,' said Monte Cristo. "'Yes,' replied the man. But at what price? Listen, friend, said Monte Cristo, I do not wish to cause you any remorse. Believe me, then, when I swear to you that you have wronged no man, but on the contrary have benefited mankind. The man looked at the banknotes, felt them, counted them, turned pale, then read, then rushed into his room to drink a glass of water. But he had no time to reach the water jug and fainted in the midst of his dried herbs. Five minutes after the new telegram reached the minister, Debray had his horse put to his carriage and drove to the dangler's house. "'Has your husband any Spanish bonds?' he asked the baroness. "'I think so. Indeed, he has six millions worth. He must sell them at whatever price. Why? Because Don Carlos has fled from Borges and has returned to Spain. How do you know? Debray shrugged his shoulders. The idea of asking how I hear the news, he said. The baroness did not wait for a repetition. She ran to her husband, who immediately hastened to his agent, and ordered him to sell at any price. When it was seen that Danglers sold, the Spanish funds fell directly. Danglers lost five hundred thousand francs, but he rid himself of all his Spanish shares. The same evening the following was read in Le Messenger. By the telegraph, the king, Don Carlos, has escaped the vigilance of his guardians at Borges, and has returned to Spain by the Catalonian frontier. Barcelona has risen in his favor. All that evening nothing was spoken of but the foresight of Danglars, who had sold his shares, and of the luck of the stock jobber who only lost five hundred thousand francs by such a blow. Those who had kept their shares, or bought those of Danglars, looked upon themselves as ruined, and passed a very bad night. Next morning, Le Montier contained the following. It was without any foundation that Le Messenger yesterday announced the flight of Don Carlos and the revolt of Barcelona. The king... Don Carlos has not left Borges, and the peninsula is in the enjoyment of profound peace. A telegraphic signal, improperly interpreted, owed to the fog, was the cause of this error. The funds rose one per cent higher than before they had fallen. This, reckoning his loss, and what he had missed gaining, made the difference of a million to Danglars. Good, said Monte Cristo to Morel who was at his house when the news arrived of the strange reverse of fortune of which Danglars had been the victim. I have just made a discovery for twenty-five thousand francs, for which I would have paid a hundred thousand. What have you discovered? asked Morel. I have just discovered how a gardener may get rid of the dormice that eat his peaches. End of chapter 61「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recorded by West Winds 12. September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 62. Ghosts. At first sight, the exterior of the house it ought to ill gave no indications of splendor, nothing one would expect from the destined resonance of the magnificent Count of Monte Cristo. But this simplicity was according to the will of its master, who positively ordered nothing to be altered outside. The splendor was within. Indeed, almost before the door opened, the scene changed. Monsieur Bertuccio had outdone himself in the taste displayed in furnishing and in the rapidity with which it was executed. It is told that the Duc de Antin removed in a single night a whole avenue of trees that annoyed Louis the Fourteenth. In three days, Monsieur Bertuccio planted an entirely bare court with poplars, large spreading sycamores, to shade the different parts of the house, and in the foreground, instead of the usual paving stones, half hidden by the grass, there extended a lawn, but that morning lay down, and upon which the water was yet glistening. For the rest, the orders had been issued by the Count. He himself had given a plan to Bertuccio, marking the spot where each tree was to be planted, and the shape and extent of the lawn which was to take the place of the paving stones. Thus the house had become unrecognizable, and Bertuccio himself declared that he scarcely knew it, encircled as it was by a framework of trees. The overseer would not have objected, while he was about it, to have made some improvements in the garden, but the Count had positively forbidden it to be touched. Bertruccio made amends, however, by loading the antechambers, staircases, and mantelpieces with flowers. What, above all, manifested the shrewdness of the steward, and the profound science of the master, the one in carrying out the ideas of the other, was that this house, which appeared only the night before so sad and gloomy, impregnated with that sickly smell one can almost fancy to be the smell of time, had in a single day acquired the aspect of life, was scented with its master's favorite perfumes, and had the very light regulated according to his wish. When the Count arrived, he had under his touch his books and arms. His eyes rested upon his favorite pictures. His dogs, whose caresses he loved, welcomed him in the antechamber. The birds, whose songs delighted him, cheered him with their music, and the house, awakened from its long sleep, like a sleeping beauty in the woods, lived, sang, and bloomed like the houses we have long cherished, and in which, when we are forced to leave them, we leave a part of our souls. The servants passed gaily along the fine courtyard. Some, belonging to the kitchens, glided down the stairs, restored but the previous day, as if they had always inhabited the house. Others, filling the coach-houses, where the equipages, encased and numbered, appeared to have been installed for the last fifty years, and in the stables the horses replied with neighs to the grooms, who spoke to them with much more respect than many servants pay their masters. The library was divided into two parts on either side of the wall, and contained upwards of two thousand volumes. One division was entirely devoted to novels, and even the volume which had been published but the day before was to be seen in its place in all the dignity of its red and gold binding. On the other side of the house, to match with the library, was the conservatory, ornamented with rare flowers that bloomed in china jars, and in the midst of the greenhouse, marvelous alike to sight and smell, was a billiard-table which looked as if it had been abandoned during the past hour by players who had left the balls on the cloth. One chamber alone had been respected by the magnificent Bertruccio. Before this room, to which you could ascend by the grand, and go out by the back staircase, the servants passed with curiosity, and Bertruccio with terror. At five o'clock precisely the Count arrived before the house at Auteuil, followed by Ali. Bertruccio was awaiting this arrival with impatience, mingled with 
uneasiness. He hoped for some compliments, while at the same time he feared to have frowns. Monte Cristo descended into the courtyard, walked all over the house, without giving any sign of approbation or pleasure, until he entered his bedroom, situated on the opposite side to the closed room. Then he approached a little piece of furniture, made of rosewood, which he had noticed at a previous visit. "'That can only be to hold gloves,' he said. "'Will your excellency deign to open it?' said the delighted Petruchio. "'And you will find gloves in it.' Elsewhere the Count found everything he required, smelling-bottles, cigars, knick-knacks. "'Good,' he said. And Monsieur Petruchio left enraptured. So great, so powerful, and real was the influence exercised by this man over all who surrounded him. At precisely six o'clock the clatter of horses' hoofs was heard at the entrance door. It was our captain of Spahis, who had arrived on Medea. "'I am sure I am the first, cried Morel. "'I did it on purpose to have you a minute to myself, before every one came. "'Julie and Emmanuel have a thousand things to tell you. "'Ah, really, this is magnificent! "'But tell me, Count, will your people take care of my horse?' Do not alarm yourself, my dear Maximilian. They understand. I mean, because he wants petting. If you had seen at what a pace he came, like the wind. <laughs> I should think so. A horse that costs five thousand francs, said Monte Cristo, in a tone which a father would use towards a son. Do you regret them? asked Morel, with his open laugh. I certainly not, replied the Count. No, I should only regret if the horse had not proved good. It is so good that I have distanced Monsieur de Chateaurino, one of the best riders in France, and Monsieur de Bray, who both mount the minister's Arabians. And close on their heels are the horses of Madame Danglars, who always go at six leagues an hour. Then they follow you? asked Monte Cristo. See, they are here and at the same minute a carriage with smoking horses accompanied by two mounted gentlemen arrived at the gate which opened before them the carriage drove around and stopped at the steps followed by the horsemen the instant debray had touched the ground he was at the carriage door he offered his hand to the baroness who descending took it with a peculiarity of manner imperceptible to every one but monte cristo but nothing escaped the Count's notice, and he observed a little note, passed with the facility that indicates frequent practice, from the hand of Madame Danglars to that of the minister's secretary. After his wife, the banker descended, as pale as though he had issued from his tomb instead of his carriage. Madame Danglars threw a rapid and inquiring glance, which could only be interpreted by Monte Cristo around the courtyard, over the peristyle, and across the front of the house. Then, repressing a slight emotion which must have been seen on her countenance if she had not kept her color, she ascended the steps, saying to Morel, Sir, if you were a friend of mine, I should ask you if you would sell your horse. Morel smiled with an expression very like a grimace, and then turned around to Monte Cristo, as if to ask him to extricate him from this embarrassment. The Count understood him. Ah, madame, he said, why did you not make that request of me? With you, sir, replied the baroness, one can wish for nothing, one is so sure to obtain it. If it were so with Monsieur Morel... Unfortunately, replied the Count, I am witness that Monsieur Morel cannot give up his horse, his honor being engaged in keeping it. How so? He laid a wager he would tame Medea in the space of six months. You understand now that if he were to get rid of the animal before the time named, he would not only lose his bet, but people would say he was afraid. And a brave captain of Spahis cannot risk this even to gratify a pretty woman, which is, in my opinion, one of the most sacred obligations in the world. "'You see my position, madame,' said Morel, 
bestowing a grateful smile on Monte Cristo. It seems to me, said Danglars, in his coarse tone, ill concealed by a forced smile, that you have already got horses enough. Madame Danglars seldom allowed remarks of this kind to pass unnoticed, but, to the surprise of the young people, she pretended not to hear it, and said nothing. Monte Cristo smiled at her unusual humility, and showed her two immense porcelain jars, over which wound marine plants, of a size and delicacy that nature alone could produce. The baroness was astonished. Why, said she, you could plant one of the chestnut trees in the Tuileries inside. How can such enormous jars have been manufactured? Ah, madame, replied Monte Cristo, you must not ask of us, the manufacturers of fine porcelain, such a question. It is the work of another age, constructed by the genie of earth and water. How so? At what period can that have been? I do not know. I have only heard that an emperor of China had an oven built expressly, and that in this oven twelve jars like this were successfully baked. Two broke from the heat of the fire. The other ten were sunk three hundred fathoms deep into the sea. The sea, knowing what was required of her, threw over them her weeds, encircling them with coral, and encrusted them with shells. The whole was cemented by two hundred years beneath these almost impervious depths, for a revolution carried away the emperor who wished to make the trial, and only left the documents proving the manufacture of the jars and their descent into the sea. At the end of two hundred years the documents were found, and they thought of bringing up the jars. Divers descended in machines made expressly on the discovery into the bay where they were thrown, but of ten, three only remained, the rest having been broken by the waves. I am fond of these jars, upon which, perhaps, misshapen, frightful monsters have fixed their cold, dull eyes, and in which myriads of small fish have slept, seeking a refuge from the pursuit of their enemies. Meanwhile, Danglars, who had cared little of curiosities, was mechanically tearing off the blossoms of a splendid orange tree, one after another. When he had finished with the orange tree, he began at the cactus, but this, not being so easily plucked as the orange tree, pricked him dreadfully. He shuddered, and rubbed his eyes as though awaking from a dream. Sir, said Monte Cristo to him, I do not recommend my pictures to you, who possess such splendid paintings. But nevertheless, here are two Hobina, a Paul Potter, a Miris, two by Gerard Dow, a Raphael, a Van Dyck, a Zubaran, and two or three by Murillo worth looking at. Stay, said Debray, I recognize this Hobima. Ah, indeed. Yes, it was proposed for the museum, which, I believe, does not contain one, said Monte Cristo. No, and yet they refused to buy it. Why, said Chateau Renaud, you pretend not to know, because the government was not rich enough. Ah, pardon me, said Chateau Renaud, I have heard of these things every day during the last eight years, and I cannot understand them yet. You will, by and by, said Debray. I think not, replied Chateau Renaud. Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti, and Count Andrea Cavalcanti, announced Baptistine. A black satin stock, fresh from the maker's hands, gray moustaches, a bold eye, a major's uniform, ornamented with three medals and five crosses, in fact the thorough bearing of an old soldier, such was the appearance of Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti that tender father with whom we are already acquainted. Close to him, dressed in entirely new clothes, advanced, smiling, Count Andrea Cavalcanti, the dutiful son, whom we also know. The three young people were talking together. 
On the entrance of the newcomers their eyes glanced from father to son, and then, naturally enough, rested on the latter, whom they began criticizing. Cavalcanti, said Dupre. A fine name, said Morel. Yes, said Chateau Renaud. These Italians are well named, and badly dressed. You are fastidious, Chateau Renaud, replied Debre. Those clothes are well cut and quite new. That is just what I find fault with. That gentleman appears to be well dressed for the first time in his life. Who are those gentlemen? asked Danglars of Monte Cristo. You heard Cavalcanti. That tells me their name and nothing else. Ah, true. You do not know the Italian nobility. The Cavalcanti are all descended from princes. Have they any fortune? An enormous one. What do they do? Try to spend it all. They have some business with you, I think, from what they told me the day before yesterday. I, indeed, invited them here today on your account. I will introduce you to them. But they appear to speak French with a very pure accent, said Danglars. The son has been educated in a college in the south, I believe near Marseilles. You will find him quite enthusiastic. Upon what subject? asked Madame Danglars. The French ladies, madame. He has made up his mind to take a wife from Paris. A fine idea, that, of his, said Danglars, shrugging his shoulders. Madame Danglars looked at her husband with an expression which, at any other time, would have indicated a storm, but for the second time she controlled herself. The Baron appears thoughtful today, said Monte Cristo to her. Are they going to put him in the ministry? Not yet, I think. More likely he has been speculating on the Bourges and has lost money. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, cried Baptistine. They entered. Monsieur de Villefort, notwithstanding his self-control, was visibly affected, and when Monte Cristo touched his hand, he felt it tremble. Certainly women alone know how to dissimulate, said Monte Cristo to himself, glancing at Madame Danglars, who was smiling on the procureur and embracing his wife. After a short time, the Count saw Petruchio, who, until then, had been occupied on the other side of the house, glide into an adjoining room. He went to him. "'What do you want, Monsieur Bertruccio? said he. "'Your Excellency has not stated the number of guests.' "'Ah, true. How many covers? Count for yourself. Is everyone here, Your Excellency?' "'Yes.' Bertruccio glanced through the door which was ajar. The Count watched him. "'Good heavens!' he exclaimed. "'What is the matter?' said the Count. "'That woman! That woman! Which? The one with the white dress, and so many diamonds, the fair one, Madame Danglars? I do not know her name, but it is she, sir, it is she! Whom do you mean?' "'The woman of the garden! She that was in Siente! She who was walking while she waited for— Petruchio stood at the open door, with his eyes starting and his hair on end. Waiting for whom? Petruchio, without answering, pointed to Villefort with something of the gesture Macbeth uses to point to Banquo. Oh, oh! He at length muttered, Do you see? What? Who? Him! Him? Monsieur de Villefort? The king's attorney? Certainly I see him. Then I did not kill him. Really, I think you are going mad, good Petruchio, said the Count. Then he is not dead? No, you see plainly he is not dead. Instead of striking between the sixth and seventh left ribs, as your countrymen do, you must have struck higher or lower, and the life is very tenuous in these lawyers. Or rather, there is no truth in anything you have told me. It was a fright of the imagination, a dream of your fancy. You went to sleep full of thoughts of vengeance. They weighed heavily upon your stomach. You had the nightmare. That is all. Come, calm yourself, and reckon them up. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, two. Monsieur and Madame Danglars, 
four, Monsieur de Chateau Renault, Monsieur de Bray, Monsieur Morel, seven, Major Bartolome Cavalcanti, eight, eight, repeated Petruchio. Stop, you are in a shocking hurry to be off. You forget one of my guests. Lean a little to the left. Stay. Look at Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti, the young man in a black coat, looking at Morello's Madonna. Now he is turning. This time Bertuccio would have uttered an exclamation had not a look from Monte Cristo silenced him. Benedetto, he muttered, fatality. Half past six o'clock has just struck, Monsieur Bertuccio," said the Count severely. "I ordered dinner at that hour, and I do not like to wait." And he returned to his guests, while Bertuccio, leaning against the wall, succeeded in reaching the dining room. Five minutes afterwards, the doors of the drawing room were thrown open, and Bertuccio, appearing, said, with a violent effort. The dinner awaits. The Count of Monte Cristo offered his arm to Madame de Villefort. Monsieur de Villefort, he said, will you conduct the Baroness Danglars? Villefort complied, and they passed on to the dining room. End of chapter sixty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by George Coots, September 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 63 The Dinner. It was evident that one sentiment affected all the guests on entering the dining room. Each one asked what strange influence had brought them to this house, and yet astonished, even uneasy though they were, they still felt that they would not like to be absent. The recent events, the solitary and eccentric position of the Count, his enormous, nay, almost incredible fortune, should have made men cautious, and have altogether prevented ladies visiting a house where there was no one of their own sex to receive them. And yet curiosity had been enough to lead them to overleap the bounds of prudence and decorum, and all present, even including Cavalcanti and his son, notwithstanding the stiffness of the one and the carelessness of the other, were thoughtful on finding themselves assembled at the house of this incomprehensible man. Madame d'Anglaire had started when Villefort, on the Count's invitation, offered his arm, and Villefort felt that his glance was uneasy beneath his gold spectacles when he felt the arm of the Baroness press upon his own. None of this had escaped the Count, and even by this mere contact of individuals the scene had already acquired considerable interest for an observer. M. de Villefort had on the right hand Madame d'Anglaire and on his left, Morel. The Count was seated between Madame de Villefort and d'Anglaire. The other seats were filled by Debray, who was placed between the two Cavalcanti, and by Chateau Renaud, seated between Madame de Villefort and Morel. The repast was magnificent. Monte Cristo had endeavored completely to overturn the Parisian ideas, and to feed the curiosity as much as the appetite of his guests. It was an oriental feast that he offered to them, but of such a kind as the Arabian fairies might be supposed to prepare. Every delicious fruit that the four quarters of the globe could provide was heaped in vases from China and jars from Japan. Rare birds retaining their most brilliant plumage, enormous fish spread upon massive silver dishes, together with every wine produced in the archipelago, Asia Minor, or the Cape, sparkling in bottles whose grotesque shape seemed to give an additional flavor to the draught. All these, like one of the displays with which Apicius of old gratified his guests, passed in review before the eyes of the astonished Parisians, who understood that it was possible to expend a thousand louis upon a dinner for ten persons, but only on the condition of eating pearls, like Cleopatra, or drinking refined gold, like Lorenzo de Medici. Monte Cristo noticed the general astonishment, 
and began laughing and joking about it. Gentlemen, he said, you will admit that, when arrived at a certain degree of fortune, the superfluities of life are all that can be desired, and the ladies will allow that, after having risen to a certain eminence of position, the ideal alone can be more exalted. Now to follow out this reasoning, what is the marvelous? That which we do not understand. What is it that we really desire? That which we cannot obtain. Now to see things which I cannot understand, to procure impossibilities, these are the study of my life. I gratify my wishes by two means, my will and my money. I take as much interest in the pursuit of some whim as you do, M. Donglaire, in promoting a new railway line. You, M. de Villefort, in condemning a culprit to death. You, M. de Bray, in pacifying a kingdom. You, de Chateau Renaud, in pleasing a woman. And you, Morel, in breaking a horse that no one can ride. For example, you see these two fish, one brought fifty leagues beyond St. Petersburg, the other five leagues from Naples. Is it not amusing to see them both on the same table? What are the two fish? asked Donglaire. M. Chateau Renaud, who has lived in Russia, will tell you the name of one, and Major Cavalcanti, who is an Italian, will tell you the name of the other. This one is, I think, a sterlet, said Chateau Renaud, and that one, if I mistake not, a lamprey. Just so. Now, M. Donglaire, ask these gentlemen where they are caught. Starlet, said Chateau Renaud, are only found in the Volga. And, said Cavalcanti, I know that Lake Fusaro alone supplies lampreys of that size. Exactly. One comes from the Volga, and the other from Lake Fusaro. Impossible, cried all the guests simultaneously. Well, this is just what amuses me, said Monte Cristo. I am like Nero, cupitur impossibilium, and that is what is amusing you at this moment. This fish which seems so exquisite to you, is very likely no better than perch or salmon, but it seemed impossible to procure it, and here it is. But how could you have these fish brought to France? Oh, nothing more easy. Each fish was brought over in a cask, one filled with river herbs and weeds, the other with rushes and lake plants. They were placed in a wagon built on purpose, and thus the sterlet lived twelve days, the lamprey ate, and both were alive when my cook seized them, killing one with milk and the other with wine. You did not believe me, M. Donglaire. I cannot help doubting, answered Donglaire, with his stupid smile. Baptiston, said the Count, have the other fish brought in, the sterlet and the lamprey, which came in the other casks, and which are yet alive. Donglaire opened his bewildered eyes. The company clapped their hands. Four servants carried in two casks covered with aquatic plants, and in each of which was breathing a fish similar to those on the table. But why have two of each sort? asked Donglaire. Merely because one might have died, carelessly answered Monte Cristo. You are certainly an extraordinary man, said Donglaire, and philosophers may well say it is a fine thing to be rich. And to have ideas, added Madame Donglaire. Oh, do not give me credit for this, madame. It was done by the Romans, who much esteemed them, and Pliny relates that they sent slaves from Ostia to Rome, who carried on their heads fish which he calls the mollus, and which from the description must probably be the goldfish. It was also considered a luxury to have them alive, it being an amusing sight to see them die, for when dying they change color three or four times, and like the rainbow when it disappears, passed through all the prismatic shades, after which they were sent to the kitchen. Their agony formed part of their merit. If they were not seen alive, they were despised when dead. Yes, said Debray, but then Ostia is only a few leagues from Rome. True, said Monte Cristo, but what would be the use of living eighteen hundred years after Lucullus if we can do no better than he could? The two Cavalcanti opened their enormous eyes, but had the good sense not to say anything. All this is very extraordinary, said Chateau Renaud. Still, what I admire the most, I confess, is the marvelous promptitude with which your orders are executed. Is it not true that you only bought this house five or six days ago? Certainly not longer. Well, I am sure it is quite transformed since last week. If I remember rightly, it had another entrance, and the courtyard was paved and empty, 
while today we have a splendid lawn bordered by trees which appear to be a hundred years old why not i am fond of grass and shade said monte cristo yes said madame de villefort the door was towards the road before and on the day of my miraculous escape you brought me into the house from the road i remember yes madame said monte cristo but i preferred having an entrance which would allow me to see the bois de boulogne over my garden in four days said morel it is extraordinary indeed said chateau renaud it seems quite miraculous to make a new house out of an old one for it was very old and dull too i recollect coming for my mother to look at it when m de saint moran advertised it for sale two or three years ago m de saint moran said madame de villefort then this house belonged to m de saint moran before you bought it it appears so replied monte cristo is it possible that you did not know of whom you purchased it quite so my steward transacts all this business for me it is certainly ten years since the house had been occupied said chateau renaud and it was quite melancholy to look at with the blinds closed the doors locked and the weeds in the court really if the house had not belonged to the father-in-law of the procurer one might have thought it some accursed place where a horrible crime had been committed Villefort, who had hitherto not tasted the three or four glasses of rare wine which were placed before him, here took one and drank it off. Monte Cristo allowed a short time to elapse, and then said, It is singular, Baron, but the same idea came across me the first time I came here. It looked so gloomy I should never have bought it if my steward had not taken the matter into his own hands. Perhaps the fellow had been bribed by the notary. It is probable, stammered out Villefort, trying to smile, but I can assure you that I had nothing to do with any such proceeding. This house is part of Valentine's marriage portion, and M. de saint Laurent wished to sell it, for if it had remained another year or two uninhabited, it would have fallen to ruin. It was Morel's turn to become pale. There was, above all, one room, continued Monte Cristo, very plain in appearance, hung with red damask, which I know not why, appeared to be quite dramatic. Why so, said Danglars? Why dramatic? Can we account for instinct, said Monte Cristo? Are there not some places where we seem to breathe sadness? Why we cannot tell. It is a chain of recollections, an idea which carries you back to other times, to other places, which very likely have no connection with the present time and place. And there is something in this room which reminds me forcibly of the chamber of the Marquise de Gange, or Desdemona. Footnote. Elizabeth de Rosan, Marquise de Gange, was one of the famous women of the court of Louis the Fourteenth, where she was known as La Belle Provençale. She was the widow of the Marquise de Castellan when she married de Gange, and having the misfortune to excite the enmity of her new brothers-in-law, was forced by them to take poison and they finished her off with pistol and dagger. End footnote. Stay. Since we have finished dinner, I will show it to you, and then we will take coffee in the garden. After dinner, the play. Monte Cristo looked inquiringly at his guests. Madame de Villefort rose. Monte Cristo did the same, and the rest followed their example. Villefort and Madame d'Anglaire remained for a moment, as if rooted to their seats. They questioned each other with vague and stupid glances. "'Did you hear?' said Madame d'Anglaire. "'We must go,' replied Villefort, offering his arm. The others, attracted by curiosity, were already scattered in different parts of the house, for they thought the visit would not be limited to the one room, and that at the same time they would obtain a view of the rest of the building, of which Monte Cristo had created a palace. Each one went out by the open doors, Monte Cristo waited for the two who remained. Then, when they had passed, he brought up the rear, and on his face was a smile which, if they would have understood it, would have alarmed them much more than a visit to the room they were about to enter. They began by walking through the apartments, many of which were fitted up in the eastern style, with cushions and divans instead of beds, and pipes instead of furniture. The drawing-rooms were decorated with the rarest pictures by the old masters, the boudoirs hung with draperies from china of fanciful colors fantastic design and wonderful texture at length they arrived at the famous room there was nothing particular about it excepting that 
although daylight had disappeared. It was not lighted, and everything in it was old-fashioned, while the rest of the rooms had been redecorated. These two causes were enough to give it a gloomy aspect. Oh, cried Madame de Villefort, it is really frightful. Madame d'Anglaire tried to utter a few words, but was not heard. Many observations were made, the import of which was unanimous opinion that there was something sinister about the room. Is it not so? asked Monte Cristo. Look at that large clumsy bed, hung with such gloomy blood-colored drapery, and those two crayon portraits that have faded from the dampness. Do they not seem to say, with their pale lips and staring eyes, we have seen? Villefort became livid. Madame d'Anglaire fell into a long seat placed near the chimney. Ah, oh, said Madame de Villefort, smiling. Are you courageous enough to sit down upon the very seat, perhaps upon which the crime was committed? Madame d'Anglaire rose suddenly. And then, said Monte Cristo, this is not all. What is there more, said Debray, who had not failed to notice the agitation of Madame d'Anglaire. Ah, what else is there, said d'Anglaire, for at present I cannot say that I have seen anything extraordinary. What do you say, M. Cavalcanti? Ah, he said, we have at Pisa, Ugolino's Tower. At Ferrara, Tasso's prison. At Rimini, the room of Francesca and Paolo. Yes, but you have not this little staircase, said Monte Cristo, opening a door concealed by the drapery. Look at it and tell me what you think of it. What a wicked-looking crooked staircase, said Chateau Renaud with a smile. I do not know whether the wine of Chios produces melancholy, but certainly everything appears to me black in this house, said Debray. Ever since Valentine's dowry had been mentioned, Morel had been silent and sad. Can you imagine, said Monte Cristo, some Othello or Abbe de Gange, one stormy dark night descending these stairs step by step, carrying a load which he wishes to hide from the sight of man, if not from God? Madame d'Anglaire half fainted on the arm of Villefort, who was obliged to support himself against the wall. Ah, madame, cried Debray, what is the matter with you? How pale you look! It is very evident what is the matter with her, said Madame de Villefort. M. de Monte Cristo is relating horrible stories to us, doubtless intending to frighten us to death. Yes, said Villefort. Really, Count, you frighten the ladies. What is the matter? asked Debray, in a whisper of Madame d'Anglaire. Nothing, she replied with a violent effort. I want air, that is all. Will you come into the garden? said Debray, advancing toward the back staircase. No, no, she answered. I would rather remain here. Are you really frightened, madame, said Monte Cristo? Oh, no, sir, said madame d'Anglaire. But you suppose scenes in a manner which gives them the appearance of reality. Ah, yes, said Monte Cristo, smiling. It is all a matter of imagination. Why should we not imagine this the apartment of an honest mother, and this bed with red hangings, a bed visited by the goddess Luciana? And that mysterious staircase, the passage through which, not to disturb their sleep, the doctor and nurse pass, or even the father carrying the sleeping child. Here Madame d'Anglaire, instead of being calmed by the soft picture, uttered a groan and fainted. Madame d'Anglaire is ill, said Villefort. It would be better to take her to her carriage. Oh, mon Dieu, said Monte Cristo, I have forgotten my smelling bottle. I have mine, said Madame de Villefort and she passed over to Monte Cristo a bottle full of the same kind of red liquid whose good properties the Count had tested on Edward. Ah, said Monte Cristo, taking it from her hand. Yes, she said, at your advice I have made the trial. And have you succeeded? I think so. Madame d'Anglaire was carried into the adjoining room. Monte Cristo dropped a very small portion of the red liquid upon her lips. She returned to consciousness. Ah, she cried, what a frightful dream. Villefort pressed her hand to let her know it was not a dream. They looked for M. d'Anglaire, but as he was not especially interested in poetical ideas, he had gone into the garden and was talking with Major Cavalcanti on the projected railway from Leghorn to Florence. Monte Cristo seemed in despair. He took the arm of Madame d'Anglaire and conducted her into the garden, where they found d'Anglaire taking coffee between the Cavalcanti. Really, madame, he said, did I alarm you much? Oh, no, sir, she answered. But you know, things impress us differently, according to the mood of our minds. Villefort forced a laugh. 
and then you know he said an idea a supposition is sufficient well said monte cristo you may believe me if you like but it is my opinion that a crime has been committed in this house take care said madame de villefort the king's attorney is here ah replied monte cristo since that is the case i will take advantage of his presence to make my declaration your declaration said villefort yes before witnesses oh this is very interesting said debray if there really has been a crime we will investigate it there has been a crime said monte cristo come this way gentlemen come and villefort for a declaration to be available should be made before the competent authorities he then took villefort's arm and at the same time holding that of madame d'anglaire under his own he dragged the procureur to the plantain tree where the shade was thickest all the other guests followed stay said monte cristo here in this very spot and he stamped upon the ground i had the earth dug up and fresh mold put in to refresh these old trees well my man digging found a box or rather the ironwork of a box in the midst of which was the skeleton of a newly born infant monte cristo felt the arm of madame d'anglaire stiffen while that of villefort trembled a newly born infant repeated debray this affair becomes serious well said chateau renaud i was not wrong just now then when i said that houses had souls and faces like men and that their exteriors carried the impress of their characters this house was gloomy because it was remorseful it was remorseful because it concealed a crime who said it was a crime asked villefort with a last effort how is it not a crime to bury a living child in a garden cried monte cristo and pray what do you call such an action but who said it was buried alive why bury it there if it were dead this garden has never been a cemetery what is done to infanticides in this country asked major cavalcanti innocently oh their heads are soon cut off said d'anglaire ah indeed said cavalcanti i think so am i not right m de villefort asked monte cristo yes count replied villefort in a voice now scarcely human monte cristo seeing that the two persons for whom he had prepared this scene could scarcely endure it and not wishing to carry it too far said come gentlemen some coffee we seem to have forgotten it and he conducted the guests back to the table on the lawn indeed count said madame d'anglaire i am ashamed to own it but all your frightful stories have so upset me that i must beg you to let me sit down and she fell into the chair monte cristo bowed and went to madame de villefort i think madame d'anglaire again requires your bottle he said but before madame de villefort could reach her friend the procureur had found time to whisper to madame d'anglaire i must speak with you when tomorrow where in my office or in the court if you like that is the surest place i will be there at this moment madame de villefort approached thanks my dear friend said madame d'anglaire trying to smile it is over now and i am much better End of chapter sixty three